holiness. For the will of God is your sanctification. 1 Thessalonians 4.3 By J.C. Ryle Forward by D. Martin Lloyd-Jones Narrated by Mark Christensen Forward One of the most encouraging and hopeful signs I have observed for a while in evangelical circles has been a renewed and increasing interest in the writings of Bishop J.C. Ryle. In his day, he was famous, outstanding, and beloved as a champion and defender of the evangelical and Reformed faith. For some reason or other, however, his name and his works are not familiar to modern evangelicals. His books are, I believe, all out of print in this country, and very difficult to obtain second-hand. The differing fates suffered in this respect by Bishop Ryle and his near-contemporary Bishop Mao have always been to me a matter of great interest. Footnote. Bishop Hanley Carr Glynn Mao, 1841-1920, was an Anglican bishop of Dunham, England, and was an evangelical pastor, scholar, and author. Text resumes. But Bishop Ryle is being rediscovered and there is a new call for the republication of his works. All who have ever read any of his writings will be grateful for this new edition of his great book on holiness. I will never forget the satisfaction, spiritual and mental, with which I read it some twenty years ago after having stumbled across it in a second-hand bookshop. It really needs no preface or word of introduction. All I will do is urge all readers to read his own introduction to the book. It is invaluable, as it provides the setting in which he felt compelled to write the book. The characteristics of Bishop Ryle's method and style are obvious. He is preeminently and always scriptural and expository. He never starts with a theory into which he tries to fit various Bible verses, but he always starts with the Word and expounds it. It is exposition at its very best and highest. It is always clear and logical and invariably leads to a clear declaration of doctrine. It is strong and robust and entirely free from that which is merely emotional or impractical. The bishop had drunk deeply from the wells of the great classical Puritan writers of the 17th century. Indeed, it would be accurate to say that his books are a distillation of true Puritan theology, presented in a highly readable and modern form. Ryle, like his great masters, has no easy way to holiness to offer us, and no routine method by which it can be attained, but he always produces that hunger and thirst for righteousness, Matthew 5, 6, which is the only indispensable condition for being filled. May this book be widely read, so that God's name may be increasingly honored and glorified. D. M. Lloyd-Jones, Westminster Chapel Footnote David Martin Lloyd-Jones, 1899-1981, was a Welsh evangelical pastor and author who opposed liberal Christianity and was the pastor at Westminster Chapel for nearly 30 years. Introduction The twenty chapters contained in this volume are a humble contribution to a cause, scriptural holiness, that is exciting much interest in the present day. It is a cause that everyone who loves Christ and desires to advance His kingdom in the world should try to promote. Everyone can do something, and I wish to add my small part. The reader will not find much that is directly controversial in this book. I have carefully refrained from naming modern teachers and modern books. I've been content to give the result of my own study of the Bible, my own private meditations, my own prayers for light, and my own reading of old men of God. If in anything I am still in error, I hope I will be shown it before I leave the world. We all see in part and have a treasure in earthen vessels. I trust I am willing to learn. I have had a deep conviction for many years that practical holiness and entire self-consecration to God are not given adequate attention by modern Christians in this country. Politics, controversy, party spirit, or worldliness 
have eaten out the heart of lively piety in too many of us. The subject of personal godliness has sadly fallen into the background. The standard of holy living has become painfully low in many places. The immense importance of learning to adorn the doctrine of God our Savior, Titus 2.10, and making it lovely and beautiful by our daily habits and character has been far too much overlooked. Worldly people sometimes rightly complain that religious people are not as kind and unselfish and good-natured as those who make no profession of religion. Yet sanctification, in its place and proportion, is quite as important as justification. Sound Protestant and evangelical doctrine is useless if it is not accompanied by a holy life. It is worse than useless. It causes harm. It is despised by insightful and perceptive men of the world as an invented and empty thing, and it brings Christianity into contempt. It is my firm impression that we need a thorough revival of scriptural holiness, and I am deeply thankful that attention is being directed to this purpose. It is, however, of great importance that the whole subject should be placed on a right foundation, and it is important that the movement about it should not be damaged by inaccurate, inconsistent, and one-sided statements. If such statements abound, we should not be surprised. Satan knows well the power of true holiness, and the immense injury that increased attention to it will do to his kingdom. It is in his interest, therefore, to promote strife and controversy about this part of God's truth. Just as in time past he has succeeded in perplexing and confusing people's minds about justification, so he is laboring in the present day to make men darken counsel by words without knowledge regarding sanctification. Job 38.2 May the Lord rebuke him. I cannot, however, give up the hope that good will be brought out of evil, that discussion will draw out truth, and that a diversity of opinions will lead us all to search the Scriptures more, to pray more, and to become more diligent in trying to find out what is the desire of the Spirit. Romans 8.27 I feel it is a duty in writing this book to offer a few introductory hints to those whose attention is especially directed to the subject of sanctification in the present day. I know that I do so at the risk of seeming presumptuous and possibly of giving offense, but something must be ventured in the interests of God's truth. I will therefore put my hints into the form of questions, and I will ask my readers to take them as cautions for our day on the subject of holiness. I ask, in the first place, whether it is wise to speak of faith as the one thing needful and the only thing required, as many seem to do nowadays in handling the doctrine of sanctification. Is it wise to proclaim in such a direct, blatant, and absolute way, as many do, that the holiness of converted people is by faith only and not at all by personal exertion? Is it in harmony with God's word? I doubt it that faith in Christ is the root of all holiness, that the first step toward a holy life is to believe on Christ, that until we believe we have not an ounce of holiness, that union with Christ by faith is the secret of both beginning to be holy and continuing in holiness, that the life that we live in the flesh we must live by the faith of the Son of God, that faith purifies the heart, that faith is the victory that overcomes the world, that by faith the elders obtained a good report. All these are truths that no well-instructed Christian would ever think of denying. Certainly, though, the Scriptures teach us that in pursuing holiness, the true Christian needs personal exertion and work as well as faith. The very same apostle who says in one place, The life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God. Galatians 2.20, also says that he fights, he runs, he keeps his body under subjection. 1 Corinthians 9.26-27 The scriptures also say, let us cleanse ourselves. 2 Corinthians 7.1 Let us therefore make haste. Hebrews 4.11 Leaving behind all the weight. Hebrews 12.1 Moreover, 
The scriptures nowhere teach us that faith sanctifies us in the same sense and in the same manner that faith justifies us. Justifying faith is a grace that does not work, but simply trusts, rests, and leans on Christ. Romans 4, 5. Sanctifying faith is a grace of which the very life is action. It works by charity. Galatians 5, 6. And, like a driving force, it moves the whole inward man. After all, the precise phrase sanctified by faith is only found once in the New Testament. The Lord Jesus said to Saul that he was sending him to the Gentiles, that they may receive remission of sins and inheritance among those who are sanctified by the faith that is in me. Acts 26.18 Yet, even there, I agree with Alfred that by faith belongs to the whole sentence and must not be tied to the word sanctified. The true sense is that by faith in Jesus they can receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among those who are sanctified. Compare Acts 26.18 with Acts 20.32. As to the phrase, holiness by faith, I find it nowhere in the New Testament. Without controversy, in the matter of our justification before God, faith in Christ is the one thing needful. All who simply believe are justified. Righteousness is imputed to him that does not work, but believes. Romans 4, 5 It is thoroughly biblical and right to say that faith alone justifies, but it is not equally biblical and right to say that faith alone sanctifies. This saying requires much explanation and refinement. Let one fact suffice. We are frequently told by the Apostle Paul that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. Romans 3.28 But not once are we told that we are sanctified by faith without the deeds of the law. On the contrary, We are expressly told by James that the faith by which we are visibly and demonstratively justified before man is a faith which, if it does not have works, is dead in and of itself. James 2.17 I might be told in response that no one, of course, means to belittle works as an essential part of a holy life. It would be good, however, to make this plainer than many seem to make it these days. I ask in the second place whether it is wise to emphasize so little, comparatively, as some seem to do, the many practical exhortations to holiness in daily life that are found in the Sermon on the Mount and in most of Paul's epistles. Is it in harmony with God's Word? I doubt it. No well-taught child of God will dream of disputing that a life of daily self-consecration and daily communion with God should be aimed at by everyone who professes to be a believer, or that we should strive to attain the habit of going to the Lord Jesus Christ with everything we find a burden, whether great or small, and casting it upon Him. But surely the New Testament teaches us that we need something more than generalities about holy living which often affect no conscience and give no offense. The details and specific ingredients of which holiness is composed in daily life ought to be fully set forth and urged on believers by all who profess to care about the subject. True holiness does not consist merely of believing and feeling, but of doing and living. It involves a practical exhibition of active and passive grace. Our tongues, Our natures, our natural passions and inclinations, our conduct as parents and children, masters and servants, husbands and wives, rulers and subjects, our clothing, our use of time, our behavior in business, our attitude in sickness and health, in riches and in poverty. All these are matters that are fully written about by inspired writers. They are not content with a general statement of what we should believe and feel and how we are to have the roots of holiness planted in our hearts, but they dig down lower. They go into specific details. They specify in great detail what a holy man ought to do and be in his own family and in his own home, if he abides in Christ. I doubt whether this sort of teaching is sufficiently attended to in the present day. When people talk of having received such a blessing or of having found the higher life, 
after having heard some impassioned promoter of holiness by faith and self-consecration, while their families and friends see no improvement and no increased sanctity in their daily tempers and behavior. Much harm is done to the cause of Christ. True holiness, we should certainly remember, does not consist merely of inward sensations and impressions. It is much more than tears, sighs, bodily excitement, a quickened pulse, a passionate feeling of attachment to our own favorite preachers and our own religious party, and a readiness to quarrel with everyone who does not agree with us. It is about the image of Christ being seen and observed by others in our private lives, habits, character, work, and activities. Romans 8.29 I ask in the third place whether it is wise to use vague language about perfection and to urge Christians to a standard of holy perfection as attainable in this world while there is no basis to be shown for this, from either scripture or experience. I doubt it. No careful reader of the Bible will ever think of denying that believers are exhorted to perfect holiness in the fear of God, 2 Corinthians 7, one, to go on unto perfection, Hebrews 6.1, and to be perfected, 2 Corinthians 13.11. But I have yet to find a single passage in Scripture that teaches that literal perfection, complete and entire freedom from sin in thought, word, or deed, is attainable, or ever has been attained by any child of Adam in this world. A comparative perfection, a perfection in knowledge, an all-around consistency in every area of life, and a thorough soundness in every point of doctrine may be seen occasionally in some of God's believing people. But as to an absolute, literal perfection, the most eminent saints of God in every age have always been the very last to lay claim to it. On the contrary, they have always had the deepest sense of their own utter unworthiness and imperfection. The more spiritual light they have enjoyed, the more they have seen their own countless defects and shortcomings. The more grace they have had, the more they have been clothed with humility. 1 Peter 5.5 5. What saint can be named in God's word of whose life many details are recorded, who was literally and absolutely perfect? Which one of them, when writing about himself, ever talks of feeling free from imperfection? On the contrary, men like David, Paul, and John declare in the strongest language that they feel weakness and sin in their own hearts. The holiest men of modern times have always been remarkable for deep humility. Have we ever seen holier men than the martyred John Bradford, Richard Hooker, James Usher, Richard Baxter, Samuel Rutherford, or Robert Murray McChain? Yet no one can read the writings and letters of these men without seeing that they felt themselves debtors to mercy and grace every day, and the very last thing they ever laid claim to was perfection. In the face of such facts, I must protest against the language now used in many places about perfection. I must conclude that those who use such language know very little of the nature of sin, the attributes of God, their own hearts, the Bible, or the meaning of words. When a professing Christian calmly tells me that he has grown beyond such hymns as Just As I Am, and that they are beneath his current experience, Although they suited him when he first professed Jesus Christ, I must conclude that his soul is in a very unhealthy condition. When a person can talk calmly of the possibility of living without sin while in the body, and when he can actually say that he has not had an evil thought for three months, I can only say that in my opinion he is a very ignorant Christian. I protest against such teaching as this. It not only does no good, but it does much harm. It disgusts and alienates perceptive people of the world from Christianity who know that this kind of talk is incorrect and untrue. It depresses some of the best of God's children who feel they can never attain to perfection of this kind. It puffs up many weak brethren who imagine they are something when they are nothing. Simply put, it is a dangerous delusion. In the fourth place, is it wise to assert so positively and strongly, as many do, 
that the seventh chapter of the book of Romans does not describe the experience of the advanced saint, but the experience of the unsaved person, or of the weak and recent comfort. I doubt it. I fully admit that the point has been a disputed one for nineteen centuries, ever since the days of Paul. I fully admit that eminent Christians like John and Charles Wesley and John Fletcher a hundred years ago, to say nothing of some able writers of our own time, maintain firmly that Paul was not describing his own present experience when he wrote this seventh chapter. I fully admit that many cannot see what I and many others see, that Paul says nothing in this chapter that does not exactly match the recorded experience of the most eminent saints in every age and that he does say several things that no unregenerate person or weak believer would ever think of saying, and cannot say. That is how it appears to me, at least. But I will not enter into any detailed discussion of the chapter. What I do lay stress upon is the straightforward fact that the best commentators in every era of the church have almost always applied the seventh chapter of Romans to mature Christians, the commentators who do not take this view have been, with few bright exceptions, the Roman Catholics, the Socinians, and the Armenians. Footnote. Socinianism includes beliefs that Jesus was only human, that God does not know the future, that Jesus did not atone for our sins but simply gave us an example to follow, and that all doctrine should be able to be understood by our human reason. Arminianism is often contrasted with Calvinism. Arminianism emphasizes man's free will rather than God's sovereignty. Text resumes. Against them is arrayed the judgment of almost all the Reformers, almost all the Puritans, and the best modern evangelical clergymen and theologians. I will be told, of course, that no man is infallible, that the Reformers, Puritans, and modern leaders to whom I refer may have been entirely mistaken and the Roman Catholics, Socinians, and Arminians may have been quite right. Our Lord has taught us, no doubt, to call no man master, Matthew 23.10. But while I ask no one to call the Reformers and Puritans masters, I do ask people to read what they say on this subject and answer their arguments, if they can. This has not been done yet. To say, as some do, that they do not want human dogmas and doctrines is no reply at all. The whole point at issue is, what is the meaning of a passage of Scripture? How is the seventh chapter of Romans to be interpreted? What is the true sense of its words? At any rate, there is a great fact that cannot be ignored. The opinions and interpretation of Reformers and Puritans stand on one side, while on the other stand the opinions and interpretations of Roman Catholics, Socinians, and Armenians. Let that be distinctly understood. In the face of such a fact as this, I must express my disapproval of the insulting, ridiculing, and contemptuous language that has been frequently used lately by some of the proponents of what I must call the Armenian view of Romans 7 in speaking of the opinions of their opponents. To say the least, such language is improper and only defeats its own end. A cause that is defended by such language is deservedly suspicious. Truth does not need such weapons. If we cannot agree with others, we do not need to speak of their views with discourtesy and contempt. An opinion that is backed and supported by such men as the best reformers and Puritans may not carry conviction to everyone in this country, but it would still be good to speak of it with respect. In the fifth place, is it wise to use the language that is often used today about the doctrine of Christ in us? I doubt it. Is not this doctrine often exalted to a position that it does not occupy in Scripture? I am afraid that it is. No careful reader of the New Testament would think of denying for a moment that a true believer is one with Christ and Christ is in him. There is no doubt a mystical union between Christ and the believer. With him we died, with him we were buried, with him we rose again, and with him we sit in heavenly places. We have five plain Bible verses that clearly teach that Christ is in us. Scripture If Christ is in you, the body is truly dead because of sin, 
but the Spirit is alive because of righteousness. Romans 8.10 I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Galatians 2.20 My little children, of whom I travail in birth again until Christ is formed in you. Galatians 4.19 That the Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that ye, being rooted and grounded in charity, Ephesians 3.17, Christ is all and in all, Colossians 3.11. We must be careful, though, that we understand what we mean by the expression, in us, that Christ dwells in our hearts by faith and carries on his inward work by his Spirit is clear and plain. But if we say that in addition to this, and more than this, and above this, there is some mysterious indwelling of Christ in a believer, we must be careful what we are discussing. Unless we are careful, we will find ourselves ignoring the work of the Holy Spirit. We will forget that in the divine providence of man's salvation, election is the special work of God the Father. Atonement, mediation, and intercession are the special work of God the Son, and sanctification is the special work of God the Holy Spirit. We will forget that before our Lord went away, He said that He would send us another Comforter, who would abide with us forever, and, as it were, take His place. Scripture I will ask the Father, and He shall give you another Comforter, that He may abide with you forever. John 14.16 Essentially, under the idea that we are honoring Christ, we will find that we are dishonoring His special and distinctive gift, the Holy Spirit. Christ, no doubt, as God, is everywhere, in our hearts, in heaven, in the place where two or three meet together in His name, Matthew 18.20. But we really must remember that Christ, as our risen head and high priest, is at God's right hand for the special purpose of interceding for us until He comes the second time, and that He carries on His work in the hearts of His people by the special work of His Spirit, whom he promised to send when he left the world. Scripture When the Comforter is come, whom I will send unto you from the Father, even the Spirit of truth, which proceeds from the Father, he shall testify of me. John 15.26 A comparison of the ninth and tenth verses of Romans 8 seems to me to show this plainly. It convinces me that Christ in us means Christ in us by his Spirit. Scripture but ye are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, because the Spirit of God dwells in you. Now if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, that person is not of him. But if Christ is in you, the body is truly dead because of sin, but the Spirit is alive because of righteousness. Romans 8, 9-10 Above all, the words of St. John are most distinct and revealing and in this we know that he abides in us by the Spirit which he has given us, 1 John 3.24. In saying all this, I hope no one will misunderstand me. I do not say that the expression, Christ in us, is unscriptural, but I do say that I see much danger in giving an extreme and unscriptural importance to the idea contained in the expression. And I do fear that many use it these days without exactly knowing what they mean and unintentionally, perhaps, dishonor the mighty work of the Holy Spirit. If any readers think that I am needlessly conscientious about this point, I recommend to their notice a curious book by Samuel Rutherford, author of the well-known letters, called The Spiritual Antichrist. Footnote. Samuel Rutherford, 1600-1661, was a Scottish Presbyterian pastor and author and was one of the members of the Westminster Assembly. A collection of his letters has been published, Letters of Samuel Rutherford, and has become a Christian classic. Charles Spurgeon said that Rutherford's letters were the nearest thing to inspiration which can be found in all the writings of mere men. Richard Baxter said of them that except for the Bible, such a book as Mr. Rutherford's letters, the world never saw the like. Text resumes. They will see there that a few centuries ago, 
the wildest heresies arose out of an extravagant teaching of this very doctrine of the indwelling of Christ in believers. They will find that Saltmarsh, Dell, Town, and other false teachers against whom good Samuel Rutherford contended began with strange notions of Christ in us and then proceeded to build on that doctrine the heresy of antinomianism and fanaticism of the worst description and vilest tendency. They maintained that the separate personal life of the believer was so completely gone that it was Christ living in him who repented, believed, and acted. The root of this huge error was a forced and unscriptural interpretation of such texts as I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me, Galatians 2.20. The natural result was that many of the unhappy followers of this school of teaching came to the comfortable conclusion that believers were not responsible for their words and actions, no matter what they might do. Believers, they taught, were undoubtedly dead and buried, and only Christ lived in them and undertook everything for them. The ultimate consequence was that some thought they could sit still in a carnal security with absolutely no personal accountability, and they believed that they could commit any kind of sin without fear. Let us never forget that if truth is distorted and exaggerated, it can become the mother of the most dangerous heresies. When we speak of Christ being in us, let us take care to explain what we mean I fear that some neglect this in the present day. In the sixth place, is it wise to draw such a deep, wide, and distinct line of separation between conversion and consecration, or the higher life, as many do today? Is this in harmony with God's word? I doubt it. There is unquestionably nothing new in this teaching. It is well known that Roman Catholic writers often maintain that the church is divided into three classes, sinners, penitents, and saints. The modern teachers of this day who tell us that professing Christians are of three sorts, the unconverted, the converted, and the partakers of the higher life of complete consecration, appear to me to occupy very much the same ground. But whether the idea is old or new, Roman Catholic or Protestant, I am utterly unable to see that it has any basis in Scripture. The Word of God always speaks of two great divisions of mankind, and only two. It speaks of the living and the dead in sin, the believer and the unbeliever, the converted and the unconverted, the travelers in the narrow way and the travelers in the broad, the wise and the foolish the children of God, and the children of the devil. Within each of these two great classes, there are doubtless various degrees of sin and of grace, but these various degrees are only the difference between the higher and lower ends of an inclined plane. However, between the two great classes, there is an enormous gulf. The two classes are as distinct as life and death, light and darkness, heaven and hell. But of a division into three classes, the Word of God says nothing at all. I question the wisdom of making new divisions that the Bible has not made, and I thoroughly dislike the idea of a second conversion. I fully concede that there is a vast difference between one degree of grace and another, that one should grow in one's spiritual life, and that believers should be continually urged in all things to grow in grace but the theory of a sudden, mysterious transition of a believer into a state of blessedness and entire consecration all at once I cannot accept. It appears to me to be a man-made invention, and I do not see a single plain text to prove it in Scripture. Gradual growth in grace, growth in knowledge, growth in faith, growth in love, growth in holiness, growth in humility growth in spiritual mindedness. All this I see clearly taught and urged in Scripture and clearly exemplified in the lives of many of God's saints. But I fail to see in the Bible sudden instantaneous leaps from conversion to consecration. I doubt indeed whether we have any biblical basis for saying that someone can possibly be converted without being consecrated to God. He can doubtless be more consecrated and will be as his grace increases, 
But if he was not consecrated to God in the very day that he was converted and born again, I do not know what conversion means. Are not people in danger of undervaluing and underrating the immense blessedness of conversion? Are they not, when they urge on believers the higher life as a second conversion, underrating the length, breadth, depth, and height of that great first change that Scripture calls the new birth? the new creation, and the spiritual resurrection. I may be mistaken, but I have sometimes thought while reading the strong language used by many about consecration in the last few years that those who use it must have previously had an exceptionally low and inadequate view of conversion, if indeed they knew anything about conversion at all. I have almost suspected that when they were consecrated, they were in reality converted for the first time. I openly confess that I prefer the old paths. Scripture. Thus hath the Lord said, Stand ye in the ways, and see, and ask for the old paths, where the good way is, and walk therein, and ye shall find rest for your souls. Jeremiah 6.16 I think it is wiser and safer to insist to all converted people the possibility of continual growth in grace and the absolute necessity of going forward, increasing more and more, and every year dedicating and consecrating themselves more in spirit, soul, and body to Christ. By all means, let us teach that there is more holiness to be attained and more of heaven to be enjoyed upon earth than most believers now experience. But I decline to tell any converted person that he needs a second conversion and that he may someday move in one enormous step into a state of entire consecration. I decline to teach it because I cannot see any basis for such teaching in Scripture. I decline to teach it because I think the tendency of the doctrine is thoroughly harmful, depressing the humble-minded and meek and puffing up the shallow, the ignorant, and the self-conceited to a most dangerous extent. In the seventh and last place, is it wise to teach believers that they should not think so much of fighting and struggling against sin, but ought rather to yield themselves to God and be passive in the hands of Christ? Is this in harmony with God's word? I doubt it. It is a simple fact that the expression yield yourselves is only found in one place in the New Testament as a duty urged upon believers. That place is in Romans 6, 13 through 19. And there within those six verses, the expression occurs five times. But even there, the term does not have the sense of placing ourselves passively in the hands of another. Any Greek student can tell us that the sense is rather that of actively presenting ourselves for use, employment, and service, similar to Romans 12.1. Therefore I beseech you, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies in living sacrifice, holy, well-pleasing unto God, which is your rational worship. The expression to yield yourselves in this way, therefore, stands alone in Scripture. On the other hand, it would not be difficult to point out at least 25 or 30 distinct passages in the epistles where believers are plainly taught to use active personal exertion, are addressed as being responsible for doing energetically what Christ would have them do, and are told to arise and work rather than yield themselves up as passive agents and sit still. Holy violence, conflict, warfare, fight, a soldier's life, and wrestling are spoken of as characteristic of the true Christian. The account of the armor of God in the sixth chapter of Ephesians settles the question, one might think. Again, it would be easy to show that the doctrine of sanctification without personal effort by simply yielding ourselves to God is precisely the doctrine of the antinomian fanatics of the 17th century to whom I have referred already, described in Rutherford's Spiritual Antichrist, and that the tendency of it is evil in the extreme. Again, it would be easy to show that the doctrine is utterly subversive of the whole teaching of such tried and approved books as Pilgrim's Progress, and that if we accept such doctrine, we ought to put Bunyan's old book in the fire. 
If Christian in Pilgrim's Progress simply yielded himself to God and never fought, struggled, or wrestled, I have read the famous allegory in vain. But the plain truth is that people will persist in confusing two things that differ, that is, justification and sanctification. In justification, the word to be addressed to us is believe, only believe. In sanctification, we must watch, pray, and fight. What God has divided, let us not mingle and confuse. I leave the subject of my introduction here and hurry to a conclusion. I confess that I lay down my pen with feelings of sorrow and anxiety. There is much in the attitude of professing Christians in this day that fills me with concern and makes me full of fear for the future. There is an amazing ignorance of Scripture among many and a consequent lack of established, solid Christianity. In no other way can I account for the ease with which people are like children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine. Ephesians 4.14 There is an Athenian love of anything new and an unhealthy aversion for anything old, regular, and in the beaten path of our forefathers. For all the Athenians and strangers who were there spent their time in nothing else but either to tell or to hear some new thing. Acts 17.21 Thousands will gather together to hear a new voice and a new doctrine without considering for a moment whether what they hear is true. There is an incessant craving after any teaching that is sensational, exciting, and stirs up emotion. There is an unhealthy appetite for a sort of intermittent and emotional Christianity. The religious life of many is little better than spiritual taste-testing, and the agreeable spirit and peaceful that Peter commends is completely forgotten. 1 Peter 3.4 Crowds, crying, feelings, entertaining singing, and an incessant stirring up of the emotions are the only things that many people care for. Inability to distinguish differences in doctrine is spreading far and wide, and as long as the preacher seems clever and earnest, people seem to think that it must be all right, and they call you dreadfully narrow and unloving if you hint that the preacher is unsound. Preachers with opposing doctrines such as Moody and Hawaii, Dean Stanley and Canon Lydon, Macanochi and Pearsall Smith all seem to be alike in the eyes of such people. Footnote. Ryle seems to be comparing biblical preachers to non-biblical preachers or moralists, saying that many people do not seem to be able to distinguish between biblical and unbiblical preaching. Text resumes. All this is very sad. But if in addition to this, the true-hearted advocates of increased holiness are going to fight with each other along the way and misunderstand one another, it will be sadder still. We will indeed be in a bad situation. For myself, I am aware that I am no longer a young minister. My mind perhaps is more rigid, and I cannot easily receive any new doctrine. The old is better. I suppose I belong to the old school of evangelical theology, and I am therefore content with such teaching about sanctification as I find in The Life of Faith by Richard Sibes, The Life of Faith by Thomas Manton, and in The Life, Walk, and Triumph of Faith by William Romaine. I must confess a hope that my younger brethren who have taken up new views of holiness will beware of multiplying causeless divisions do they think that a higher standard of Christian living is needed in the present day? So do I. Do they think that clearer, stronger, fuller teaching about holiness is needed? So do I. Do they think that Christ ought to be more exalted as the root and author of sanctification as well as justification? So do I. Do they think that believers should be urged more and more to live by faith? So do I. Do they think that a very close walk with God should be urged more on believers as the secret of happiness and usefulness. So do I. In all these things we agree. But if they want to go further than this, then I ask them to be careful where they tread and to explain very clearly and distinctly what they mean. Finally, 
I must express my disapproval, and I do it in love, of the use of unrefined and newly made up terms and phrases in teaching sanctification. I believe that a movement in favor of holiness cannot be advanced by new phraseology or by disproportioned and one sided statements. It cannot be advanced by overstraining and isolating particular texts, by exalting one truth at the expense of another, by allegorizing and accommodating texts and squeezing out of them meanings that the Holy Spirit never put in them, or by speaking scornfully and bitterly of those who do not see things entirely as we do, and who do not work exactly as we think they should. These things do not make for peace, but they repel many and keep them at a distance. The cause of true sanctification is not helped but hindered by such weapons as these. A movement in aid of holiness that produces strife and dispute among God's children is somewhat suspicious. For Christ's sake, and in the name of truth and charity, let us endeavor to follow after peace as well as holiness. Scripture. What therefore God has joined together, let not men separate. Matthew 19.6 It is my heart's desire and daily prayer to God that personal holiness may increase greatly among professing Christians. But I hope that all who attempt to promote it will adhere closely to the harmony of Scripture, will carefully distinguish things that differ, and will separate the precious from the vile. Jeremiah 15.19 Chapter 1. Sin Sin is the transgression of the law. 1 John 3, 4 He who wants to attain the right views about Christian holiness must begin by examining the vast and solemn subject of sin. He must dig down very deep if he wants to build high. A mistake here is most harmful. Wrong views about holiness are generally traceable to wrong views about human corruption. I make no apology for beginning this book about holiness by making some plain statements about sin. The plain truth is that a proper knowledge of sin lies at the root of all saving Christianity. Without it, such doctrines as justification, conversion, and sanctification are only words and names that convey no meaning to the mind. The first thing, therefore, that God does when he makes anyone a new creation in Christ is to send light into his heart and show him that he is a guilty sinner. The physical creation in Genesis began with light, and so also does the spiritual creation. God shines into our hearts by the work of the Holy Spirit, and then spiritual life begins. Scripture for the God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness has shined in our hearts to bring forth the light of the knowledge of the clarity of God in the face of Jesus Christ. 2 Corinthians 4 6. Dim or indistinct views of sin are the origin of most of the errors, heresies, and false doctrines of the present day. If a person does not realize the dangerous nature of his soul's disease, you cannot wonder that he is content with false or imperfect remedies. I believe that one of the main needs of the church in this century has been and is clearer, fuller teaching about sin. I will begin the subject by supplying the definition of sin. We are all, of course, familiar with the terms sin and sinners. We talk frequently of sin being in the world and of people committing sins. But what do we mean by these terms? Do we really know? I'm afraid that there is much mental confusion and haziness on this point. Let me try as briefly as possible to provide an answer. Speaking generally, sin is, as the ninth article of the Church of England declares, the fault and corruption of the nature of every person who is naturally born of the offspring of Adam whereby man is very far gone from original righteousness and is of his own nature inclined to evil, so that the flesh always lusts against the spirit. Therefore, 
In every person born into the world, it deserves God's wrath and damnation. Sin is simply that vast moral disease that affects the whole human race, of every status, class, title, nation, people, and language. It is a disease from which there was only one born of woman who was not affected. Needless to say, that one was Christ Jesus the Lord. I say furthermore that sin, to speak more specifically, consists in doing, saying, thinking, or imagining anything that is not in perfect conformity with the mind and law of God. As the scripture simply says, sin is the transgression of the law. 1 John 3, 4 the slightest outward or inward departure from absolute mathematical parallelism with God's revealed will and character constitutes a sin and instantly makes us guilty in God's sight. Of course, I do not need to tell anyone who reads his Bible with attention that a person can break God's law in heart and thought even when there is no plain and visible act of wickedness. Our Lord has settled that point beyond dispute in the Sermon on the Mount. Matthew 5, 21-28 Even a poet of our own has truly said that one may smile and smile and be a villain. Footnote From William Shakespeare's Hamlet Text resumes Again, I do not need to tell a careful student of the New Testament that there are sins of omission as well as commission, and that we sin, as our Book of Common Prayer justly reminds us, by leaving undone the things we ought to do as certainly as by doing the things we ought not to do. The solemn words of our Master in the Gospel of Matthew place this point also beyond dispute. It is there written, Depart from me, ye cursed, into eternal fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me no food. I was thirsty, and you gave me no drink. Matthew twenty-five forty-one through 42 it was a deep and thoughtful saying of holy Archbishop Usher just before he died, Lord, forgive me all my sins, and especially my sins of omission. I think it is necessary in these times to remind my readers that a person can commit sin and yet be ignorant of it, and can imagine himself innocent when he is guilty. I failed to see any scriptural basis for the modern assertion that Sin is not sin to us until we recognize it and are conscious of it. On the contrary, in the fourth and fifth chapters of that inappropriately neglected book Leviticus, and in the fifteenth chapter of Numbers, the children of Israel were distinctly taught that there were sins of ignorance that caused people to be unclean and in need of atonement. Leviticus 4 verses 1 through 35, 5 verses 14 through 19, Numbers 15, 25 through 29. Also, I find our Lord distinctly teaching that the servant who did not know his master's will and did it not was not excused on account of his ignorance, but was beaten or punished. Luke 12, 48. We would do well to remember that when we measure our own sinfulness by our own miserably imperfect knowledge and consciousness, we are on very dangerous ground. A deeper study of Leviticus might do us much good. The Origin and Source of Sin I must say something concerning the origin and source of this vast moral disease called sin. I fear the views of many professing Christians on this point are sadly defective and unsound. I dare not pass it by. Let us, then, have it settled in our minds that the sinfulness of man does not begin from without but from within. It is not the result of bad training in early years. It is not picked up from bad companions and bad examples, as some weak Christians are too fond of saying. No, it is a family disease that we all inherit from our first parents, Adam and Eve, and with which we are born. Created in the image of God, Genesis 1.27, innocent and righteous at first, our parents fell from original righteousness and became sinful and corrupt. From that day to this, all men and women are born in the image of fallen Adam and Eve and inherit a heart and nature inclined to evil. Scripture Sin entered into the world by one man. Romans 5.12 That which is born of the flesh is flesh. John 3.6 
We are by nature the children of wrath. Ephesians 2.3 The prudence of the flesh is enmity against God. Romans 8.7 Out of the heart of men, naturally as out of a fountain, come forth the evil thoughts, the adulteries, and the like. Mark 7.21 The sweetest baby that has entered life this year and has become the sunbeam of a family is not, as its mother perhaps fondly calls it, a little angel or a little innocent one, but is a little sinner. Sadly, as it lies smiling and cooing in its cradle, that little creature carries in its heart the seeds of every kind of wickedness. Just watch her carefully as she grows in stature and her mind develops, and you will soon detect in her an incessant tendency to that which is bad and a backwardness to that which is good. You will see in her the buds and germs of deceit, evil temper, selfishness, self-will, stubbornness, greediness, envy, jealousy, anger, and more, which, if indulged and let alone, will increase with painful rapidity. Who taught the child these things? Where did he learn them? The Bible alone can answer these questions. Of all the foolish things that parents say about their children, there is none worse than the common saying, My son has a good heart. He is not what he ought to be, but he has fallen into bad company. Public schools are bad places. The teachers neglect the boys, but he has a good heart. The truth, unhappily, is completely the opposite. The first cause of all sin lies in the natural corruption of the boy's own heart, and not in the school. The Extent of Sin Concerning the extent of this vast moral disease of man called sin, let us be careful that we do not make a mistake. The only safe ground is that which is laid for us in Scripture. Scripture. Every imagination of the thoughts of his heart is by nature only evil continually. Genesis 6.5 The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Jeremiah 17.9 Sin is a disease that pervades and runs through every part of our moral constitution and every faculty of our minds. The understanding, the affections, the reasoning powers, and the will are all more or less infected. Even the conscience is so blinded that it cannot be depended on as a sure guide, and it is as likely to lead people wrong as right, unless it is enlightened by the Holy Spirit. In summary, from the sole of the foot, even unto the head, there is no soundness about us. Isaiah 1.6 The disease may be veiled under a thin covering of courtesy, politeness, good manners, and outward decorum, but it lies deep down inside. I fully admit that man has many great and noble abilities left about him, and that in arts and sciences and literature he shows immense capacity. But the fact remains that in spiritual things he is utterly dead and has no natural knowledge, love, or fear of God. His best things are so interwoven and intermingled with corruption that the contrast only brings into sharper view the truth and extent of the fall. Those who ridicule God's written word and mock those who believe and love the Bible do not understand that one and the same creature can be in some things so high and in others so low, so great and yet so little, so noble and yet so insignificant, so impressive in his planning and execution of material things, and yet so depraved and debased in his passions. The godless do not understand how man is able to plan and erect buildings like those of Karnak and Luxor in Egypt, and the Parthenon at Athens, and yet worship monstrous gods and goddesses, and birds beasts, and creeping things. The wicked do not see how man is able to produce such plays like those of Aeschylus and Sophocles, and histories like that of Thucydides, and yet be a slave to abominable wickedness, like that described in the first chapter of Romans. This alleged mystery, though, is a knot that we can untie with the Bible in our hands. We can acknowledge that man has all the marks of a majestic temple about him, a temple in which God once dwelt, but which is now in utter ruins, a temple in which a shattered window here and a doorway and a column there 
still give some faint idea of the magnificence of the original design, but a temple from which end to end has lost its glory and has fallen from its once lofty position. Nothing resolves the complicated problem of man's condition but the doctrine of original or birth sin and the crushing effects of the fall. Let us remember, in addition to this, that every part of the world bears testimony to the fact that sin is the universal disease of all mankind. Search the globe from east to west and from pole to pole. Search every nation of every region in the four quarters of the earth. Search every group and class in our own country, from the highest to the lowest, under every circumstance and condition, and the report will always be the same. The remotest islands in the Pacific Ocean, completely separate from Europe, Asia, Africa, and America, beyond the reach alike of Oriental luxury and Western arts and literature, islands inhabited by people ignorant of books, money, technology, and modern weapons, uncontaminated by the vices of modern civilization. These very islands have always been found when first discovered the home of the most wicked forms of lust, cruelty, deceit, and superstition. If the inhabitants have known nothing else, they have always known how to sin. Everywhere in the world, the human heart is naturally deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Jeremiah 17.9 For my part, I know no stronger proof of the inspiration of Genesis and Moses' account of the origin of man than the power, extent, and universality of sin. If you understand that all mankind has come from one couple, and that this man and woman fell as Genesis 3 tells us, then the condition of human nature everywhere is easily accounted for. If you deny it, as most do, you are at once involved in unexplainable difficulties, that is, the uniformity and universality of human corruption provide one of the most unanswerable instances of the enormous difficulties of infidelity. Footnote. The Difficulties of Infidelity was a book written in 1824 by George Stanley Faber, 1773-1854, to address those who claim that there were too many difficulties with the Bible to believe it. Faber wrote that the Bible provided the answers while the difficulties of infidelity or unbelief were far greater and more difficult than those of which they accused Christianity. Text resumes, After all, I am convinced that the greatest proof of the extent and power of sin is the tenacity with which it cleaves to man even after he is converted and has become the subject of the Holy Spirit's operations. To use the language of the ninth article, this infection of nature does remain, yes, even in those who are regenerate. So deeply planted are the roots of human corruption that even after we are born again, renewed, washed, sanctified, justified, and made living members of Christ, these roots remain alive in the bottom of our hearts, and like the leprosy in the walls of the house, we never get rid of them until the earthly house of this tabernacle is dissolved. Leviticus 14, 33-57 Sin, no doubt, in the believer's heart, no longer has dominion. It is checked, controlled, mortified, and crucified by the expulsive power of the new principle of grace. The life of a believer is a life of victory and not of failure. But the very struggles that go on within his heart, the fight that he finds it needful to fight daily, the watchful jealousy which he is obliged to exercise over his inner man, the contest between the flesh and the spirit, and the inward groanings that no one knows except he who has experienced them all, testify to the same great truth. They all show the enormous power and vitality of sin. Mighty indeed must that foe be who even when crucified is still alive. Happy is that believer who understands it and while he rejoices in Christ Jesus, has no confidence in the flesh, and while he says, Thanks be to God, who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ, 1 Corinthians 15.57, he never forgets to watch and pray, so he does not fall into temptation. Mark 14.38 The Sinfulness of Sin Concerning the guilt, vileness, and offensiveness of sin in the sight of God, my words will be few. 
I say few advisedly. I do not think in the nature of things that mortal man can at all realize the exceeding sinfulness of sin in the sight of that holy and perfect one with whom we have to do. On the one hand, God is that eternal being who charged his angels with folly, Job 4.18, and in whose sight not even the heavens are clean, Job 15.15. He is one who reads thoughts and motives as well as actions and requires truth in the inward parts, Psalm 51, 6. We, on the other hand, poor, blind creatures, here today and gone tomorrow, born in sin, surrounded by sinners, living in a constant atmosphere of weakness, infirmity, and imperfection, can form none but the most inadequate notion of the hideousness of evil. We have no tools to measure its depth and breadth. The blind man can see no difference between a masterpiece of Titian or Raphael and the queen's head on a village signboard. The deaf man cannot distinguish between a penny whistle and a cathedral organ. The very animals whose smell is most offensive to us have no idea that they are offensive, and they are not offensive to one another. Fallen man, I believe, can have no real idea what a vile thing sin is in the sight of that God whose handiwork is absolutely perfect. Perfect whether we look through telescope or microscope. Perfect in the formation of a mighty planet like Jupiter with his satellites, keeping time to a second as he rolls round the sun. Perfect in the formation of the smallest insect that crawls over a foot of ground. Nevertheless, let us settle it firmly in our minds that sin is the abominable thing that God hates, Jeremiah 44.4, that God is of purer eyes than to behold iniquity and cannot look upon that which is evil, Habakkuk 1.13, that the least transgression of God's law makes us guilty of all, James 2.10, that the soul that sins will die, Ezekiel 18.4, that the wages of sin is death, Romans 6.23, that God shall judge that which men have covered up, Romans 2.16, that there is a worm that never dies and a fire that is not quenched, Mark 9.44, that the wicked shall be put into Sheol, Psalm 9.17, that they shall go away into eternal punishment, Matthew 25.46, and that nothing that defiles will ever enter heaven, Revelation 21.27. These are indeed tremendous words, especially when we consider that they are written in the book of a most merciful God. No proof of the fullness of sin, after all, is so overwhelming and unanswerable as the cross and passion of our Lord Jesus Christ and the whole doctrine of His substitution and atonement. Terribly dreadful must that guilt be for which nothing but the blood of the Son of God could make satisfaction. Heavy must that weight of human sin be that made Jesus groan and sweat drops of blood in agony at Gethsemane and caused him to cry out at Golgotha, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Matthew 27, 46 Nothing, I am convinced, will astonish us so much when we awaken the resurrection day as the view we will have of sin and the retrospect we will take of our own countless shortcomings and defects. Not until the hour when Christ comes the second time will we fully realize the sinfulness of sin. Footnote. Some of the Puritans wrote much about the sinfulness of sin. For examples, see Thomas Watson's The Mischief of Sin, Jeremiah Burroughs' The Evil of Evils, The Exceeding Sinfulness of Sin, and Ralph Venning's The Sinfulness of Sin. Text resumes. Well might George Whitfield say, The anthem in heaven will be, What has God made? Numbers 23.23 23. The Deceitfulness of Sin Only one point remains to be considered on the subject of sin, which I dare not pass over. That point is its deceitfulness. It is a point of most serious importance, and I think that it does not receive the attention it deserves. You can see this deceitfulness in the awful tendency of people to regard sin as less sinful and dangerous than it is in the sight of God, and in their readiness to pardon it, make excuses for it, and minimize its guilt. They say, it is just a little sin. God is merciful. 
God is not so extreme as to keep track of these little things that we do wrong. We mean well. One cannot be so critical. Where is the great harm? We only do as others do. There is no need to make such a big deal over such a little thing. Who is not familiar with this kind of language? You can see it in the long string of smooth words and phrases that people have used in order to designate things God calls downright wicked and ruinous to the soul. What do such expressions as mistake, choice, wild, unsteady, thoughtless, fun, or not hurting anyone mean? They show that people try to deceive themselves into the belief that sin is not quite as sinful as God says it is, and that they are not so bad as they really are. You can even see it in the tendency of believers to indulge their children in questionable practices and to bind their own eyes to the inevitable result of the love of money, of playing with temptation, and of allowing a low standard of family religion. I fear that we do not sufficiently realize the extreme deception of our soul's disease. We are too apt to forget that temptation to sin will rarely present itself to us in its true colors, saying, I am your deadly enemy, and I want to ruin you forever in hell. Oh no. Sin comes to us like Judas with a kiss. Matthew 26, 48-49 And like Joab with an outstretched hand and flattering words. 2 Samuel 20, 9-10 The forbidden fruit seemed good and desirable to Eve, yet it got her cast out of Eden. Walking idly on his palace roof seemed harmless enough to David, yet it ended in adultery and murder. Sin rarely seems to be sin at first. Let us then watch and pray, lest we fall into temptation. Matthew twenty six forty one. We may give wickedness smooth names, but we cannot alter its nature and character in the sight of God. Let us remember Paul's words. Exhort one another daily, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. Hebrews 3.13 It is a wise prayer that we pray, From the deceits of the world, the flesh, and the devil, good Lord, deliver us. Before I go further, let me briefly mention two thoughts that appeared to me to rise with irresistible force out of the subject. On the one hand, I ask my readers to observe what strong reasons we all have for examining and humbling ourselves. Let us sit down before the picture of sin displayed to us in the Bible and consider what guilty, vile, corrupt creatures we all are in the sight of God. What need we all have of that entire change of heart called regeneration, new birth, or conversion? What great weakness and imperfection clings to the very best of us at our very best? What a solemn thought it is that without holiness no one will see the Lord. Hebrews 12.14 When we think of our sins of omission as well as our sins of commission, we have much reason to cry with the publican every night of our lives, God reconcile me a sinner. Luke 18.13 How admirably suited are the general and communion confessions of our prayer book to the actual condition of all professing Christians. How well that language suits God's children that the prayer book puts in the mouth of every church member before he goes up to the communion table. The remembrance of our misdoings is grievous unto us. The burden is intolerable. Have mercy upon us. Have mercy upon us, most merciful Father. For thy Son, our Lord Jesus Christ's sake, forgive us all that is past. How true it is that the holiest saint in his humanness is a miserable sinner and a debtor to mercy and grace to the last moment of his existence. With my whole heart I endorse that passage in Richard Hooker's sermon on justification that begins, let the holiest and best things we do be considered. We are never better affected unto God than when we pray. Yet when we pray, how are our affections many times distracted? How little reverence do we show unto the grand majesty of God, unto whom we speak? How little remorse of our own miseries, how little taste of the sweet influence of His tender mercies do we feel? Are we not as unwilling many times to begin? and as glad to make an end, as if in saying, Call upon me, God had set us a very burdensome task. 
It may seem somewhat extreme, which I will speak, therefore let every one judge of it, even as his own heart shall tell him, and not otherwise. I will but only make a demand. If God should yield unto us, not as unto Abraham, if fifty, forty, thirty, twenty, yes, or if ten good persons could be found in a city, for their sakes this city should not be destroyed. But if he should make us an offer this generous, to search all the generations of men since the fall of our father Adam, find one man that has done one action that has passed from him pure, without any stain or blemish at all, and for that one man's only action neither man nor angel should feel the torments that are prepared for both, do you think that this ransom to deliver men and angels could be found to be among the sons of men? The best things that we do have something in them to be pardoned. Footnote. This is from a sermon by Richard Hooker, 1554 through 1600, called Learned Discourse of Justification. Text resumes. That witness is true. For my part, I am persuaded that the more light we have, the more we see our own sinfulness. The nearer we get to heaven, the more we are clothed with humility. If you will read Christian biographies, you will find it true that in every age of the church, the most eminent saints, men like Bradford, Rutherford, and McShane, have always been the humblest men. On the other hand, I ask my readers to observe how deeply thankful we ought to be for the glorious gospel of the grace of God. There is a remedy revealed for man's need as wide and broad and deep as man's disease. We do not need to be afraid to look at sin and study its nature, origin, power, extent, and vileness if we only look at the same time at the almighty remedy provided for us in the salvation that is in Jesus Christ. Though sin has abounded, grace has much more abounded. Romans 5.20 Yes, there is a full, perfect, and complete cure for the hideous disease of sin in the everlasting covenant of redemption, to which the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are parties. The cure is to be found in the mediator of that covenant, Jesus Christ the righteous, perfect God and perfect man in one person. The remedy is in the work that he did by dying for our sins and rising again for our justification. It is found in the offices that he fills as our priest, substitute, physician, shepherd, and advocate, in the precious blood he shed that can cleanse from all sin, in the everlasting righteousness that he brought in, in the perpetual intercession that he carries on as our representative at God's right hand, in his power to save the chief of sinners to the uttermost, in his willingness to receive and pardon the vilest, in his readiness to sustain the weakest, and in the grace of the Holy Spirit that he plants in the hearts of all his people, renewing, sanctifying, and causing old things to pass away and all things to become new. In all this, and oh what a brief sketch it is, there is a full, perfect, and complete cure for the hideous disease of sin. As dreadful and immense as the bright view of sin undoubtedly is, no one needs to faint and despair if he will take a right view of Jesus Christ at the same time. No wonder that old John Flavel ends many chapters of his admirable fountain of life with the touching words, Blessed be God for Jesus Christ. Footnote. John Flavel, 1627-1691, through 1691, was an English Puritan pastor and author. His book, The Fountain of Life, contains 42 of his sermons. Text resumes. In bringing this mighty subject to a close, I feel that I have only touched its surface. It is one that cannot be thoroughly handled in a book like this. If you want to read more fully and exhaustively about this subject, you must turn to such masters of practical theology as Owen, Burgess, Manton, Charnock, and the other giants of the Puritan school. On subjects like this, there are no writers to be compared to the Puritans. It only remains for me to point out some practical uses to which the whole doctrine of sin can be profitably turned in the present day. First, a scriptural view of sin is one of the best antidotes to that vague, dim, misty, hazy kind of theology 
that is so painfully current in the present age. It is vain to shut your eyes to the fact that there is a vast quantity of so-called Christianity today that you cannot declare positively unsound, but which nevertheless is not quite accurate or biblical. It is a Christianity in which there is undeniably something about Christ, something about grace, something about faith, something about repentance, and something about holiness. But it is not the real thing as it is in the Bible. Things are out of place and out of proportion. As Hugh Latimer would have said, it is a kind of mingle-mangle, and it does no good. Footnote. Hugh Latimer, 1487-1555, was a former Roman Catholic priest who converted to Protestantism and supported many Reformation teachings. He was burned at the stake as a martyr during the reign of Roman Catholic Queen Mary for refusing to recant his beliefs. Text resumes. It does not influence one's daily conduct, does not provide comfort in life, and does not give peace in death. Those who hold these beliefs often awake too late to see that they have got nothing solid under their feet. I believe the most likely way to cure and fix this defective kind of religion is to bring forward more prominently the old scriptural truth about the sinfulness of sin. People will never set their faces decidedly toward heaven and live like pilgrims until they really feel that they are in danger of hell. Let us all try to revive the old teaching about sin to our young children, our older children, and in our schools, colleges, and universities. Let us not forget that the law is good if a man uses it legitimately, 1 Timothy 1.8, and that by the law is the knowledge of sin, Romans 3.20. Let us bring the law to the front and strongly bring it to people's attention. Let us expound and explain the Ten Commandments, showing the length, breadth, depth, and height of their requirements. This is the way of our Lord in the Sermon on the Mount. We cannot do better than follow His plan. We can depend upon it that people will never come to Jesus and stay with Jesus and live for Jesus unless they really know why they are to come and what their need is. Those whom the Spirit draws to Jesus are those whom the Spirit is convinced of sin. Without thorough conviction of sin, people may seem to come to Jesus and follow Him for a little while, but they will soon fall away and return to the world. Next, a scriptural view of sin is one of the best antidotes to the extravagantly broad and liberal theology that is so popular at the present time. The tendency of modern thought is to reject dogmas, creeds, and every kind of boundary in Christianity. It is thought great and wise to condemn no opinion whatsoever, and to pronounce all sincere and clever teachers to be trustworthy, however mixed and mutually destructive their opinions may be. Everything is considered true, and nothing is false. Everybody is right, and nobody is wrong. Everybody is likely to be saved, and nobody is to be lost. The atonement and substitution of Christ, the personality of the devil, the miraculous element in Scripture, and the reality and eternity of future punishment are all calmly tossed overboard like lumber in order to lighten the ship of Christianity and enable it to keep pace with modern liberal views. If you stand up for these great truths of the Bible, you are called narrow, intolerant, old-fashioned, and theologically outdated. Quote a biblical text, and you are told that all truth is not confined to the pages of an ancient Jewish book, and that free inquiry has found out many things since the book was completed. I know nothing as likely to counteract this modern plague as constant, clear statements about the nature, reality, vileness, power, and guilt of sin. We must charge home into the consciences of these people of broad views and demand a plain answer to some plain questions. We must ask them to lay their hands on their hearts and tell us whether their favorite opinions comfort them in the day of sickness, in the hour of death, by the bedside of dying parents, and by the grave of a beloved wife or child. We must ask them whether a vague earnestness without definite doctrine gives them peace at times like these. We must challenge them to tell us whether they do not sometimes feel a gnawing something within that all the free thought and philosophy and science in the world cannot satisfy. Then we must tell them that this gnawing something is the sense of sin, 
guilt and corruption that they are leaving out of their calculations. Above all, we must tell them that nothing will ever allow them to find rest except submission to the old doctrines of man's ruin and Christ's redemption and simple childlike faith in Jesus. Next, a correct view of sin is the best antidote to that sentimental, ceremonial, formal kind of Christianity that has swept over our land like a flood in the last 25 years and has carried away so many before it. I can well believe that there is much that is attractive in this system of religion, to a certain type of mind, as long as the conscience is not fully enlightened. But when that wonderful part of our constitution called conscience is really awake and alive, I find it hard to believe that a sentimental ceremonial Christianity will thoroughly satisfy us. A little child is easily quieted and amused with bright toys, dolls, and rattles, as long as he is not hungry. But once he feels the cravings of nature within, we know that nothing will satisfy him but food. This is the same way it is with man in the matter of his soul. Music, flowers, candles, incense, banners, processions, beautiful vestments, confessionals, and man-made ceremonies of a semi-Roman Catholic character may do well enough for him under certain conditions. But once he awakes and arises from the dead, Ephesians 5.14, he will not rest content with these things. They will seem to him to be mere meaningless ceremonies and a waste of time. Once he sees his sin, he will know that he must see his Savior. He feels stricken with a deadly disease, and nothing will satisfy him but the great physician. He hungers and thirsts, and he must have nothing less than the bread of life. I may seem bold in what I am about to say, but I fearlessly claim that four-fifths of the semi-Roman Catholicism of the last quarter of a century would never have existed if people had been taught more fully and clearly the nature, vileness, and sinfulness of sin. Next, a proper view of sin is one of the best antidotes to the overstrained theories of perfection that we hear so much about in these times. I will only say a little about this, and in saying it, I hope I will not give offense. If those who urge perfection on us mean nothing more than a general consistency and a careful attention to all the graces that make up the Christian character, we would not only bear with them, but we would agree with them entirely. By all means, let us aim high. But if people really mean to tell us that here, in this world, a believer can attain to entire freedom from sin, live for years in unbroken and uninterrupted communion with God, and for months at a time not even have one sinful thought, I must honestly say that such an opinion appears to me very unscriptural. I will go even further. I say that the opinion is very dangerous to those who hold it, and is very likely to depress, discourage, and hold people back from inquiring after salvation. I cannot find the slightest basis in God's word for expecting such perfection as this while we are in the body. I believe the words of our 15th article are strictly true, that Christ alone is without sin, and that all we, the rest, though baptized and born again in Christ, offend in many things. And if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. To use the language of our first homily, there are imperfections in our best works. We do not love God so much as we are bound to do, with all our hearts, mind, and power. We do not fear God so much as we ought to do. We do not pray to God but with many and great imperfections. We give, forgive, believe, live, and hope imperfectly. We speak, think, and do imperfectly. We fight against the devil, the world, and the flesh imperfectly. Let us therefore not be ashamed to confess plainly our state of imperfections. Once more, I repeat that the best preservative against this temporary delusion about perfection that clouds some minds, I hope I may call it that, is a clear, full, and distinct understanding of the nature, sinfulness, and deceitfulness of sin. Finally, a scriptural view of sin will prove to be an admirable antidote to those low views of personal holiness that are so painfully prevalent in these last days of the Church. 
This is a very painful and delicate subject, I know, but I dare not turn away from it. It has long been my sorrowful conviction that the standard of daily life among professing Christians in this country has been gradually falling. I'm afraid that Christ-like charity, kindness, good character, unselfishness, humility, gentleness, patience, self-denial, zeal to do good, and separation from the world are far less appreciated than they ought to be, and they are far less common than they used to be in the days of our fathers. I cannot pretend to enter fully into the causes of this state of things, and can only suggest speculation for consideration. It might be that professing religion has become so fashionable and comparatively easy in the present age that the streams that were once narrow and deep have become wide and shallow, and what we have gained in outward show we have lost in quality. It might be that the vast increase of wealth in the last fifty years has insensibly introduced a plague of worldliness, self-indulgence, and love of ease into social life. What were once called luxuries are now comforts and necessaries, and self-denial and enduring hardness are consequently little known. 2 Timothy 2.3 It might be that the enormous amount of contention that marks this age has insensibly dried up our spiritual lives. We have too often been content with zeal for orthodoxy and have neglected the strict realities of daily practical godliness. Whatever the causes may be, I must declare my own belief that the result remains. There has been a lower standard of personal holiness among believers lately than there used to be in the days of our fathers. The whole result is that the spirit is grieved, and the matter calls for much humiliation and searching of heart. As to the best remedy for the state of things I have mentioned, I will dare to give an opinion. Other schools of thought in the churches must judge for themselves. The cure for evangelical Christians, I am convinced, is to be found in a clearer understanding of the nature and sinfulness of sin. We do not need to go back to Egypt and borrow semi-Roman Catholic practices in order to revive our spiritual lives. We do not need to restore the confessional or return to monasticism or asceticism. Nothing of the kind. We must simply repent and do our first works, Revelation 2.5. We must return to the first principles. We must go back to the old paths, Jeremiah 6.16. We must sit down humbly in the presence of God, look the whole subject in the face, and examine clearly what the Lord Jesus calls sin and what the Lord Jesus calls doing His will. We must then try to realize that it is very possible to live a careless, easy-going, half-worldly life, while at the same time maintaining evangelical principles and calling ourselves evangelical people. Once we see that sin is far viler, far nearer to us, and sticks more closely to us than we had supposed, we will be led, I believe, to get nearer to Christ. Once we are drawn nearer to Christ, we will drink more deeply out of His fullness and learn more thoroughly to live the life of faith in Him, as Paul did. Once we have been taught to live the life of faith in Jesus and abide in Him, we will bear more fruit and will find ourselves stronger for duty, more patient in trial, more watchful over our poor weak hearts, and more like our Master in all our little daily ways. In the same proportion that we realize how much Christ has done for us, we will labor to do much for Christ. Much forgiven, we will love much. Luke 7.47 As the Apostle Paul says, Beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord with uncovered face, we are transformed from glory to glory into the same likeness, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. 2 Corinthians 3.18 Whatever some may choose to think or say, there can be no doubt that an increased feeling about holiness is one of the signs of the times. Conferences for the promotion of spiritual life are becoming common in the present day. The subject of spiritual life finds a place on Christian platforms almost every year. It has awakened an amount of interest and general attention throughout the land, for which we ought to be thankful. 
any movement based on sound principles that helps to deepen our spiritual lives and increase our personal holiness will be a real blessing to the church. It will do much to draw us together and heal our unhappy divisions. It might bring down some fresh outpouring of the grace of the Spirit and be life from the dead in these later times. Romans 11.15 But, as certain as I am, as I said earlier, that we must dig deep if we want to build high, I am convinced that the first step toward attaining a higher standard of holiness is to realize more fully the exceeding sinfulness of sin. Chapter 2. Sanctification Sanctify them in thy truth. John 17.17 17. For the will of God is your sanctification. 1 Thessalonians 4.3 the subject of sanctification is one that many Christians, I am afraid, greatly dislike. Some even turn from it with scorn and disdain. The very last thing they would like is to be a saint or a sanctified person. Yet the subject does not deserve to be treated in this way. It is not an enemy, but a friend. It is a subject of the utmost importance to our souls. If the Bible is true, it is certain that unless we are sanctified, we will not be saved. There are three things that, according to the Bible, are absolutely necessary to the salvation of every man and woman in Christendom. These three things are justification, regeneration, and sanctification. All three meet in every child of God. He is born again, justified, and sanctified. He who lacks any one of these three things is not a true Christian in the sight of God and will not be found in heaven and glorified in the last day if he dies in that condition. It is a subject that is especially relevant in our day. Strange doctrines have lately arisen upon the subject of sanctification. Some people appear to confuse it with justification. Others dismiss it as almost nothing under the pretense of zeal for free grace and practically neglect it altogether. Others are so much afraid of works being made a part of justification that they can hardly find any place at all for works in their religion. Others set up a wrong standard of sanctification before their eyes and failing to attain it, waste their lives moving from church to church and denomination to denomination in the vain hope that they will find what they want. In a day like this, a calm examination of the subject as a main doctrine of the gospel may be of great use to our souls. First, let us consider the true nature of sanctification. Second, let us consider the visible marks of sanctification. Finally, let us consider how justification and sanctification agree and are similar to one another, and how they differ and are unlike one another. If, unhappily, you care for nothing except this world, making no profession of Christianity, I cannot expect you to take much interest in what I am writing. You will probably think that it is a matter of words and names and nice questions about which it does not matter what you hold and believe. But if you are a thoughtful, reasonable, and sensible Christian, I venture to say that you will find it worthwhile to have some clear ideas about sanctification. The True Nature of Sanctification First we must consider the nature of sanctification. What does the Bible mean when it speaks of a sanctified person? Sanctification is that inward spiritual work that the Lord Jesus Christ works in a person by the Holy Spirit when He calls him to be a true believer. He not only washes him from his sins in his own blood, but he also separates him from his natural love of sin and the world, puts a new principle in his heart, and makes him practically godly in life. The instrument by which the Spirit effects this work is generally the Word of God, though he sometimes uses afflictions and providential visitations without a word. 1 Peter 3.1 a sanctified person, according to Scripture, is one upon whom Christ Jesus works in this way by His Spirit. 
He who thinks that Jesus Christ only lived and died and rose again in order to provide justification and forgiveness of sins for his people has much yet to learn. Whether he knows it or not, he is dishonoring our blessed Lord and making him only a half-savior. The Lord Jesus has undertaken everything that his people's souls require, not only to deliver them from the guilt of their sins by his atoning death, but also to deliver them from the dominion of their sins by placing the Holy Spirit in their hearts, not only to justify them, but also to sanctify them. He is thus not only their righteousness, but their sanctification. Of him ye are reborn in Christ Jesus, who of God has made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. 1 Corinthians 1.30 Let us hear what the Bible says. For their sakes I sanctify myself, that they also might be sanctified in the truth. John 17.19 Christ also loved the congregation and gave himself for her, that he might sanctify and cleanse her. Ephesians 5.25-26 Christ gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a people of his own, zealous of good works. Titus 2.14 Christ bore our sins in his own body on the tree that we, being dead to sins, should live unto righteousness. 1 Peter 2.24 You that were in another time alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now he has reconciled you in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and unblameable and unreprovable in his sight. Colossians 1, 21-22 Let the meaning of these five texts be carefully considered. If these words mean anything, they teach that Christ undertakes the sanctification of his believing people just as he undertakes their justification. Both are alike provided for in that everlasting covenant, ordered in all things, and it shall be kept. 2 Samuel 23, 5, of which the mediator is Christ. In fact, Christ in one place is called he that sanctifies, and his people are called those who are sanctified. Hebrews 2, 11. The subject before us is of such deep and vast importance that it requires fences, guarding, clearing up, and marking out on every side. A doctrine that is needful for salvation can never be too sharply developed or brought too fully into light. To clear away the confusion between one doctrine and another, which is so unhappily common among Christians, and to map out the precise relationship between one truth and another in Christianity is one way to attain accuracy in our theology. I will therefore not hesitate to lay before my readers a series of connected propositions or statements drawn from Scripture that I think will be found useful in defining the exact nature of sanctification. 1. Sanctification, then, is the unchanging result of that vital union with Christ that true faith gives to a Christian. Scripture. He that abides in me, and I in him, the same brings forth much fruit. John 15, 5. The branch that bears no fruit is not a living branch of the vine. The union with Christ that produces no effect on one's heart and life is a mere formal union, and it is worthless before God. The faith that does not have a sanctifying influence on one's character is no better than the faith of demons. Scripture. Faith, if it does not have works, is dead in and of itself. James 2, 17. It is not the gift of God. It is not the faith of God's elect. Simply put, where there is no sanctification of life, there is no real faith in Christ. True faith works by love. It compels a person to live unto the Lord from a deep sense of gratitude for redemption. It makes him feel that he can never do too much for him who died for him. Being forgiven much, he loves much. He whom the blood cleanses walks in the light, 1 John 1, 7. He who has real, lively hope in Christ purifies himself even as he is pure, 1 John 3, 3. 2. Sanctification is the outcome and inseparable consequence of regeneration. 
He who is born again and is made a new creation receives a new nature and a new creed, and he always lives a new life. If someone claims to be regenerated, yet lives carelessly in sin or worldliness, it is a regeneration invented by uninspired theologians, but is never mentioned in Scripture. On the contrary, John directly says that he who is born of God does not commit sin, does righteousness, loves the brethren, keeps himself, and overcomes the world. 1 John 229 3 9 5-4-18 Basically, where there is no sanctification, there is no regeneration, and where there is no holy life, there is no new birth. This is no doubt a difficult saying to many people, but difficult or not, it is simple Bible truth. It is written plainly that he who is born of God is one of those whose seed remains in him, and he cannot sin because he is born of God. 1 John 3.9 3. Sanctification is the only certain evidence of the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, which is essential to salvation. If anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, that person is not of Him. Romans 8 9. The Spirit never lies dormant and idle within the soul. He always makes His presence known by the fruit He causes to be born in heart, character, and life. The fruit of the Spirit, says Paul, is this charity, joy, peace, tolerance, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance, and such like. Galatians 5.22-23 Where these qualities are to be found, the Spirit is there. Where these qualities are lacking, people are spiritually dead before God. The Holy Spirit is compared to the wind, and like the wind, He cannot be seen by our human eyes. But just as we know there is a wind by the effect it produces on waves and trees and smoke, so we can know that the Holy Spirit is in a person by the effects He produces in the person's conduct. It is foolish to think that we have the Spirit if we do not also walk in the Spirit. Galatians 5.25 We can depend on it as an absolute certainty that where there is no holy living, there is no Holy Spirit. The seal that the Spirit stamps on Christ's people is sanctification. As many as are actually led by the Spirit of God, the same are sons of God. Romans 8.14 4. Sanctification is the only certain sign of God's election. The names and number of the elect are a secret thing, no doubt, which God has wisely kept in His own power and is not revealed to man. It is not given to us in this world to study the pages of the book of life and see if our names are there. But if there is one thing clearly and plainly declared about election, it is that elect men and women can be known and distinguished by holy lives. It is expressly written that they are elect through sanctification, 1 Peter 1.2, chosen unto salvation through sanctification, 2 Thessalonians 2.13, predestined to be conformed to the image of God's Son, Romans 8.29, and chosen in Christ before the foundation of the world, that they should be holy, Ephesians 1.4. Therefore, when Paul saw the working faith and laboring love and patient hope of the Thessalonian believers, he said that he knew their election of God, 1 Thessalonians 1.3-4. He who boasts of being one of God's elect while he is willfully and habitually living in sin is only deceiving himself and talking wicked blasphemy. Of course, it is difficult to know what people really are, and many who make a fair show outwardly in religion might turn out at last to be rotten-hearted hypocrites. But where there is not at least some appearance of sanctification, we may be quite certain that there is no election. The Church Catechism correctly and wisely teaches that the Holy Spirit sanctifies all the elect people of God. 5. Sanctification is something that will always be seen. Like the great head of the Church from whom it springs, it cannot be hid. Matthew 5.14 Every tree is known by its own fruit. Luke 6.44 A truly sanctified person can be so clothed with humility that he can see in himself nothing but infirmity and defects. 
Like Moses, when he came down from the mountain, he might not be aware that his face shines. Exodus 34.29 Like the righteous in the mighty parable of the sheep and the goats, he might not see that he has done anything worthy of his master's notice and commendation. Lord, when did we see thee hungry and feed thee, or thirsty and give thee drink? Matthew 25.37 But whether he sees it himself or not, others will always see in him a tone, taste, character, and habit of life unlike that of other people. The very idea of a person being sanctified while no holiness can be seen in his life is flat nonsense and is a misuse of words. Light may be very dim, but if there is only a spark in a dark room, it will be seen. Life may be very feeble, but if the pulse only beats a little, it will be felt. It is just the same with a sanctified person. But note, there is mention in Scripture of a twofold sanctification and consequently of a twofold holiness. The first is common unto persons and things, consisting in the peculiar dedication consecration or separation of them unto the service of God, by his own appointment, whereby they become holy. Thus the priests and Levites of old, the ark, the altar, the tabernacle, and the temple were sanctified and made holy. And indeed, in all holiness there is a peculiar dedication and separation unto God. But in the sense mentioned, this was solitary and alone. No more belonged unto it but this sacred separation nor was there any other effect of this. Text resumes. His sanctification will be something felt and seen, though he himself may not understand it. A saint in whom nothing can be seen but worldliness or sin is a kind of beast not recognized in the Bible. 6. Sanctification is something for which every believer is responsible. I would not be mistaken in saying this. I hold as strongly as anyone that everyone on earth is accountable to God and that all the lost will be speechless and without excuse at the last day. Everyone has power to lose his own soul, Matthew 16, 26. But while I believe this, I maintain that believers are particularly and especially responsible and have a specific responsibility to live holy lives. They are not as others, dead and blind and unrenewed. They are alive unto God, and have light, and knowledge, and a new principle within them. Whose fault is it except their own if they are not holy? Who can they blame except themselves if they are not sanctified? God, who has given them grace and a new heart and a new nature, has deprived them of all excuse if they do not live for His praise. This is a point that is far too often forgotten. A person who professes to be a true Christian, while sitting still, content with a very low degree of sanctification, if indeed he has any at all, and calmly telling you he can do nothing, is a very pitiful sight, and a very ignorant person. Against this delusion let us watch and be on our guard. The Word of God always addresses its precepts to believers as accountable and responsible beings. If the Savior of sinners gives us renewing grace and calls us by His Spirit, we can be sure that He expects us to use our grace and not to go to sleep. It is forgetfulness of this that causes many believers to grieve the Holy Spirit, Ephesians 4.30, and makes them very useless and uncomfortable Christians. 7. Sanctification is something that occurs by growth and degrees. A person may climb from one step to another in holiness and be far more sanctified at one period of his life than another. He cannot be more pardoned and more justified than he is when he first believes, though he may feel it more. But he can certainly be more sanctified because every grace in his new character can be strengthened, enlarged, and deepened. This is the evident meaning of our Lord's last prayer for his disciples when he used the words, Sanctify them, John 17:17, 17, 17, and of Paul's prayer for the Thessalonians, the very God of peace sanctify you, 1 Thessalonians 5:23. In both cases, the expression plainly implies the possibility of increased sanctification, while such an expression as justify them is never once applied to a believer in Scripture, 
because he cannot be more justified than he is. I can find no basis in Scripture for the doctrine of imputed sanctification. It is a doctrine that seems to me to confuse things that differ and to lead to very evil consequences. Not least, it is a doctrine that is directly contradicted by the experience of all the most eminent Christians. If there is any point on which God's holiest saints agree, it is that they may see more, know more, feel more, do more, repent more, and believe more as they continue in their spiritual lives and in proportion to the closeness of their walk with God. They grow in grace, as Peter exhorts believers to do, 2 Peter 3.18, and they continue to grow according to the words of Paul, 1 Thessalonians 4.1. 8. Sanctification depends greatly on a diligent use of scriptural means. When I speak of means, I am referring to Bible reading, private prayer, regular attendance on public worship, regular hearing of God's Word, and regular reception of the Lord's Supper. I lay it down as a simple matter of fact that no one who is careless about such things must ever expect to make much progress in sanctification. I can find no record of any eminent saint who ever neglected them. They are appointed channels through which the Holy Spirit conveys fresh supplies of grace to the soul and strengthens the work that he has begun in the inward man. Let people call this legal doctrine if they want to, but I will never back away from declaring my belief that there are no spiritual gains without pains. I would as soon expect a farmer to prosper in business who is content with sowing his fields and never looking at them until harvest, as to expect a believer to attain much holiness who is not diligent about his Bible reading, prayer, and the use of his Sundays. Our God is a God who works by means, and He will never bless the soul of that person who pretends to be so superior and spiritual that He can get along without them. 9. Sanctification is not something that keeps a person from having a great deal of inward spiritual conflict. By conflict, I mean a struggle within the heart between the old nature and the new, between the flesh and the spirit, which are to be found together in every believer, Galatians 5.17. A deep sense of that struggle and a vast amount of mental discomfort from it are no proof that a person is not sanctified. Rather, I believe they are healthy symptoms of our condition, and they prove that we are not dead, but alive. A true Christian is one who has not only peace of conscience, but has war within. He may be known by his warfare as well as by his peace. In saying this, I do not forget that I am contradicting the views of some well-meaning Christians who hold the doctrine called sinless perfection. I cannot help that. I believe that what I say is confirmed by the language of Paul in the seventh chapter of Romans. I recommend that all my readers carefully study that chapter. I am quite satisfied that it does not describe the experience of an unconverted person or of a young and unestablished Christian, but that of an old, experienced saint in close communion with God. No one except such a person could say, I delight in the law of God after the inward man. Romans 7.22. I believe, therefore, that what I say is proven by the experience of all the most eminent servants of Christ who have ever lived. The full proof is to be seen in their journals, their autobiographies, and their lives. Believing all this, I will never hesitate to tell people that inward conflict is no proof that a person is not holy, and that they must not think that they are not sanctified because they do not feel entirely free from inward struggle. We will doubtless have such freedom in heaven, but we will never enjoy it in this world. The heart of the best Christian, even at his best, is a field occupied by two rival camps and a multitude of tabernacles. Song of Solomon 6.13 Let the words of the 13th and 15th articles be well considered by all. The infection of nature remains in those who are regenerated And although baptized and born again in Christ, we offend in many things. And if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. 10. 
Sanctification is not something that will justify anyone, and yet it pleases God. This may seem wonderful, and it is true. The holiest actions of the holiest saints who ever lived are all more or less full of defects and imperfections. They are either wrong in their motive or defective in their performance, and in themselves are nothing better than splendid sins, deserving God's wrath and condemnation. To suppose that such actions can stand the severity of God's judgment, atone for sin, and deserve heaven is simply absurd. Scripture By the deeds of the law no flesh shall be justified in his sight. Romans 3.20 We conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. Romans 3.28 The only righteousness in which we can appear before God is the righteousness of another the perfect righteousness of our substitute and representative, Jesus Christ the Lord. His work and not our work is our only title to heaven. This is a truth that we should be ready to die to maintain. For all this, however, the Bible distinctly teaches that the holy actions of a sanctified person, although imperfect, are pleasing in the sight of God. With such sacrifices, God is well pleased. Hebrews 13.16 Obey your parents in all things, for this is well-pleasing unto the Lord. Colossians 3.20 We do those things that are pleasing in His sight. 1 John 3.22 Let this never be forgotten, for it is a very comfortable doctrine. Just as a parent is pleased with the efforts of his little child to please him, even though it is only by picking a daisy or walking across a room, so our Father in heaven is pleased with the poor performances of His believing children. He looks at the motive, principle, and intention of their actions, and not merely at their quantity and quality. He regards them as members of His own dear Son, and for His sake, wherever there is a single purpose of obeying and glorifying Him, He is very pleased. Those who dispute this would do well to study the twelfth article of the Church of England. 11. Sanctification is something that will be absolutely necessary as a witness to our character in the great day of judgment. It will be utterly useless to plead that we believe in Christ unless our faith has had some sanctifying effect and has been seen in our lives. Evidence, evidence, evidence will be the one thing needed when the great white throne is set, when the books are opened, when the graves give up their tenants and when the dead are arraigned before the judgment seat of God. Without some evidence that our faith in Christ Jesus was real and genuine, we will only rise again to be condemned. I can find no evidence that will be admitted in that day except sanctification. The question will not be how we talked and what we professed, but how we lived and what we did. Let no one deceive himself on this point. If anything is certain about the future, it is certain that there will be a judgment. And if anything is certain about judgment, it is certain that our works and actions will be considered and examined in it. John 5.29, 2 Corinthians 5.10, Revelation 20.13 Anyone who thinks that works are of no importance because they cannot justify us is a very ignorant Christian. Unless he opens his eyes, he will find to his harm, that if he goes to the judgment seat of God without some evidence of grace, it would have been better for him to have never been born. 12. Sanctification is absolutely necessary in order to train and prepare us for heaven. Most people hope to go to heaven when they die, but few, it may be feared, take the trouble to consider whether or not they would enjoy heaven if they got there. Heaven is essentially a holy place. Its inhabitants are all holy. Its activities are all holy. To be really happy in heaven, it is clear and plain that we must be somewhat trained and made ready for heaven while we are on earth. The idea of a purgatory after death that will turn sinners into saints is a lying invention of man and is nowhere taught in the Bible. We must be saints before we die if we are to be saints afterward in glory. 
The treasured idea of many that dying people need nothing except a quick confession and forgiveness of sins to make them ready for their great change is a profound delusion. We need the work of the Holy Spirit as well as the work of Christ. We need renewal of the heart as well as the atoning blood. We need to be sanctified as well as to be justified. What could an unsanctified person do in heaven if he did get there? Let that question be fairly considered and fairly answered. No one can possibly be happy in a place where he is not in his element and where all around him is not pleasing to his tastes, habits, and character. When an eagle is happy in an iron cage, when a sheep is happy in the water, when an owl is happy in the blaze of a noonday sun, when a fish is happy on the dry land, then, and not until then, will I admit that an unsanctified person could be happy in heaven. I lay down these twelve statements about sanctification with a firm persuasion that they are true, and I ask all who read these pages to consider them well. Each point could be expanded and handled more fully, and all of them deserve private thought and consideration. Some of them may be disputed and contradicted, but I doubt whether any of them can be overthrown or proven untrue. I only ask for them a fair and impartial hearing. I believe in my conscience that they are likely to assist people in attaining clear views of sanctification. The Visible Marks of Sanctification I now proceed to take up the second point that I propose to consider. That point is the visible evidence of sanctification. What are the visible marks of a sanctified person? What should we expect to see in him? This is a very wide and difficult part of our subject. It is wide because it necessitates the mention of many details that cannot be handled fully in the limits of a book like this. It is difficult because it cannot possibly be presented without giving offense. No matter what, truth ought to be spoken. And this is one truth that especially needs to be spoken in the present day. 1. True sanctification does not consist in merely talking about Christianity and the Bible. This is a point that should never be forgotten. The vast increase of education and preaching in these latter days makes it absolutely necessary to raise a warning voice. People hear so much of preaching and Christian beliefs that they acquire an unholy familiarity with its words and phrases, and sometimes talk so fluently about its doctrines that you might think they are true Christians. In fact, it is sickening and disgusting to hear the indifferent and superficial language that many pour out about conversion, the Savior, the Gospel, finding peace, free grace, and more, while they are notoriously serving sin or living for the world. Can we doubt that such talk is abominable in God's sight and is little better than cursing, swearing, and taking God's name in vain? The tongue is not the only member that Christ instructs us to give to His service. God does not want His people to be mere empty vessels, sounding brass and tinkling cymbals. 1 Corinthians 13.1 We must be sanctified not in word only, but in deed and in truth. 1 John 3.18 Number 2. True sanctification does not consist in temporary religious feelings. This is another point about which a warning is greatly needed. Mission services and revival meetings are attracting great attention in every part of the land and are producing a great sensation. Some churches seem to have taken a new lease on life and exhibit new activity, and we ought to thank God for it, but these things have accompanying dangers as well as advantages. Wherever wheat is sown, the devil is sure to sow tares. Matthew 13, 36-43 Many, it may be feared, appear moved and touched and stirred up under the preaching of the gospel, while their hearts are not really changed at all. A kind of emotional excitement from the contagion of seeing others weeping, rejoicing, or affected is really what has happened. Their wounds are only skin deep and the peace they profess to feel is skin-deep also. Like the stony ground hearers, they receive the word with joy, Matthew 13.20. But after a little while, they fall away, 
and return to the world and their hearts are harder and worse than before. Like Jonah's gourd, they come up suddenly in a night and perish in a night. Jonah 4, 6 and 7 Let these things not be forgotten. Let us beware in this day of healing wounds slightly and crying peace, peace, when there is no peace. Jeremiah 8, 11 Let us urge on everyone who exhibits new interest in true Christianity to be content with nothing short of the deep, solid, sanctifying work of the Holy Spirit. Reaction after false religious excitement is a most deadly disease of soul. When the devil is only temporarily cast out of a person in the heat of a revival and soon returns to his house, the last state becomes worse than the first. Matthew 12.45 It is a thousand times better to begin more slowly and continue in the word steadfastly. John 8.31 Then to begin in a hurry without counting the cost. Luke 14.28 And later look back with Lot's wife and return to the world. Genesis 19.26 I know no condition of the soul that is more dangerous than to imagine we are born again and sanctified by the Holy Spirit because we have picked up a few religious feelings. Number 3. True sanctification does not consist in outward formalism and external devoutness. This is an enormous deception, but sadly it is a very common one. Thousands appear to imagine that true holiness is found in an excessive quantity of external religion, in constant attendance on church services, reception of the Lord's Supper, and observance of fasts and saints' days, in multiplied bowings and turnings and gestures and postures during public worship, in self-imposed austerities and minor self-denials, in wearing distinctive clothing and in the use of religious pictures and crosses. I freely admit that some people take up these things from conscientious motives, and they actually believe that they help their souls. But I am afraid that in many cases this external religiousness is made a substitute for inward holiness, and I am quite certain that it falls utterly short of sanctification of heart. Above all, when I see that many followers of this outward, ornamental, formal style of Christianity are absorbed in worldliness, and plunge headlong into its ceremonies and vanities, I believe that there is need to speak very plainly on the subject. There may be an immense amount of outward service, while there is not a bit of real sanctification. Number 4. Sanctification does not consist in getting away from our responsibilities in life and renouncing our social duties. In every age it has been a snare with many to attempt to get away from their duties in this world in the pursuit of holiness. Hundreds of hermits have buried themselves in some wilderness, and thousands of men and women have shut themselves up within the walls of monasteries and convents, under the futile idea that by so doing they would escape sin and become eminently holy. They have forgotten that no bolts and bars can keep out the devil, and that wherever we go, we carry that root of all evil, our own hearts. Number five, to become a monk or a nun or to join a charitable organization is not the high road to sanctification. True holiness does not make a Christian evade difficulties, but allows him to face and overcome them. Jesus wants his people to show that his grace is not a mere greenhouse plant that can only thrive under shelter but is a strong, hardy thing that can flourish in every circumstance of life. It is doing our duty in that condition to which God has called us, like salt in the midst of corruption and light in the midst of darkness, that is a primary element in sanctification. It is not the person who hides himself in a cave, but the person who glorifies God as an employer or employee, parent or child, in the family and in the street in business and in trade, who is the biblical version of a sanctified person. Our Master Himself said in His last prayer, I do not pray that Thou should take them out of the world, but that Thou should keep them from the evil. John 17, 15 6. Sanctification does not consist in the occasional performance of right actions. It is the habitual working of a new heavenly principle within the heart that runs through all of a person's daily conduct, 
both in great things and in small. Its seat is in the heart, and like the heart and the body, it has a regular influence on every part of the character. It is not like a pump that only sends forth water when worked upon from without, but it is like a perpetual fountain from which a stream is ever flowing spontaneously and naturally. Even Herod, when he heard John the Baptist, did many things while his heart was utterly wrong in the sight of God. Mark 6.20 In the same way, there are many people today who seem to have occasional fits of goodness, as it is called, and do many right things under the influence of sickness, affliction, death in the family, public calamities, or a sudden moment of conscience. Yet the whole time, any intelligent observer can see plainly that they are not converted, and they know nothing of sanctification. A true saint, like Hezekiah, will be wholehearted, 2 Chronicles 31.21. He will count God's commandments concerning all things to be right, and he will hate every false way, Psalm 119, verse 128. Number 7. Genuine sanctification will show itself in habitual respect to God's law and habitual effort to live in obedience to it as the rule of life. There is no greater mistake than to suppose that a Christian has nothing to do with the law and the Ten Commandments because he cannot be justified by keeping them. The same Holy Spirit who convinces the believer of sin by the law and leads him to Christ for justification will always lead him to a spiritual use of the law as a friendly guide in the pursuit of sanctification. Our Lord Jesus Christ never made light of the Ten Commandments. On the contrary, in His first public discourse, the Sermon on the Mount, He explained them and showed the searching nature of their requirements. The Apostle Paul never made light of the law. On the contrary, he says, The law is good if a man uses it legitimately. 1 Timothy 1.8 and I delight with the law of God, with the inward man. Romans 7.22 He who pretends to be a saint, while ignoring the Ten Commandments and thinking nothing of lying, hypocrisy, cheating, ill-temper, slander, taking God's name in vain, drunkenness, and violating the Seventh Commandment, is under a fearful delusion. He will find it hard to prove that he is a saint in the last day. Number 8. Genuine sanctification will show itself in habitually trying to do Christ's will and to live by His practical precepts. These precepts are found scattered everywhere throughout the four Gospels, and especially in the Sermon on the Mount. He who supposes they were spoken without the intention of promoting holiness, and that a Christian does not need to listen to them in his daily life, is really little better than a madman and is, at the very least, a very ignorant person. To hear some people talk, and to read some people's writings, one might think that our blessed Lord, when He was on earth, never taught anything but doctrine, leaving practical duties to be taught by others. The slightest knowledge of the four Gospels ought to tell us that this is a complete mistake. What our Lord's disciples ought to be and do is continually brought forward in our Lord's teaching. A truly sanctified person will never forget this. He serves a master who said, Ye are my friends if ye do whatsoever I command you. John 15, 14. Number 9. Genuine sanctification will show itself in habitually desiring to live up to the standard that the Apostle Paul set before the churches in his writings. That standard is to be found in the closing chapters of nearly all his letters. The common idea of many people that Paul's writings are full of nothing but doctrinal statements and controversial subjects, justification, election, predestination, prophecy, and the like, is an entire delusion, and it is a sad proof of the ignorance of Scripture that prevails in our day. I defy anyone to read Paul's writings carefully without finding in them a large quantity of plain, practical directions about the Christian's duty in every area of life and about our daily habits, temperament, and behavior to one another. These directions were written down by inspiration of God for the perpetual guidance of professing Christians. He who does not adhere to them may possibly become a member of a church, 
but he is certainly not what the Bible calls a sanctified person. Number 10. Genuine sanctification will show itself in habitual attention to the active graces that our Lord so beautifully exemplified, especially the grace of love. Scripture. A new commandment I give unto you, that ye love one another, as I have loved you, that ye also love one another. By this shall everyone know that you are my disciples, if you have love one to another. John 13, 34-35 A sanctified person will try to do good in the world. He will try to lessen the sorrow and increase the happiness of all around him. He will strive to be like his master, full of kindness and love to everyone, not in word only by calling people dear, but by deeds and actions and self-denying work, according as he has opportunity. The selfish person who professes to be a Christian, wrapping himself up in his own conceit of superior knowledge, seeming not to care whether others sink or swim or go to heaven or hell as long as he goes to church and is respected and is called a faithful member. Such a person knows nothing of sanctification. He may think himself a saint on earth, but he will not be a saint in heaven. Christ will never be found to be the Savior of those who know nothing of following His example. Saving faith and real converting grace will always produce some conformity to the image of Jesus. Scripture Being clothed with a new man, who is renewed in knowledge according to the image of the one that created him. Colossians 3.10 Number 11 Genuine sanctification will show itself in habitual attention to the passive graces of Christianity. When I speak of passive graces, I mean those graces that are especially shown in submission to the will of God, being Christ-like within and being patient and kind toward one another. Few people, perhaps, unless they have examined the point, have any idea how much is said about these graces in the New Testament and how important a place they seem to fill. This is the special point that Peter dwells upon in commending our Lord Jesus Christ's example to our notice. Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that ye should follow his steps, who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth, who, when he was cursed, did not return the curse. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but committed himself to him that judges righteously. 1 Peter 2, 21-23 this is the one profession that the Lord's Prayer requires us to make, and the one point that is commented upon at the end of the prayer. Set us free from our debts, as we set free our debtors. Matthew 6.12 This is the point that occupies a third of the list of the fruit of the Spirit. Nine are named, and three of these, long-suffering, gentleness, and meekness, are unquestionably passive graces. Galatians 5.22-23 I must plainly say that I do not think this subject is sufficiently considered by Christians. The passive graces are no doubt harder to attain than the active ones, but they are precisely the graces that have the greatest influence on the world. Of one thing I feel very sure. It is nonsense to pretend to desire sanctification unless we follow after the meekness, gentleness, long-suffering, and forgiveness of which the Bible makes so much. People who are habitually giving way to irritable and grouchy tempers in daily life and are constantly harsh with their tongues and disagreeable to all around them, spiteful people, vindictive people, revengeful people, malicious people, of whom sadly the world is only too full, they do not know much about sanctification. Such are the visible signs of a sanctified person. I do not say that they are all to be seen equally in all God's people. I freely admit that in the best people they are not fully and perfectly exhibited. But I do say confidently that the things of which I have been speaking are the biblical marks of sanctification, and that those who know nothing of them may well doubt whether they have any grace at all. Whatever others may say, I will never back away from saying that genuine sanctification is something that can be seen and that the characteristics I have tried to describe are more or less the characteristics of a sanctified person.
the similarities and differences of sanctification and justification. I now propose to consider the distinction between justification and sanctification. Where do they agree and where do they differ? This is a matter of great importance, though I fear it will not seem so to all my readers. I will discuss it briefly, but I dare not pass over it completely. Too many are inclined to look at nothing but the surface of things in Christianity and regard nice distinctions in theology as simply questions of words and names that are of little real value. But I warn all who are sincere about their souls that the discomfort that arises from not distinguishing things that differ in Christian doctrine is very great indeed, and I especially advise them, if they love peace, to seek clear views about the matter before us. Justification and sanctification are two distinct things we must always remember, yet there are points in which they agree and points in which they differ. Let us try to find out what they are. In what ways are justification and sanctification alike? Number one, both proceed originally from the free grace of God. It is of His gift alone that believers are justified or sanctified at all. Number two, both are part of that great work of salvation that Christ, in the eternal covenant, has undertaken on behalf of His people. Christ is the fountain of life from which pardon and holiness both flow. The root of each is Christ. Number three. Both are to be found in the same people. Those who are justified are always sanctified, and those who are sanctified are always justified. God has joined them together, and they cannot be divided. Number four. Both begin at the same time. The moment a person begins to be a justified person, he also begins to be a sanctified person. He may not feel it, but it is a fact. Number five. Both are alike necessary to salvation. No one ever reached heaven without a renewed heart, as well as forgiveness, without the Spirit's grace, as well as the blood of Christ. And without being made ready for eternal glory as well as being given a right to be there, the one is just as necessary as the other. Those are the points on which justification and sanctification agree. Let us now reverse the picture and see where they differ. Number one, justification is regarding and judging a person to be righteous for the sake of another even Jesus Christ the Lord. Sanctification is actually making a person inwardly righteous, though it may be in a very small degree. Number two, the righteousness we have by our justification is not our own, but is the everlasting perfect righteousness of our great mediator, Christ, imputed to us and made our own by faith. The righteousness we have by sanctification is our own righteousness, imparted, inherent, and worked in us by the Holy Spirit, but mingled with much infirmity and imperfection. Number three, in justification our own works have no place at all, and simple faith in Christ is the one thing needful. In sanctification our own works are of great importance, and God instructs us to fight, watch, Pray, strive, try, and work. Number four. Justification is a finished and complete work, and a person is perfectly justified the moment he believes. Sanctification is an imperfect work, comparatively, and will never be perfected until we reach heaven. Number five. Justification allows no growth or increase. A person is as much justified the hour he first comes to Christ by faith as he will be to all eternity. Sanctification is very much a progressive work, and it allows continual growth and enlargement as long as a man lives. Number six, justification has special reference to our persons, our standing in God's sight, and our deliverance from guilt. Sanctification has special reference to our natures, and the moral renewal of our hearts. Number seven, justification gives us our claim to heaven 
and boldness to enter in. Sanctification makes us suitable for heaven and prepares us to enjoy it when we dwell there. Number 8. Justification is the act of God concerning us, and it is not easily perceived by others. Sanctification is the work of God within us, and it cannot be hidden in its outward manifestation from the eyes of men. I present these distinctions to the attention of all my readers, and I ask you to consider them well. I am convinced that one substantial reason for the darkness and uncomfortable feelings of many well-meaning people in the matter of Christianity is their habit of mixing together and not distinguishing justification and sanctification. It can never be too strongly impressed on our minds that they are two separate things. There is no doubt that they cannot be divided, and everyone who is a partaker of one is a partaker of both. But they should never, never be confounded, and the distinction between them should never be forgotten. It only remains for me now to bring this subject to a conclusion by a few plain words of application. The nature and visible signs of sanctification have been discussed. What practical reflections should this matter raise in our minds? Number one. For one thing, let us all awake to a sense of the perilous condition of many professing Christians. Without holiness, no one will see the Lord. Without sanctification, there is no salvation. Hebrews 12.14 What an enormous amount of so-called Christianity, then, is perfectly useless. What an immense proportion of church attenders are on the broad road that leads to destruction. Matthew 7.13 the thought is dreadful, crushing, and overwhelming. Oh, that preachers and teachers would open their eyes and realize the condition of souls around them. Oh, that people could be persuaded to flee from the wrath to come. Luke 3, 7 If unsanctified souls can be saved and go to heaven, the Bible is not true. Yet the Bible is true and cannot lie. What must the end be? Number two, for another thing, let us be certain of our own condition and never rest until we feel and know that we are sanctified ourselves. What are our tastes, choices, likings, and inclinations? This is the great test question. It matters little what we wish and hope and desire to be before we die. Where are we now? What are we doing? Are we sanctified or not? If not, the fault is all our own. Number three. For another thing, if we desire sanctification, our course is clear and plain. We must begin with Christ. We must go to Him as sinners, with no plea but that of absolute need, and cast our souls on Him by faith for peace and reconciliation with God. We must place ourselves in His hands, as in the hands of a good physician and cry to Him for mercy and grace. We must wait for nothing to bring with us as a recommendation. The very first step toward sanctification, no less than justification, is to come with faith to Christ. We must first live and then work. Number four. For another thing, if we want to grow in holiness and become more sanctified, we must continually go on as we begin always making new petitions to Christ. He is the head from which every member must be supplied. Ephesians 4.16 To live the life of daily faith in the Son of God and to be daily drawing out of His fullness the promised grace and strength that He has laid up for His people. This is the great secret of progressive sanctification. Believers who seem to be at a standstill are generally neglecting close communion with Jesus, and so are grieving the Spirit. He who prayed, Sanctify them the last night before His crucifixion, is infinitely willing to help everyone who by faith appeals to Him for help and desires to be made more holy. Number 5. For another thing, let us not expect too much from our own hearts here below. At our best, we will find in ourselves daily cause for humbling ourselves, discovering that we are needy debtors to mercy and grace every hour. 
the more light we have, the more we will see our own imperfection. We were sinners when we began, and we will find ourselves to be sinners still as we go on. We may be renewed, pardoned, and justified, yet we remain sinners to the very end. Our absolute perfection is yet to come, and the expectation of it is one reason why we should long for heaven. Number 6. Finally, let us never be ashamed of making much of sanctification and contending for a high standard of holiness. While some are satisfied with a miserably low degree of holy living, and while others are not ashamed to live without any holiness at all, content with a mere routine of church attendance, but never getting anywhere, like a horse in a mill, let us stand fast in the old paths, follow after eminent holiness ourselves, and recommend it boldly to others. This is the only way to be really happy. Let us be convinced, no matter what others may say, that holiness is happiness, and that the person who gets through life most comfortably is the one who is sanctified. No doubt there are some true Christians who, because of poor health, family trials, or other secret causes, enjoy little sensible comfort and go mourning all their days on the way to heaven. But these are uncommon cases. As a general rule, in the long run of life it will be found true that sanctified people are the happiest people on earth. They have solid comforts that the world can neither give nor take away. The ways of wisdom are ways of pleasantness. Proverbs 3.17 Those who love thy law have great peace. Psalm 119, 165. It is said by one who cannot lie, For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Matthew 11.30 But it is also written that there is no peace for the wicked. Isaiah 48.22 The subject of sanctification is of such deep importance, and the mistakes made about it so many and great, that I strongly recommend Owen on the Holy Spirit to all who want to study more thoroughly the whole doctrine of sanctification. No single book like mine can embrace it all. Chapter 3. Holiness Holiness, without which no one shall see the Lord. Hebrews 12.14 The text above opens up a subject of deep importance. That subject is practical holiness. It suggests questions that demand the attention of all professing Christians. Are we holy? Will we see the Lord? Those questions can never be out of season. The wise man tells us that there is a time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to keep silence and a time to speak, Ecclesiastes 3, verses 4 and 7. But there is no time, no, not even a day, in which we ought not to be holy. Are we holy? That question concerns all classes and conditions of people. Some are rich and some are poor, some learned and some unlearned some employers and some employees, but there is no class or condition in life in which we should not be holy. Are we? How does your account stand between your soul and God? In this hurrying, bustling world, let us stand still for a few minutes and consider the matter of holiness. I could have chosen a subject more popular and pleasant. I am sure I might have found one easier to handle but I could not have chosen one more seasonable and more profitable to our souls. It is a solemn thing to hear the word of God saying to us that, without holiness, no one will see the Lord. I will try, by God's help, to examine what true holiness is and the reason why it is so needful. Then I will try to point out the only way in which holiness can be attained. I have already approached this subject from a doctrinal side, let me now try to present it in a more plain and practical point of view. True Practical Holiness What type of people are they whom God calls holy? A person may go great lengths and yet never reach true holiness. It is not knowledge, for Balaam had that. 
It is not a bold profession of following Jesus, for Judas Iscariot had that. It is not doing many things, for Herod had that. It is not just having zeal for certain aspects of God's word, for Jehu had that. Holiness is not morality, an outward respectability of conduct, for the young ruler told about in John 3 had that. It is not simply taking pleasure in hearing preachers, for the Jews in Ezekiel's time had that. It is not even in keeping company with godly people, for Joab and Gehazi and Demas had that. Yet none of these people were holy. These things alone are not holiness. A person may have any one of them, and yet never see the Lord. What then is true practical holiness? It is a hard question to answer. I do not mean that there is any lack of scriptural instruction on the subject, but I fear that I might give a defective view of holiness and not say all that should be said or that I might say things about it that should not be said, and so do harm. Let me, however, try to draw a picture of holiness, so that we can see it clearly before the eyes of our minds. Only let it never be forgotten that my account is but a poor, imperfect outline at best. Number 1. Holiness is the habit of being of one mind with God, according as we find His mind described in Scripture. It's the habit of agreeing with God's judgment, hating what he hates, loving what he loves, and measuring everything in this world by the standard of his word. He who most entirely agrees with God is the one who is the most holy. Number two, a holy man or woman will strive to avoid every known sin and to keep every known commandment. He will have a decided inclination of mind toward God and a strong desire to do His will. He will have a greater fear of displeasing God than of displeasing the world, and he will have a love for all of God's ways. He will feel what Paul felt when he said, For I delight with the law of God with the inward man, Romans 7.22, and what David felt when he said, I have esteemed all thy precepts concerning all things to be right, and I have hated every false way. Psalm 119, verse 128. Number three, a holy person will strive to be like our Lord Jesus Christ. He will not only live the life of faith in Him and draw from Him all His daily peace and strength, but He will also labor to have the mind that was in Him, Philippians 2, 5, and to be conformed to His image, Romans 8, 29. It will be his goal to bear with and forgive others, even as Christ forgave us, Colossians 3.13. He will desire to be unselfish, even as Christ pleased not himself, Romans 15.3. He will want to walk in love, even as Christ loved us, Ephesians 5.2. He will aim to be lowly-minded and humble, even as Christ made himself of no reputation and humbled himself. Philippians 2.7. He will remember that Christ was a faithful witness for the truth, Revelation 1.5, that he came not to do his own will, John 6.38, that it was his meat and drink to do his Father's will, John 4.34, that he would continually deny himself in order to minister to others, Matthew 16.24, that he was meek and patient under undeserved insults, Isaiah 53, 7, that he thought more of godly poor men than of kings, Luke 6, 20, that he was full of love and compassion to sinners, Matthew 9, 36, that he was bold and uncompromising in denouncing sin, Matthew 23, 13 through 37, that he did not seek the praise of men when he might have had it, John 5, 41, and that he went about doing good, Acts 10.38, that he was separate from worldly people, John 17.16-19, that he continued instant in prayer, Luke 6.12, and that he would not let even his nearest relations stand in his way when God's work was to be done, Luke 2.48-49. A holy person will try to remember these things. He will try to shape his course in life by them. 
he will lay to heart the saying of John. He that says he abides in him ought himself also to walk, even as he walked. 1 John 2, 6. And the saying of Peter, that Jesus suffered for us, leaving us an example that ye should follow his steps. 1 Peter 2, 21. Happy is he who has learned to make Christ his all, both for salvation and for example. Much time would be saved and much sin prevented if people would more often ask themselves the question, what would Jesus Christ have said and done if he were in my place? Number four, a holy person will follow after meekness, long-suffering, gentleness, patience, a kind attitude and control of his tongue. He will bear much, forbear much, overlook much, and be slow to talk of standing on his rights. We see bright examples of this in the behavior of David when Shimei cursed him, 2 Samuel 16, 10-12, and of Moses when Aaron and Miriam spoke against him, Numbers 12. Number 5. A holy person will follow after moderation and self-denial, he will labor to subdue the desires of his body, to crucify the flesh with his affections and lust, Galatians 5.24, and to restrain his passions and his carnal inclinations, lest at any time they break loose. Oh, what a message that is of the Lord Jesus to the apostles. Take heed to yourselves, lest at any time your hearts be overcharged with excess and drunkenness and cares of this life and so that day may come upon you unawares. Luke 21, 34. And that of the Apostle Paul, I keep my body under and bring it into subjection, lest, preaching to others, I myself should become reprobate. 1 Corinthians 9, 27. Number 6. A holy person will pursue love and brotherly kindness. He will endeavor to observe the golden rule of doing as he would want others to do to him and speaking as he would want others to speak to him. Matthew 7.12 He will be full of affection towards his brethren, toward their bodies, their property, their characters, their feelings, and their souls. He that loves his neighbor, says Paul, has fulfilled the law. Romans 13.8 He will abhor all lying, slandering, backbiting, cheating, dishonesty, and unfair dealing, even in the smallest things. He will strive to adorn his Christian life by all his outward appearance and conduct, and to make it lovely and beautiful in the eyes of all around him. What condemning words are 1 Corinthians 13 and the Sermon on the Mount when laid alongside the conduct of many professing Christians? Number 7. A holy person will desire a spirit of mercy and benevolence toward others. He will not stand idle all day long. He will not be content with doing no harm, but he will try to do good. He will strive to be useful in his day and generation and to lessen the spiritual needs and misery around him as much as he can. This is how Dorcas was, full of good works and alms deeds which he did. Acts 9.36 She did not merely plan and talk about doing good things, but she did good things. This is how Paul was, too. I will very gladly spend and be utterly spent for your souls, he says, though the more abundantly I love you, the less I am loved. 2 Corinthians 12, 15. Number 8. A holy person will follow after purity of heart. He will dread all filthiness and uncleanness of spirit and he will seek to avoid all things that might draw him into it. He knows his own heart is like kindling, and he will diligently keep clear of the sparks of temptation. Who will dare to talk of strength when David can fall? There are many things to be learned from the ceremonial law. Under the law, the person who only touched a bone, a dead body, a grave, or a diseased person became at once unclean in the sight of God. These things were emblems and figures. Few Christians are ever too watchful and too careful about this point. Number 9. A holy person will follow after the fear of God. I do not mean the fear of a slave who only works because he's afraid of punishment, 
and would be lazy if he did not fear being discovered. I mean, rather, the fear of a child who wishes to live and move as if he was always before his father's face, because he loves him. What a noble example Nehemiah gives us of this. When he became governor at Jerusalem, he could have required money from the Jews there and required them to support him. The former governors had done so. No one would have blamed him if he did. But he said, I did not do so because of the fear of God. Nehemiah 5.15 Number 10. A holy person will seek humility. He will desire, in loneliness of mind, to esteem all others better than himself. Philippians 2.3 He will see more evil in his own heart than in any other in the world. He will understand something of Abraham's feeling when he said, He was but dust and ashes. Genesis 18.27 Of Jacob's feeling when he said, I am not worthy of the least of all the mercies. Genesis 32.10 Of Job's feeling when he said, I am vile. Job 44 And of Paul's feeling when he said that he was the chief of sinners. 1 Timothy 1.15 Holy Bradford, that faithful martyr of Christ, would sometimes finish his letters with these words, A most miserable sinner, John Bradford. Footnote. John Bradford, 1510-1555, through 1555, was an English reformer, preacher, and author who was burned at the stake on July 1st, 1555. Text resumes. Good old Mr. Grimshaw's last words when he lay on his deathbed were these. Here goes an unprofitable servant. Footnote. William Grimshaw, 1708 through 1763, was an English evangelical preacher and a friend of the Wesleys. Text resumes. Number 11. A holy person will seek to be faithful in all the duties and relations in life. He will not merely try to do as well as others who take no thought for their souls, but he will try to do even better, because he has higher motives and more help than they. Those words of Paul should never be forgotten. Whatever ye do, do it heartily as to the Lord. Colossians 3.23 And not slothful in earnest care, but fervent in the Spirit, serving the Lord. Romans 12.11 Holy people should aim at doing everything well. They should be ashamed of allowing themselves to do anything poorly if they can help it. Like Daniel, they should seek to give no occasion against themselves except in the law of his God, Daniel 6.5. They should strive to be good husbands and good wives, good parents and good children, good employers and good employees, good neighbors, good friends, good citizens, good in private and good in public, good in the place of business and good at home. Holiness is worth little indeed if it does not bear this kind of fruit. The Lord Jesus put a searching question to his people when he asked, What do ye more than others? Matthew 5.47 Number 12 Last but not least, a holy person will desire to be spiritually minded. He will endeavor to set his affections entirely on things above, Colossians 3.2, and to hold things on earth with a very loose hand. He will not neglect the business of the life that now is, but his mind and thoughts will give priority to the life to come. He will aim to live like one whose treasure is in heaven, and he will want to pass through this world like a stranger and pilgrim traveling to his home. To commune with God in prayer, in the Bible, and in the assembly of his people will be the holy person's main enjoyments. He will value every place and thing and company in proportion to how they draw him nearer to God. He will enter into something of David's feeling when he says, My soul has followed hard after thee, Psalm 63, 8, and my portion, O Lord, will be to keep thy words, Psalm 119, 57. That is the outline of holiness that I want to present. That is the character which those who are called holy follow after. Those are the main features of a holy person. Let me say that I hope no one will misunderstand me. I am not without fear that my meaning will be mistaken or the description I have given of holiness will discourage some tender conscience. 
I would not willingly make one righteous heart sad or throw a stumbling block in any believer's way. I do not say for a moment that holiness shuts out the presence of indwelling sin. No, far from it. It is the greatest misery of a holy man that he carries about with him a body of death, Romans 7.24, that often, when he wants to do good, evil is present with him, Romans 7.21, that the old nature is blocking all his movements and, as it were, trying to prevent every step he takes. It is the excellence of a holy man, though, that he is not at peace with indwelling sin, as others are. He hates it mourns over it, and longs to be free from its company. The work of sanctification within him is like the wall of Jerusalem. The building goes forward even in troublous times, Daniel 9.25. I do not say that holiness comes to maturity and perfection all at once, or that these graces I have touched on must be found in full bloom and vigor before you can call someone holy. No, far from it. Sanctification is always a progressive work. Some people's graces are in the blade, some in the ear, and some are like full corn in the ear. All must have a beginning. We must never despise the day of small beginnings, Zechariah 4.10. Sanctification, at its very best, is an imperfect work. The history of the brightest saints who ever lived will contain many an although, but, and notwithstanding, before you reach the end. The gold will never be without some dross. The light will never shine without some clouds until we reach the heavenly Jerusalem. The sun itself has spots upon its face. The holiest people have many blemishes and defects when weighed in the balance of the sanctuary. Their life is a continual warfare with sin, the world, and the devil. Sometimes you will see them being overcome rather than overcoming. The flesh is always fighting against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. Galatians 5.17 And in many things they offend all. James 3.2 But still, despite all this, I am sure that to have such a character as I have vaguely drawn is the heart's desire and prayer of all true Christians. They press toward it, even if they do not reach it. They may not attain to it, but they always aim at it. It is what they strive and labor to be, even if it is not yet what they are. I boldly and confidently say that true holiness is a great reality. It is something in a person that can be seen, known, described, and felt by all around him. It is light. If it exists, it will show itself. It is salt. If it exists, its savor will be perceived. It is a precious ointment. If it exists, its presence cannot be hid. I am sure we would all be ready to make allowance for much backsliding and for much occasional deadness in professing Christians. I know that a road may lead from one point to another and yet have many winding turns. A person can be truly holy and yet be drawn aside by many weaknesses. Gold is not less gold if it is mingled with alloy, nor is light less light if it is faint and dim, nor is grace less grace because it is young and weak. But, after every allowance, I cannot see how anyone deserves to be called holy who willfully allows himself to sin and is not humbled and ashamed because of sin. I dare not call anyone holy who makes a habit of willfully neglecting known duties or willfully doing what he knows God has commanded him not to do. The Puritan John Owen well said, I do not understand how a man can be a true believer unto whom sin is not the greatest burden, sorrow, and trouble. Such are the leading characteristics of practical holiness. Let us examine ourselves and see whether we are acquainted with it. Let us prove our own selves. Some reasons why practical holiness is so important. Can holiness save us? Can holiness put away sin, cover iniquities, make satisfaction for transgressions, or pay our debt to God? No, not a single bit. God forbid that I should ever say so. 
Holiness can do none of these things. The brightest saints are all unprofitable slaves. Luke 17.10 Our purest works are no better than filthy rags when tried by the light of God's holy law. Isaiah 64, 6. The white robe that Jesus offers and faith puts on must be our only righteousness. The name of Jesus Christ must be our only confidence. And the Lamb's book of life must be our only claim to heaven. With all our holiness, we are no better than sinners. Our best things are stained and tainted with imperfection. They are all more or less incomplete, wrong in motive or defective in performance. Scripture, for by the deeds of the law no flesh shall be justified in his sight. Romans 3.20 For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Ephesians 2.8-9 Why, then, is holiness so important? Why does the Apostle Paul say that without it no man shall see the Lord? Let me give a few reasons. 1. For one thing, we must be holy because the voice of God in Scripture plainly commands it. The Lord Jesus says to his people, Except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, ye shall in no wise enter into the kingdom of the heavens. Matthew 5.20 And be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father who is in the heavens is perfect. Matthew 5.48 Paul tells the Thessalonians, for the will of God is your sanctification. 1 Thessalonians 4.3 Peter says, As he who has called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation. For it is written, Be ye holy, for I am holy. 1 Peter 1, 15 through 16 In this, says Leighton, law and gospel agree. Footnote Archbishop Robert Leighton 1611 through 1684, was an ordained minister in Scotland and a professor at the University of Edinburgh. He tried to reconcile the Presbyterians and Episcopalians in Scotland, but was unsuccessful in this. Text resumes. Number two. We must be holy because this is one main objective and purpose for which Christ came into the world. Paul wrote to the Corinthians, He died for all that those who live should not live from now on unto themselves, but unto him who died and rose again for them. 2 Corinthians 5.15 To the Ephesians, Paul said, Christ also loved the congregation and gave himself for her, that he might sanctify and cleanse her in the washing of water by the word. Ephesians 5.25-26 Paul wrote to Titus that Jesus gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a people of his own, zealous of good works. Titus 2.14 Basically, to speak of people being saved from the guilt of sin without being at the same time saved from its dominion in their hearts is to contradict the witness of all Scripture. Are believers said to be elect? It is through sanctification of the Spirit. 1 Peter 1.2 are they predestined? It is to be conformed to the image of his Son. Romans 8.29 Are they chosen? It is that they should be holy. Ephesians 1.4 Are they called? It is with a holy calling. 2 Timothy 1.9 Are they afflicted? It is that they may be partakers of his holiness. Hebrews 12.10 Jesus is a complete Savior. He does not merely take away the guilt of a believer's sin. He does more. He breaks its power. Number three. We must be holy because this is the only solid evidence that we have a saving faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. The twelfth article of our church rightly says that although good works cannot put away our sins and endure the severity of God's judgment, Yet are they pleasing and acceptable to God in Christ, and do spring out necessarily of a true and lively faith, insomuch that by them a lively faith may be as evidently known as a tree discerned by its fruits. James warns us there is such a thing as a dead faith, 
A faith that goes no further than the profession of the lips and has no influence on a person's character. James 2.17 True saving faith is a very different kind of thing. True faith will always show itself by its fruits. It will sanctify. It will work by love. It will overcome the world. And it will purify the heart. I know that people are fond of talking about deathbed experiences. They will rest on words spoken in the hours of fear, pain, and weakness, as if they might take comfort in them about the friends they lose. But I am afraid that in 99 out of 100 cases, such experiences are not to be depended on. I suspect that with rare exceptions, people die just as they have lived. A holy life is the only safe evidence that we are one with Christ and that Christ is in us. Those who live unto the Lord are generally the only people who die in the Lord. If we want to die the death of the righteous, let us not rest in slothful desires only. Let us seek to live his life. It is a true saying of trails, That man's state is not, and his faith unsound, that find not his hopes of glory purifying to his heart and life. Footnote Robert Trail 1642 through 1716, was a Presbyterian church leader in Scotland. Text resumes. Number four. We must be holy, because this is the only proof that we love the Lord Jesus Christ in sincerity. This is a point on which he has spoken most plainly. In the fourteenth and fifteenth chapters of John, he says, If you love me, keep my commandments. John fourteen fifteen. He that has my commandments and keeps them, he it is that loves me. John 14.21 He who loves me will keep my words. John 14.23 And ye are my friends, if ye do whatsoever I command you. John 15.14 It would be difficult to find plainer words than these, and woe to those who neglect them. Certainly that person must be in an unhealthy state of soul who can think of all that Jesus suffered and yet cling to those sins for which that suffering occurred. It was sin that wove the crown of thorns. It was sin that pierced our Lord's hands, feet, and side. It was sin that brought him to Gethsemane and Calvary, to the cross and to the grave. Our hearts must be cold if we do not hate sin and labor to get rid of it, even though we may have to cut off the right hand and pluck out the right eye in doing it. Matthew 5, 29-30 Number 5. We must be holy because this is the only solid evidence that we are true children of God. Children in this world are generally like their parents. Some, doubtless, are more so, and some less, but it is seldom indeed that you cannot see a kind of family likeness. It is much the same with the children of God. The Lord Jesus says, If you were Abraham's sons, you would do the works of Abraham. If God were your father, you would surely love me. John 8, 39 and 42 If people have no likeness to the Father in heaven, it is pointless to talk of their being his children. If we know nothing of holiness, we can flatter ourselves as much as we please, but we do not have the Holy Spirit dwelling in us. We are dead and must be brought to life again. We are lost and must be found. Scripture for all that are led by the Spirit of God, they and only they are sons of God. Romans 8.14 We must show to which family we belong by our lives. We must let others see by our good lives that we are indeed the children of the Holy One. Or calling ourselves children of God is but an empty name. Do not say, says Gurnall, that you have royal blood in your veins and are born of God unless you can prove your pedigree by daring to be holy. Footnote William Gurnall, 1616-1679, was an English author and Anglican clergyman. Text resumes. Number 6. We must be holy, because this is the most likely way to do good to others. We cannot live only for ourselves in this world. Our lives will always be doing either good or harm to those who see them. They are a silent sermon that everyone can read. 
It is sad indeed when they are a sermon for the devil's cause and not for God's. I believe that far more is done for Christ's kingdom by the holy living of believers than we are aware of. There is a reality about such living that makes people see and compels them to think. It carries a weight and influence with it that nothing else can give. It makes Christianity beautiful and draws people to consider it like a lighthouse seen afar off. The day of judgment will prove that many besides husbands have been won without a word by a holy life. 1 Peter 3, one. You can talk to people about the doctrines of the gospel, but few people will listen, and still fewer will understand. But your life is an argument that none can escape. There is a meaning about holiness that even the most unlearned can take in. They may not understand justification, but they can understand love. I believe there is far more harm done by unholy and inconsistent Christians than we are aware of. Such people are among Satan's best allies. They pull down by their lives what pastors build with their sermons. They cause the chariot wheels of the gospel to drive heavily. They supply the children of this world with a never-ending excuse for remaining as they are. I cannot see the use of trying to be holy said an irreligious businessman not long ago. I noticed that some of my customers are always talking about the gospel, faith, election, the promises of God, and so forth. And yet these same people think nothing of being unfair or cheating me out of money when they have opportunity. If Christians can do such things, I don't see what good there is in Christianity. I am sad to write such things, but I am afraid that Christ's name is too often blasphemed because of the lives of Christians. Let us take heed, lest the blood of souls should be required at our hands. From murder of souls by inconsistency and unholy living, good Lord, deliver us. Oh, for the sake of others, if for no other reason, let us strive to be holy. Number 7. We must be holy, because our present comfort depends much upon it. We cannot be reminded of this too often we are sadly apt to forget that there is a close connection between sin and sorrow, holiness and happiness, sanctification and consolation. God has wisely arranged that our well-being and our well-doing are linked together. He has mercifully provided that even in this world, it is in our interest to be holy. Our justification is not by works. Our calling and election are not according to our works, but it is vain for anyone to suppose that he will have an active sense of his justification or an assurance of his calling as long as he neglects good works or does not strive to live a holy life. Scripture And in this do we know that we have known him if we keep his commandments. 1 John 2, 3 And in this we know that we are of the truth and have our hearts certified before him. 1 John 3.19 A believer may as soon expect to feel the sun's rays on a dark and cloudy day as to feel strong consolation in Christ while he does not follow him fully. When the disciples forsook the Lord and fled, they escaped danger, but they were miserable and sad. When shortly after they confessed him boldly before men, they were cast into prison and beaten, but We are told that they rejoiced, that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. Acts 5.41 Oh, for our own sakes, if there were no other reason, let us strive to be holy. He who follows Jesus most fully will always follow him most comfortably. 8. Lastly, we must be holy because without holiness on earth, we will never be prepared to enjoy heaven. Heaven is a holy place. The Lord of heaven is a holy being. The angels are holy creatures. Holiness is written on everything in heaven. The book of Revelation says specifically, There shall in no wise enter into it anything unclean, or that works abomination, or makes a lie. Revelation 21.27 I appeal solemnly to everyone who reads these pages. How will we ever be at home and happy in heaven if we die unholy? Death does not bring about any change in us. 
The grave makes no alteration. Each person will rise again with the same character in which he breathed his last. Where will our place be if we are strangers to holiness now? Suppose for a moment that you were allowed to enter heaven without holiness. What would you do? What possible enjoyment could you feel there? To which of the saints would you join yourself, and by whose side would you sit down? Their pleasures are not your pleasures. Their tastes are not your tastes, and their character is not your character. How could you possibly be happy there if you had not been holy on earth? Maybe you love the company of the superficial and the careless, the worldly-minded and the covetous, the party-goer and the pleasure-seeker, the ungodly and the profane. There will be no one like this in heaven. Maybe you think the saints of God are too strict and disciplined and serious. You like to avoid them. You do not like to spend time with them, but there will be no other people in heaven. Maybe you think praying, Bible reading, and hymn singing are dull and boring and meaningless work, a thing to be tolerated now and then but not enjoyed. You consider the Lord's day a burden and a weariness. You could not possibly spend more than a small part of it in worshiping God. But remember, heaven is a never-ending Sabbath. The inhabitants of heaven did not cease, day or night, saying, Holy, 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 the Lord God Almighty, and singing the praise of the Lamb, Revelation 4.8. How could an unholy person find pleasure in spending his time like this? Do you think that such a person would delight to meet David, Paul, and John after a life spent in doing the very things they spoke against? Would he speak with them and find that he and they had much in common? Above all, do you think that he would rejoice to meet Jesus, the crucified one, face to face, after holding on to the sins for which he died, after loving his enemies and despising his friends? Would he stand before him with confidence and join in the cry, This is the Lord for whom we have waited. Let us rejoice and be glad in his salvation. Isaiah 25, verse 9, NASB. Do you not think instead, that the tongue of an unholy man would cleave to the roof of his mouth with shame, and his only desire would be to be cast out? He would feel like a stranger in a land he did not know, a black sheep among Christ's holy flock. The voice of cherubim and seraphim, the song of angels and archangels, and all the company of heaven would be a language he could not understand. The very air would seem an air he could not breathe. I do not know what others may think, but to me it seems clear that heaven would be a miserable place to an unholy person. It cannot be otherwise. People may say in a vague way that they hope to go to heaven, but they do not consider what they say. There must be a certain preparation for the inheritance of the saints in light. Colossians 1.12 Our hearts must be somewhat in tune. To reach the holiday of glory, we must pass through the training school of grace. We must be heavenly-minded and have heavenly tastes in this life, or we will never find ourselves in heaven in the life to come. Before I go any further, let me say a few words by way of application. For one thing, let me ask everyone who may read these pages, Are you holy? Please listen to the question I ask you now. Do you know anything of the holiness of which I have been speaking? I do not ask whether you attend church regularly, or whether you have been baptized and received the Lord's Supper, or whether you call yourself a Christian. I ask something more than this. Are you holy, or are you not? I do not ask whether you approve of holiness in others, whether you like to read the lives of holy people, and talk of holy things, and have religious books on your bookshelves or whether you want to be holy and hope you will be holy someday, I ask something more than this. Are you yourself holy this very day, or are you not? Why do I ask so directly and so strongly? I do it because the Bible says that without holiness, no one will see the Lord. It is written. It is not my imagination. It is the Bible. It is not my personal opinion. It is the Word of God 
not of man, that without holiness no one shall see the Lord. Hebrews 12.14 What searching, examining words these are. What thoughts come across my mind as I write them down? I look at the world and see the greater part of it lying in wickedness. I look at professing Christians and see the vast majority having nothing of Christianity but the name. I turn to the Bible and I hear the Spirit saying, Without holiness, no one will see the Lord. Certainly it is a text that ought to make us consider our ways and search our hearts. Certainly it should raise within us solemn thoughts and cause us to pray You might try to brush me aside by saying that I feel and think about these things much more than most people do. I answer, this is not the point. The poor lost souls in hell do as much as this. The great question is not what you think or feel, but what you do. You might say that God never intended for all Christians to be holy, and that holiness is only for great saints and people of extraordinary gifts. I answer, I cannot see that in the Bible. I read that everyone who has hope in Christ purifies himself, 1 John 3, 3, and that without holiness no one will see the Lord, 1 John 3, 3, Hebrews 12, 14. You might say that it is impossible to be so holy and to handle our responsibilities in this life at the same time that it cannot be done. I answer, you are mistaken. It can be done. With Christ on your side, nothing is impossible. It has been done by many. David, Obadiah, Daniel, and the servants of Caesar's household are all examples that go to prove it. Scripture. All the saints greet you, chiefly those that are of the Caesar's household. Philippians 4.22 You might say that if you were so holy, you would be unlike other people. I answer, you are right. You ought to be different from other people. Christ's true servants always were, unlike the world around them, a separate nation, a peculiar people, and you must be too if you would be saved. You might say that at this rate, very few will be saved. I answer, I know it. It is precisely what we are told in the Sermon on the Mount. The Lord Jesus said so 2,000 years ago. Scripture Narrow is the gate and confined is the way which leads unto life, and there are few that find it. Matthew 7.14 Few will be saved, because few will take the trouble to seek salvation. Most people will not deny themselves the pleasures of sin and their own way for a little season. They turn their backs on the incorruptible inheritance that cannot be defiled and that does not fade away. 1 Peter 1.4 You will not come to me says Jesus, that ye might have life. John 5.40 You might say that what I am saying is difficult to follow, that the way is very narrow. I answer, I know it. Jesus said the same in the Sermon on the Mount. The Lord Jesus said so 2,000 years ago. He always said that we must take up the cross daily and that we must be ready to cut off hand or foot if we would be his disciples. It is the same with Christianity as it is in other things, that there are no gains without pains. That which costs nothing is worth nothing. No matter what we might want to say, we must be holy if we want to see the Lord. Where is our Christianity if we are not? We must not merely have a Christian name and Christian knowledge, but we must have a Christian character also. We must be saints on earth before we can be saints in heaven. God has said it, and he will not take it back, that without holiness no one shall see the Lord. Hebrews 12.14 The Pope's calendar, says Jenkin, only makes saints of the dead, but Scripture requires sanctity in the living. Footnote William Jenkin, 1613-1685, through was an English clergyman who was imprisoned for participating in a plot to restore Charles II as the King of England. Toward the end of his life, he was again imprisoned for being a nonconformist. Text resumes. Let not men deceive themselves, says John Owen. Sanctification is a qualification indispensably necessary unto those who will be under the conduct of the Lord Christ unto salvation. He leads none to heaven but whom he sanctifies on the earth. 
This living head will not admit of dead members. Surely we do not need to wonder that Scripture says he must be born again, John 3, 7. Surely it is as clear as noonday that many professing Christians need a complete change, new hearts, new natures, if they are ever to be saved. Scripture. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, they are a new creation. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are made new. 2 Corinthians 5.17 No matter who you are, without holiness, no one will see the Lord. Let me now speak a little to believers. I ask you this question. Do you think you feel the importance of holiness as much as you should? I admit that I fear the spirit of the times about this subject. I very much doubt whether it holds the place that it deserves in the thoughts and attention of some of the Lord's people. I would humbly suggest that we are apt to overlook the doctrine of growth and grace. We do not sufficiently consider how very far a person may go in professing to be a Christian and yet have no grace, being dead in God's sight despite his claim to be a Christian. I believe that Judas Iscariot seemed very much like the other apostles. When the Lord warned them that one would betray him, no one asked, Is it Judas? We'd better spend more time thinking about the churches of Sardis and Laodicea than we do. I have no desire to make an idol of holiness. I do not wish to dethrone Christ and put holiness in his place. But I must sincerely say that I wish sanctification was more thought of in this day than it seems to be. I therefore want to take the opportunity to press the subject on all believers into whose hands these pages may fall. I fear it is sometimes forgotten that God has joined justification and sanctification together. Beyond question, they are distinct and different things, but one is never found without the other. All justified people are sanctified, and all sanctified people are justified. Scripture Therefore, what God has joined together, let not man separate. Mark 10.9 Do not tell me about your justification unless you also have some evidence of your sanctification. Do not boast of Christ's work for you unless you can show us the Spirit's work in you. Do not think that Christ and the Spirit can ever be divided. I do not doubt that many believers know these things, but I think it is good for us to be reminded of them. Let us prove that we know them by our lives. Let us try to keep this verse in mind more often Follow peace with everyone, and holiness, without which no one shall see the Lord. Hebrews 12.14 I must openly say that I wish Christians were not so excessively sensitive about the subject of holiness as many seem to be. The topic is so cautiously touched that one might really think it was a dangerous subject to handle. Yet certainly, when we have exalted Christ as the way, the truth, and the life, John 14.6, We cannot go wrong in speaking strongly about what the character of his people should be. Samuel Rutherford well says, The way that cries down duties and sanctification is not the way of grace. Believing and doing are blood friends. I say it with all reverence, but I must say it. I sometimes fear that if Jesus were on earth now, many people would think his preaching to be legalistic. If Paul were writing his letters now, there are some who would think that he should not write the latter part of most of them as he did. But let us remember that the Lord Jesus did speak the Sermon on the Mount, and the epistle to the Ephesians does contain six chapters, and not four. I am sad that I feel I must speak in this way, but I have reason to do so. That great minister and theologian, John Owen, the dean of Christ's church, used to say, more than 300 years ago, that there were people whose whole religion seemed to consist in going about complaining of their own corruptions and telling everyone that they could do nothing of themselves. I'm afraid that after three centuries, the same thing might be said with truth of some of Christ's professing people today. I know there are texts in Scripture that warrant such complaints. I do not object to them when they come from men who walk in the steps of the Apostle Paul and fight a good fight, as he did, against sin, the devil, and the world. But I never like such complaints when I see reasons to suspect, as I often do, 
that they are only a cloak to cover spiritual laziness and an excuse for spiritual sloth. If we say with Paul, O wretched man that I am, Romans 7.24, let us also be able to say with him, I press toward the mark, Philippians 3.14. Let us not quote his example in one thing while we do not follow him in another. I do not consider myself to be better than other people, and some might ask, Who do you think you are that you write in this way? I answer, I am a very poor creature indeed. I say, though, that I cannot read the Bible without desiring to see many believers more spiritual, more holy, more single-eyed, more heavenly-minded, and more wholehearted than they are in this current generation. I want to see among believers more of a pilgrim spirit, a more distinct separation from the world, a lifestyle more evidently in heaven, and a closer walk with God. And that is why I have written as I have. Is it not true that we need a higher standard of personal holiness in our day? Where is our patience? Where is our zeal? Where is our love? Where are our works? Where is the power of Christianity to be seen as it was in previous days? Where is that unmistakable tone that used to distinguish the saints of old and shake the world? Truly, our silver has become dross. Our wine is mixed with water, and our salt has very little savor. We are all more than half asleep. The night is past, and the day is come, Romans 13.12. Let us awake and sleep no more, Ephesians 5.14, 1 Thessalonians 5.6. Let us open our eyes more widely than we have done so far. Scripture, leaving behind all the weight of the sin which surrounds us, Hebrews 12.1. Let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. 2 Corinthians 7.1. Did Christ die, John Owen said, and shall sin live? Was he crucified in the world, and shall our affections to the world be fast and lively? Oh, where is the spirit of him who by the cross of Christ was crucified to the world, and the world to him. Scripture, But in no wise should I glory except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified unto me, and I unto the world. Galatians 6.14 A word of advice to all who desire to be holy. Do you want to be holy? Do you desire to become a new person? Then you must begin with Christ. You will do nothing at all and make no progress until you feel your sin and weakness and flee to Him. He is the root and beginning of all holiness, and the way to be holy is to go to Him by faith and be joined to Him. Christ is not just wisdom and righteousness to His people, but He is sanctification also. Scripture Of Him ye are reborn in Christ Jesus, who of God is made unto us wisdom, and righteousness, and sanctification, and redemption. 1 Corinthians one thirty. People sometimes try to make themselves holy first, and they do not do too well. They toil and labor, turn over new leaves, and make many changes. Yet, like the woman with the issue of blood before she came to Christ, they were nothing bettered, but rather grew worse. Mark 5.26 They run in vain, and labor in vain, and we do not need to wonder why, for they are beginning at the wrong end. They are building up a wall of sand. Their work falls down as fast as they put it up. They are bailing water out of a leaky vessel. The leak gains on them rather than they gain on the leak. No other foundation of holiness can be laid than that which Paul laid, even Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians 3.11 Without Christ, we can do nothing. John 15, 5. It is a strong but true saying of Robert Trail. Wisdom out of Christ is damning folly. Righteousness out of Christ is guilt and condemnation. Sanctification out of Christ is filth and sin. Redemption out of Christ is bondage and slavery. Do you want to be holy? Do you have a strong desire for holiness? Do you want to partake of the divine nature? Then go to Christ. 
Wait for nothing. Wait for nobody. Do not linger. Do not try to make yourself ready. Go and say to him, in the words of that beautiful hymn, Nothing in my hand I bring. Simply to thy cross I cling. Naked, flee to thee for dress. Helpless, look to thee for grace. Footnote From Rock of Ages by Augustus M. Toplady, 1740-1778 through Text resumes There is not a brick nor stone laid in the work of our sanctification until we go to Christ. Holiness is his special gift to his believing people. Holiness is the work he carries on in their hearts by the Spirit whom he puts within them. He is appointed as Prince and Savior to give repentance as well as forgiveness of sins. Acts 5.31 As many as received him, to them gave he power to become sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. John 1.12 Holiness is not inherited. Parents cannot give it to their children, nor is it of the will of the flesh. Man cannot produce it in himself. Nor yet is it of the will of man. Pastors cannot give it to you by baptism. Holiness comes from Christ. It is the result of vital union with Him. It is the fruit of being a living branch of the true vine. Go then to Christ and say, Lord, not only save me from the guilt of sin, but send the Spirit, whom you promised, and save me from the power of sin. Make me holy. Teach me to do your will. Do you desire to continue in holiness? Then abide in Christ. He himself says, Abide in me, and I in you. He that abides in me, and I in him, the same brings forth much fruit. John 15, 4-5 It pleased the Father that in him all fullness should dwell a full supply for all a believer's needs. He is the physician to whom you must go daily if you want to keep well. He is the manna that you must eat daily and the rock of which you must drink daily. His arm is the arm on which you must lean daily as you come up out of the wilderness of this world. You must not only be rooted in him, but you must also be built up in him. Paul was a man of God indeed. He was a holy man a growing, thriving Christian, and what was the secret of it all? He was the one to whom Christ was all and in all. Colossians 3.11 He was ever having his eyes fixed on Jesus. Hebrews 12.2 I can do all things, he says, through Christ who strengthens me. Philippians 4.13 I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Galatians 2.20 Let us go and do likewise. May all who read these pages know these things by experience, and not by hearsay only. May we all feel the importance of holiness far more than we have so far. May our years be holy years with our souls, and then they will be happy ones. If we live, may we live unto the Lord. If we die, may we die unto the Lord. Romans 14, 8 If he comes for us, may we be found in peace, without spot and blameless. Chapter 4 The Fight Fight the good fight of faith. 1 Timothy 6, 12 It is an interesting fact that fighting is a topic about which most people have a deep interest. Young men and women, old men and little children, high and low, rich and poor, learned and unlearned, all seem to have a deep interest in learning about wars, battles, and fighting. This is a simple fact, no matter how we may try to explain it. We would call that Englishman a boring person who did not care about the story of Waterloo, Inkerman, Balaclava, or Lucknow. We would think an American was cold and dull who was not moved by the struggles at Bunker Hill, Lexington and Concord, Yorktown, Trenton, or Gettysburg. There is another warfare, though, of far greater importance than any war that was ever waged by man. 
It is a warfare that concerns not just two or three nations, but every Christian man and woman born into the world. The warfare I speak of is spiritual warfare. It is the fight that everyone who would be saved must fight about his soul. I am aware that this warfare is something about which many know nothing. Talk to them about it and they are ready to regard you as a madman, an enthusiast, or a fool. Yet it is as real and true as any war the world has ever seen. It has its hand-to-hand conflicts and its wounds. It has its times of weariness and of fighting through the night. It has its sieges and assaults. It has its victories and its defeats. Above all, it has consequences that are serious, monumental, and most remarkable. In earthly warfare, the consequences to nations are often temporary and repairable. In spiritual warfare, it is very different. Of that warfare, the consequences, when the fight is over, are unchangeable and eternal. It is in regard to this warfare that Paul spoke to Timothy when he wrote those burning words, Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life. 1 Timothy 6.12 It is about this warfare that I will write. I hold the subject to be closely connected with that of sanctification and holiness. He who desires to understand the nature of true holiness must know that the Christian is a man of war. If we want to be holy, we must fight. True Christianity is a fight. True Christianity. Let us keep in mind that word true. There is a whole lot of that which is called Christianity today that is not true, genuine Christianity. It is adequate to most people. It satisfies sleepy consciences. But it is not the true thing. It is not the real thing that was called Christianity 2,000 years ago. There are hundreds of thousands of men and women who go to church every Sunday and call themselves Christians. Their names are in the baptismal register. They are considered to be Christians while they live. They are married with a Christian marriage service. They intend to be buried as Christians when they die. But you never see any fight about their religion. Of spiritual strife, Exertion, conflict, self-denial, keeping watch and battle, they know literally nothing at all. Such Christianity may satisfy people, and those who say anything against it may be considered to be very harsh and uncharitable. But it certainly is not the Christianity of the Bible. It is not the religion that the Lord Jesus founded and his disciples preached. It is not the religion that produces real holiness. True Christianity is a fight. The true Christian is called to be a soldier and must behave as such from the day of his conversion to the day of his death. He is not meant to live a life of religious ease, inactivity, and comfort. He must never imagine for a moment that he can sleep and rest along the way to heaven like one traveling in luxury. If he takes his standard of Christianity from the children of this world, he may be content with such foolish ideas but he will find no support for them in the word of God. If the Bible is the rule of his faith and practice, he will find his course laid down very plainly in this matter. He must fight. With whom is the Christian soldier meant to fight? Not with other Christians. Sad indeed is that person's idea of religion who thinks that it consists in perpetual controversy. He who is never satisfied unless he is engaged in some strife between church and church, sect and sect, faction and faction, denomination and denomination, knows nothing yet as he ought to know. No doubt it may be absolutely needful sometimes to engage in controversy or dispute, but as a general rule the cause of sin is never helped as much as when Christians waste their strength in quarreling with one another and spend their time in meaningless arguments. No, indeed. The main fight of the Christian is with the world, the flesh, and the devil. These are his never-dying foes. These are the three main enemies against whom he must wage war. Unless he gets the victory over these three, all other victories are useless and vain. If he had a nature like an angel and were not a fallen creature, the warfare would not be so essential. But with a corrupt heart, 
a busy devil and an ensnaring world. He must either fight or be lost. He must fight the flesh. Even after conversion, he carries within him a nature inclined to evil and a heart as weak and unstable as water. That heart will never be free from imperfection in this world, and it is a miserable delusion to expect it to be so. To keep that heart from going astray, the Lord Jesus tells us to watch and pray. He says that the spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Matthew 26, 41. There is need of a daily struggle and daily wrestling in prayer. I keep my body under, Paul says, and bring it into subjection. 1 Corinthians 9.27 I see another law in my members which rebels against the law of my mind, bringing captive unto the law of sin which is in my members. O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? Romans 7.23-24 But those that are of the Christ have crucified the flesh with its affections and lusts. Galatians 5.24 Mortify, therefore, your members which are upon the earth. Colossians 3, 5 He must fight the world. The cunning influence of that mighty enemy must be resisted daily, and without a daily battle it can never be overcome. The love of the world's good things, the fear of the world's laughter or condemnation, the secret desire to remain in the world, the secret desire to do as others in the world do, and not wanting to be extreme and following God are all spiritual foes that assail the Christian continually on his way to heaven, and they must be conquered. Scripture Ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God? Whosoever therefore that desires to be a friend of the world makes himself the enemy of God. James 4.4 4. If anyone loves the world, the charity of the Father is not in him. 1 John 2.15 The world is crucified unto me, and I unto the world. Galatians 6.14 Whatsoever is born of God overcomes the world. 1 John 5.4 Be not conformed to this age. Romans 12.2 He must fight the devil. That old enemy of mankind is not dead. Ever since the fall of Adam and Eve, he has been going to and fro in the earth, and from walking up and down in it, Job 1.7, striving to reach one main goal, the ruin of man's soul. Never slumbering and never sleeping, he is always going about as a lion seeking whom he may devour, 1 Peter 5.8. An unseen enemy, he is always near us, close by our path, near by our bed, and spying out all our ways, a murderer and a liar from the beginning, John 8, 44. He labors night and day to cast us down to hell, sometimes by deceiving us, sometimes by suggesting unbelief or unfaithfulness to God, sometimes by one kind of tactic and sometimes by another. He is always carrying on a campaign against our souls. Scripture Satan has desired to have you that he may sift you as wheat. Luke 22, 31. This mighty adversary must be resisted daily if we want to be saved. But this lineage of demons does not go out, Matthew 17, 21, except by watching, praying, fighting, and putting on the whole armor of God. Ephesians 6, 11. The strong man armed will never be kept out of our hearts without a daily battle. Some people might think these statements are too strong. You think that I am going too far and saying too much about this. You are secretly saying to yourself that men and women in this land can certainly get to heaven without all this trouble and warfare and fighting. Listen to me for a few minutes and I will show you that I have something to say on God's behalf. Remember the proverb of the wisest general who ever lived in England? In time of war, it is the worst mistake to underrate your enemy and try to make a little war. This Christian warfare is no light matter. Give me your attention and consider what I say. What does the Bible say? Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life. 
1 Timothy 6.12. Work hard as a good soldier of Jesus Christ, 2 Timothy 2.3. Put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to stand firm against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the lords of this age, rulers of this darkness, against spiritual wickedness in the heavens. Therefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day, and stand fast. Ephesians 6, 11-13 Strive to enter in at the narrow gate. Luke 13, 24 Labor not for the food which perishes, but for the food which abides unto eternal life. John 6, 27 Think not that I have come to introduce peace into the land. I came not to introduce peace, but a sword. Matthew 10.34 He that has no sword, let him sell his garment and buy one. Luke 22.36 Watch ye, stand fast in the faith. Be brave, be strong. 1 Corinthians 16.13 War a good warfare. Holding fast faith and a good conscience. 1 Timothy 1, 18-19 Words such as these appear to me to be clear, plain, and unmistakable. They all teach one and the same great lesson, if we are willing to receive it. That lesson is that true Christianity is a struggle, a fight, and a warfare. He who pretends to condemn fighting and teaches that we ought to sit still and passively yield ourselves to God appears to me to misunderstand his Bible and to make a great mistake. What does the baptismal service of the Church of England say? No doubt that service is uninspired, and like every uninspired composition, has its defects. But to the millions of people all over the globe who profess and call themselves English churchmen, its voice ought to speak with some weight. And what does it say? It tells us that over every new member who is admitted into the Church of England, the following words are used. I baptize thee in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. I sign this child with the sign of the cross, in token that hereafter he shall not be ashamed to confess the faith of Christ crucified, and manfully to fight under his banner against sin, the world, and the devil, and to continue Christ's faithful soldier and servant unto his life's end. Footnote this, of course, was the wording at the time J. C. Ryle wrote this book, but has since changed. Text resumes. Of course, we all know that in many, many cases, baptism is a mere ceremony, and that parents sometimes bring their children to be baptized without faith or prayer or thought, and consequently receive no blessing. The person who thinks that baptism in such cases acts mechanically like a medicine and that godly and ungodly, praying and prayerless parents, all alike, get the same benefit for their children, must be in a strange state of mind. But one thing is very certain. Every baptized churchman is by his profession a soldier of Jesus Christ, and is pledged to fight under his banner against sin, the world, and the devil. He who doubts it had better take up his book of common prayer and read, mark, and learn its contents. The worst thing about many very zealous churchmen is their total ignorance of what their own prayer book contains. Whether we are churchmen or not, one thing is certain. This Christian warfare is a great reality and a subject of vast importance. It is not a matter like church government and ceremony about which people might differ and yet still reach heaven. Necessity is laid upon us. We must fight. There are no promises in the Lord Jesus Christ's epistles to the seven churches except to those who overcome. Where there is grace, there will be conflict. The believer is a soldier. There is no holiness without warfare. Saved souls will always be found to have fought a fight. It is a fight of absolute necessity. Let us not think that we can remain neutral in this war and sit still. Such a line of action may be possible in the strife of nations, but it is utterly impossible in this conflict that concerns the soul. 
the boasted policy of non-interference that pleases so many politicians, a plan of keeping quiet and letting things alone, will never suffice in Christian warfare. In Christian warfare, no one can avoid serving under the argument that he is a man of peace. To be at peace with the world, the flesh, and the devil is to be at enmity with God, and in the broad way that leads to destruction. We have no choice or option. We must either fight or be lost. It is a fight of universal necessity. No rank, class, or age can plead exemption or escape the battle. Ministers and people, preachers and hearers, old and young, high and low, rich and poor, gentle and simple, kings and subjects, landlords and tenants, learned and unlearned, all alike must carry arms and go to war. All have by nature a heart full of pride, unbelief, sloth, worldliness, and sin. All are living in a world filled with snares, traps, and pitfalls for the soul. All have near them a busy, restless, malicious devil. Everyone, from the queen in her palace to the poor in the workhouse, must fight if they would be saved. It is a fight of perpetual necessity. It allows no time to rest and catch your breath, no armistice, no truce. On weekdays as well as on Sundays, in private as well as in public, at home by the family fireside as well as abroad, in little things like management of tongue and temper, as well as in great things like the government of kingdoms, the Christian's warfare must unceasingly go on. The enemy we fight keeps no holidays, never slumbers, and never sleeps. As long as we have breath in our bodies, we must keep our armor on and remember that we are on an enemy's ground. Even on the brink of Jordan, said a dying saint, I find Satan nibbling at my heels. We must fight until we die. Let us consider well these propositions. Let us take care that our own personal religion is real, genuine, and true. The saddest symptom about many so-called Christians is the utter absence of anything like conflict and fight in their Christianity. They eat, drink, dress, work, amuse themselves, get money, spend money, and sit through a little formal religious service once or twice every week. But the great spiritual warfare, its watchings and strugglings, its agonies and anxieties, its battles and contests. Of all this, they seem to know nothing at all. Let us be careful that this is not the case with us. The worst state of soul is when an armed strong man keeps his palace and his goods are in peace. Luke 11.21 When he leads men and women captive at his will. 2 Timothy 2.26 And they make no resistance. The worst chains are those that are neither felt nor seen by the prisoner. We can take comfort about our souls if we daily experience anything of an inward fight and conflict. It is the invariable companion of genuine Christian holiness. It is not everything, I know, but it is something. Do we find in our heart of hearts a spiritual struggle? Do we feel anything of the flesh lusting against the spirit? and the spirit against the flesh, so that we cannot do the things we want to. Galatians 5.17 Are we conscious of two sets of standards within us, contending for control? Do we feel anything of war in our inward man? Well, let us thank God for it. It is a good sign. It is strongly probable evidence of the great work of sanctification. All true saints are soldiers. Anything is better than apathy, stagnation, deadness, and indifference. We are in a better condition than many. Most so-called Christians have no feeling at all. We are evidently no friends of Satan. Like the kings of this world, he wars not against his own subjects. The very fact that he assaults us should fill our minds with hope. I say again, let us take comfort. The child of God has two great characteristics about him. He can be known by his inward warfare, and he can be known by his inward peace. True Christianity is the fight of faith.
In this respect, the Christian warfare is utterly unlike the conflicts of this world. It does not depend on the strong arm, the sharp eye, or the swift foot. It is not waged with carnal weapons, but with spiritual. Faith is the hinge upon which victory turns. Success depends entirely on believing. A general faith in the truth of God's written word is the primary foundation of the Christian soldier's character. He is what he is, does what he does, thinks as he thinks, acts as he acts, hopes as he hopes, and behaves as he behaves, for one simple reason. He believes certain statements that are revealed and laid down in Holy Scripture. Scripture. He that comes to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of those that diligently seek him. Hebrews 11.6 a type of Christianity without doctrine or dogma is a thing that many people like to talk about today. It sounds very fine at first. It looks very pretty at a distance. But the moment we sit down to examine and consider it, we will find it a simple impossibility. We might as well talk of a body without bones and sinews. No one will ever be anything or do anything in Christianity unless he believes something. Even those who profess to hold the miserable and uncomfortable views of the deists are forced to confess that they believe something. Despite all their bitter sneers against dogmatic theology and Christian blind faith, they themselves have a kind of faith. As for true Christians, faith is the very backbone of their spiritual existence. No one ever fights earnestly against the world, the flesh, and the devil unless he has engraved on his heart certain main principles that he believes. He might hardly know what they are, and may certainly not be able to define or write them down. But they are there. And consciously or unconsciously, they form the roots of his Christianity. Wherever you see someone, whether rich or poor, learned or unlearned, wrestling bravely with sin and trying to overcome it, you can be sure there are certain great principles that person believes. The poet who wrote the famous lines, For modes of faith let graceless zealots fight, his can't be wrong whose life is in the right, was a clever man, but a poor theologian. Footnote. The poet was Alexander Pope, 1688 through 1744, and the quote is from his poem called An Essay on Man. Text resumes. There is no such thing as right living without faith and believing. A special faith in our Lord Jesus Christ's person, work, and office is the life, heart, and mainspring of the Christian soldier's character. He sees by faith an unseen Savior who loved him, gave himself for him, paid his debts for him, bore his sins, carried his transgressions, rose again for him, and appears in heaven for him as his advocate at the right hand of God. He sees Jesus and clings to him. Seeing this Savior and trusting in him, he feels peace and hope, and he willingly battles against the foes of his soul. He sees his own many sins. He sees his weak heart, a tempting world, and a busy devil and if he looked only at them, he might rightly despair. But he also sees a mighty Savior, an interceding Savior, a sympathizing Savior. His blood, his righteousness, his everlasting priesthood, and he believes that all this is his own. He sees Jesus, and he casts his whole weight on him. Seeing him, he cheerfully fights on with full confidence that he and others like him will prove to be more than conquerors through him that loved us. Romans 8.37 Habitual, active faith in Christ's presence and readiness to help is the secret of the Christian soldier fighting successfully. It must never be forgotten that faith can come in degrees. All people do not believe alike, and even the same person has his ebbs and flows of faith and believes more fully at one time than another. According to the degree of his faith, the Christian fights well or poorly. 
wins victories or suffers occasional defeats, comes off triumphant or loses a battle. He who has the most faith will always be the happiest and most comfortable soldier. Nothing makes the anxieties of warfare sit so lightly on a man as the assurance of Christ's love and continual protection. Nothing enables him to bear the fatigue of watching, struggling, and wrestling against sin like the indwelling confidence that Christ is on his side and success is sure. It is the shield of faith that quenches all the fiery darts of the wicked one. It is the person who can say, I know whom I have believed, who can say in time of suffering, I am not ashamed. 2 Timothy 1.12 he who wrote those glowing words, We faint not, Galatians 6 9, and our tribulation, which is momentary and light, prepares an exceeding and eternal weight of glory, was the man who wrote with the same pen, We look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. 2 Corinthians 4 17 through 18. The Apostle Paul, who said, I live by the faith of the Son of God, Galatians 2.20, said in the same epistle, The world is crucified unto me, and I unto the world, Galatians 6.14. The man who said, To me to live is Christ, Philippians 1.21, said in the same epistle, I have learned, in whatever state I am, to be content, Philippians 4.11. And I can do all things through Christ, Philippians 4.13. The more faith, the more victory. The more faith, the more inward peace. I think it is impossible to overrate the value and importance of faith. Well may the Apostle Peter call it precious faith, 2 Peter 1.1. 1, 1. Time would fail me if I tried to recount even a hundredth part of the victories that Christian soldiers have obtained by faith. Let us take our Bibles and attentively read the eleventh chapter of Hebrews. Let us notice the long list of worthy people whose names are recorded there, from Abel down to Moses, even before Christ was born of Mary and brought life and immortality into full light by the gospel. Let us notice well what battles they won against the world, the flesh, and the devil. Then let us remember that believing did it all. These men looked forward to the promised Messiah. They saw him who is invisible. By faith the elders obtained a good report. Hebrews 11.2 Let us turn to the pages of early church history. Let us see how the early Christians firmly held to their Christian beliefs even unto death and were not shaken by the fiercest persecutions of heathen emperors. For centuries, men like Polycarp and Ignatius were not lacking who were ready to die rather than deny Christ. Fines, prisons, torture, fire and sword were unable to crush the spirit of the noble army of martyrs. The whole power of imperial Rome, the mistress of the world, proved unable to stamp out the religion that began with a few fishermen and tax collectors in Israel. Let us remember that believing in an unseen Jesus was the church's strength. They won their victory by faith. Let us examine the story of the Protestant Reformation. Let us study the lives of its leading champions, men such as Wycliffe, Huss, Luther, Ridley, Latimer, and Hooper. Let us see how these gallant soldiers of Christ stood firm against a host of adversaries and were ready to die for their principles. What battles they fought, what controversies they maintained, what contradiction they endured, what tenacity of purpose they exhibited against a world in arms. Let us remember that believing in an unseen Jesus was the secret of their strength they overcame by faith. Let us consider the men who have had the greatest influence in church history in the last couple hundred years. Let us observe how men like Wesley, Whitfield, Venn, and Romaine stood alone in their day and generation and revived English religion in the face of opposition from men high in office 
and in the face of slander, ridicule, and persecution from nine-tenths of professing Christians in the land. Let us observe how men like William Wilberforce, Henry Havelock, Headley Vickers have witnessed for Christ in the most difficult positions and displayed a banner for Christ even as they served in the military or in politics. Let us observe how these noble witnesses never flinched to the end, winning the respect even of their worst adversaries. Let us remember that believing in an unseen Christ was the key to their character. By faith, they lived, walked, stood, and overcame. Footnote. These paragraphs show the importance of reading and learning about men and women of the past who served God faithfully and fully, that we might be motivated and encouraged to follow Jesus fully and to be surrendered to Him and used by Him. Text resumes. Do any of you want to live the life of a Christian soldier? Then pray for faith. It is the gift of God, and it is a gift for which those who will ask will never ask in vain. You must believe before you do. If people do nothing in Christianity, it is because they do not believe. Faith is the first step toward heaven. Do any of you want to fight the fight of a Christian soldier successfully and prosperously? Then pray for a continual increase of faith. Abide in Christ. Get closer to Christ. Tighten your hold on Christ every day that you live. Let your daily prayer be that of the disciples. Lord, increase our faith. Luke 17, 5. Watch jealously over your faith, if you have any. It is the stronghold of the Christian character on which the safety of the whole fortress depends. It is the point that Satan loves to attack. All lies at his mercy if faith is overthrown. If we love life, we must especially stand on our guard. True Christianity is a good fight. Good is a strange word to apply to any warfare. All worldly war is more or less evil. No doubt it is an absolute necessity in many cases to procure the liberty of nations and to prevent the weak from being trampled down by the strong. But still, it is an evil. It involves an awful amount of bloodshed and suffering. It hurries large numbers of people into eternity who are completely unprepared for their change. It calls forth the worst passions of men. It causes enormous waste and destruction of property. It fills peaceful homes with mourning widows and orphans. It spreads poverty, taxation, and national distress far and wide. It disarranges the entire order of society. It interrupts the work of the gospel and the growth of Christian missions. In short, war is an immense and incalculable evil, and every praying person should cry night and day, Give us peace in our time. Yet, there is one warfare that is emphatically good, and there is one fight in which there is no evil. That warfare is the Christian warfare. That fight is the fight of the soul. What are the reasons why the Christian fight is a good fight? What are the points in which this warfare is superior to the warfare of this world? Let me examine this matter and discuss it in order. I do not want to pass by the subject and leave it unnoticed. I do not want anyone to begin the life of a Christian soldier without counting the cost. I want all people to know that if they want to be holy and see the Lord, they must fight, and that the Christian fight though spiritual, is real and severe. We need courage, boldness, and perseverance to fight this war, but I want my readers to know that there is abundant encouragement, if they will only begin the battle. The Bible does not call the Christian fight a good fight without reason and cause. Let me try to show what I mean. The Christian's fight is good because it is fought under the best of generals. The leader and commander of all believers is our divine Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, a Savior of perfect wisdom, infinite love, and almighty power. The captain of our salvation never fails to lead his soldiers to victory. He never makes any useless movements, never errs in judgment, and never commits any mistake. 
His eye is on all his followers, from the greatest of them even to the least. The humblest servant in his army is not forgotten. The weakest and most frail is cared for, remembered, and kept unto salvation. The souls whom he has purchased and redeemed with his own blood are far too precious to be wasted and thrown away. Surely this is good. The Christian's fight is good because it is fought with the best of helps. Even though each believer is weak on his own, the Holy Spirit dwells in him, and his body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. 1 Corinthians 6.19 Chosen by God the Father, washed in the blood of the Son, and renewed by the Spirit, he does not go to war at his own command, and he is never alone. God the Holy Spirit daily teaches, leads, guides, and directs him. God the Father guards him by his almighty power. God the Son intercedes for him every moment, like Moses on the mount, while he is fighting in the valley below. A threefold cord like this can never be broken. His daily provisions and supplies never fail. His provisions are never defective. His food and water are certain. As weak as he seems in himself, like a worm, he is strong in the Lord to do great exploits. Surely this is good. The Christian fight is a good fight because it is fought with the best of promises. To every believer belongs exceeding great and precious promises. All yea and amen in Christ. 2 Corinthians 1.20 Promises sure to be fulfilled because they are made by one who cannot lie and has the power as well as the will to keep his word. Scripture Sin shall have no dominion over you. Romans 6.14 Let the God of peace bruise Satan under your feet quickly. Romans 16.20 He who has begun a good work in you will perfect it until the day of Jesus Christ. Philippians 1.6 When thou dost pass through the waters, I will be with thee and through the rivers they shall not overflow thee. Isaiah 43, 2 My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish. Neither shall anyone pluck them out of my hand. John 10, 27-28 He that comes to me I will in no wise cast out. John 6, 37 I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. Hebrews 13, 5 Therefore, I am certain that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any creature shall be able to separate us from the charity of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Romans 8, 38-39 Words like these are worth their weight in gold. Who does not know that promises of coming aid have cheered the defenders of besieged cities, like Lucknow, and raised them above their natural strength? Have we never heard that the promise of help before night had much to contribute to the mighty victory of Waterloo? Yet all such promises are as nothing compared to the rich treasure of believers, the eternal promises of God. Surely this is good. The Christian fight is a good fight because it is fought with the best of issues and results. No doubt it is a war in which there are tremendous struggles, agonizing conflicts, wounds, bruises, watchings, fastings, and fatigue. But still, all believers, without exception, are more than conquerors through him that loved him. Romans 8.37 No soldiers of Christ are ever lost missing or left dead on the battlefield. No mourning will ever be needed, and no tears will ever need to be shed for either private or officer in the army of Christ. The list of active soldiers when the last evening comes will be found precisely the same as it was in the morning. The English guards marched out of London to the Crimean campaign a magnificent body of men, but many of those brave men laid their bones in a foreign grave and never saw London again. Far different will be the arrival of the Christian army in the city which has foundations, whose builder and maker is God. Hebrews 11.10 Not one will be found lacking. The words of our great captain will be found true. 
of those whom thou gavest me, I have lost none. John 18, 9. Surely this is good. The Christian's fight is good because it does good to the soul of him who fights it. All other wars have a bad, lowering, and demoralizing tendency that bring out the worst passions of the human mind. They harden the conscience and sap the foundations of religion and morality. The Christian warfare alone tends to bring out the best things that are left in man. It promotes humility and charity. It lessens selfishness and worldliness, and it convinces people to set their affections on things above. The old, the sick, and the dying are never known to repent of fighting Christ's battles against sin, the world, and the devil. Their only regret is that they did not begin to serve Christ much earlier. The experience of that eminent saint, Philip Henry, does not stand alone. In his last days, he said to his family, I take you all to record that a life spent in the service of Christ is the happiest life that a man can spend upon earth. Surely this is good. Footnote. Philip Henry, 1631 through 1696, was an English nonconformist clergyman. His diaries and letters was published after his death. Matthew Henry, clergyman and author of the famous Bible commentaries, was Philip's son. Text resumes. The Christian's fight is a good fight because it does good to the world. All other wars have a devastating, ravaging, and injurious effect. The march of an army through a land is a terrible scourge to the inhabitants. Wherever it goes, it impoverishes, wastes, and does harm. Injury to people, property, feelings, and morals invariably accompanies it. Far different are the effects produced by Christian soldiers. Wherever they live, they are a blessing. They raise the standard of religion and morality. They invariably check the advance of drunkenness, Sabbath-breaking, immorality, and dishonesty. Even their enemies are bound to respect them. No matter where you go, you will rarely find that barracks and garrisons do good to the neighborhood. But no matter where you go, you will find that the presence of a few true Christians is a blessing. Surely this is good. The Christian's fight is good because it ends in a glorious reward for all who fight it. Who can tell the wages that Christ will pay to all his faithful people? Who can estimate the good things that our divine captain has laid up for those who confess him before men? A grateful country can give medals to her successful warriors. It can give medals of honor, victoria crosses, pensions, and other honors and titles. But it can give nothing that will last and endure forever. Nothing that can be carried beyond the grave. Palaces like Blenheim and Stratfield Sy can only be enjoyed for a few years. The bravest generals and soldiers must kneel one day before the king of terrors. Better, far better, is the position of him who fights under Christ's banner against sin, the world, and the devil. He may not receive much praise of man while he lives, and he may go down to the grave without much honor, but he will have that which is far better for it is far more enduring. He will have the incorruptible crown of glory. 1 Peter 5, 4 Surely this is good. Let us settle it in our minds that the Christian fight is a good fight, really good, truly good, emphatically good. We see only part of it as yet. We see the struggle, but not the end. We see the campaign, but not the reward. We see the cross but not the crown. We see a few humble, broken-spirited, penitent, praying people enduring hardships and despised by the world, but we do not see the hand of God over them, the face of God smiling on them and the kingdom of glory prepared for them. These things are yet to be revealed. Let us not judge by appearances. There are more good things about the Christian warfare than we see. Now let me conclude this topic with a few words of practical application. We live at a time when the world seems to think of little else but battles and fighting. The iron is entering the soul of more than one nation. 
and the light-heartedness that was once found in many lands is completely gone. Surely, in times like these, a minister may justly call on people to remember their spiritual warfare. Let me say a few parting words about the great fight of the soul. You may be struggling hard for the rewards of this world. Perhaps you are straining every nerve to obtain money, position, power, or pleasure. If that is your case, be cautious. Your sowing will lead to a crop of bitter disappointment. Unless you begin to take care, your end will be to lie down in sorrow. Thousands have traveled the path you are pursuing, and they have awoken too late, only to find that the path ends in misery and eternal ruin. They have fought hard for wealth, honor, power, and promotion, and have turned their backs on God, Christ, heaven, and the world to come. What has their end been? Often, far too often, they have found out that their whole life has been a grand mistake. They have tasted by bitter experience the feelings of the dying statesman who cried aloud in his last hours, The battle is fought. The battle is fought, but the victory is not won. For the sake of your own happiness, resolve this day to join the Lord's side. Shake off your past carelessness and unbelief. Come out from the ways of a thoughtless, unreasoning world. Take up the cross and become a good soldier of Christ. Fight the good fight of faith, that you may be happy as well as safe. Think what the children of this world will often do for liberty without any Christian motivation. Remember how the Greeks, Romans, Swiss, and Tyrolese have endured the loss of all things and even life itself rather than bend their necks to a foreign yoke. Let their example provoke you to emulation. If people can do so much for a corruptible crown, how much more should you do for a crown that is incorruptible? Awake to a sense of the misery of being a slave. For life, happiness, and liberty, arise and fight. Fear not to begin and enlist in Christ's army. The great captain of your salvation rejects no one who comes to him. Like David in the cave of Adullam, he is ready to receive all who are ready to join with him, however unworthy they may feel themselves to be. None who repent and believe are too bad to be enrolled in Christ's army. All who come to him by faith are admitted, clothed, armed, trained, and at last led on to complete victory. Fear not to begin this very day. There is still room for you. Fear not to go on fighting once you enlist. The more thorough and wholehearted you are as a soldier, the more comfortable you will find your warfare. There is no doubt that you will often meet with trouble, fatigue, and difficult fighting before your warfare is accomplished. But let none of these things move you. Greater is he who is for you than all they who are against you. Everlasting liberty or everlasting captivity are the alternatives before you. Choose liberty and fight to the end. You might know something of the Christian warfare and are already a tried and proven soldier. If that is your case, accept a parting word of advice and encouragement from a fellow soldier. Let me speak to myself as well as to you. Let us stir up our minds by way of remembrance. There are some things that we cannot remember too well. Let us remember that if we want to fight successfully, we must put on the whole armor of God and never lay it aside until we die. Not a single piece of the armor can be dispensed with. The belt of truth, the breastplate of righteousness, the shield of faith, the sword of the Spirit, and the helmet of hope are all needed. Ephesians 6, 10-18 we cannot dispense with any part of this armor for even a single day. Well says an old veteran in Christ's army who died a few hundred years ago, In heaven we shall appear, not in armor, but in robes of glory. But here our arms are to be worn night and day. We must walk, work, sleep in them, or else we are not true soldiers of Christ. Footnote This is from the Christian in Complete Armor by William Gurnall.
1616 through 1679. Let us remember the solemn words of an inspired warrior who went to his rest 2,000 years ago. No man that wars entangles himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who has chosen him to be a soldier. 2 Timothy 2.4 May we never forget that saying. Let us remember that some have seemed to be good soldiers for a little while, and have talked loudly of what they would do, yet they turned back disgracefully in the day of battle. Let us never forget Balaam, Judas, Demas, and Lot's wife. Whatever we are and however weak we are, let us be real, genuine, true, and sincere. Let us remember that the eye of our loving Savior is upon us, morning, noon, and night. He will never allow us to be tempted more than we are able to bear. 1 Corinthians 10.13 He can be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, for he was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Hebrews 4.15 He knows what battles and conflicts are, for he himself was assaulted by the prince of this world. Having such a high priest, Jesus the Son of God, let us hold fast this profession. Hebrews 4.14 Let us remember that thousands of soldiers before us have fought the same battle that we are fighting and have come off more than conquerors through him who loved them. Romans 8.37 They overcame by the blood of the Lamb. Revelation 12.11 And so also may we. Christ's arm is quite as strong as ever and his heart is just as loving as ever. He who saved men and women before us never changes. He is able to save to the uttermost all who come unto God by him. Hebrews 7.25 Then let us cast doubts and fears away. Let us follow them who by faith and patience inherit the promises and are waiting for us to join them. Hebrews 6.12 Finally, let us remember that the time is short and the coming of the Lord draws near. James 5.8 A few more battles and the last trumpet will sound, and the Prince of Peace will come to reign on a renewed earth. A few more struggles and conflicts, and then we will utter an eternal goodbye to warfare, sin, sorrow, and death. Let us then fight on to the last and never surrender. The captain of our salvation says, He that overcomes shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. Revelation 21.7 Let me conclude this section with the words of John Bunyan from one of the most beautiful parts of Pilgrim's Progress. He's describing the end of one of his best and holiest pilgrims. After this, it was widely announced that Valiant for Truth received a summons by the hand of the same messenger. He also received a token that the summons was true, that his pitcher was broken at the fountain. Scripture, before the silver chain is broken, and the golden bowl is broken, and the pitcher is broken at the fountain, and the wheel is broken at the cistern. Ecclesiastes 12.6 When Valiant for Truth understood the message was true, he called for his friends. He let them know he had received the summons. I am going to my father's. Even though I arrived here with great difficulty, I don't regret any of the trouble I had to live through to get here. I give my sword to the one who follows me in my pilgrimage, and my courage and skill to the one who can get it. My marks and scars I carry with me as a witness that I have fought his battles, and now he will be my rewarder. When the day came for him to cross the river, many accompanied him to the river bank. He stepped into the water and said, O death, where is thy sting? 1 Corinthians 15.55 And as he went deeper, he said, O Hades, where is thy victory? 1 Corinthians 15.55 So he passed over the river to the sound of trumpets welcoming him to the other side. Footnote Pilgrim's Progress, Updated Edition, Aniko Press, 2014 Text resumes May our end be like this. May we never forget that without fighting there can be no holiness while we live and no crown of glory when we die.
Chapter 5 The Cost Which of you, intending to build a tower, does not sit down first and count the cost? Luke 14.28 The text above is one of great importance. Few are the people who are not compelled to ask themselves, what does it cost? In buying property, building houses, furnishing rooms, forming plans, changing dwellings, or educating children, it is wise and prudent to look forward and consider the cost. Many people would save themselves much sorrow and trouble if they would only remember the question, what does it cost? But there is one subject on which it is especially important to count the cost. That subject is the salvation of our souls. What does it cost to be a true Christian? What does it cost to be a truly holy person? This, after all, is the great question. For lack of thought about this, thousands of people, after seeming to begin well, turn away from the road to heaven and are lost forever in hell. Let me try to say a few words that might throw light on the subject. First, I will show what it costs to be a true Christian. Secondly, I will explain why it is so important to count the cost. Lastly, I will give some hints that will help people to properly count the cost. We are living in strange times. Events are hurrying on remarkably quickly. We never know what a day may bring forth. Proverbs 27.1 How much less do we know what may happen in a year? We live in a day when many people profess to be Christians. Professing Christians in every part of the land are expressing a desire for more holiness and a higher degree of spiritual life. Yet it is very common to see these people receiving the word with joy, and then after two or three years, falling away and going back to their sins. They had not considered what it costs to be a really consistent believer and a holy Christian. Surely these are times when we should sit down and count the cost, and consider the condition of our souls. We must pay attention to how we are. If we desire to truly be holy, it is a good sign. We may thank God for putting the desire into our hearts, but still, the cost should be counted. No doubt, Christ's way to eternal life is a way of pleasantness, but it is foolish to shut our eyes to the fact that His way is narrow, and the cross comes before the crown. I will show what it costs to be a true Christian. Let there be no mistake about my meaning. I am not examining what it costs to save a person's soul. I know well that it costs nothing less than the blood of the Son of God to provide an atonement and to redeem us from hell. The price paid for our redemption was nothing less than the death of Jesus Christ on Calvary. We are bought with a price, 1 Corinthians 6.20. Christ gave himself in ransom for all, 1 Timothy 2.6. This, though, is not the topic of my discussion. The point I want to consider is another one entirely. I want to consider what a person must be ready to give up if he wants to be saved. It is the amount of sacrifice a person must submit to if he intends to serve Christ. It is in this sense that I raise the question, what does it cost? I firmly believe that this is a most important question. I freely admit that it costs little to be a mere outward Christian. A person only has to attend a church on Sunday and to be fairly moral during the week, and he has gone as far as thousands around him ever go in religion. All this is cheap and easy work. It involves no self-denial or self-sacrifice. If this is saving Christianity, and this is what will take us to heaven when we die, we must change the description of the way of life and write, Wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leads to heaven. According to the standard of the Bible, it does cost something to be a real Christian. There are enemies to be overcome, battles to be fought, sacrifices to be made, Egypt to be forsaken, a wilderness to be passed through, a cross to be carried, and a race to be run. Conversion is not putting a man in an armchair and taking him easily to heaven. It is the beginning of a mighty conflict in which it costs much to win the victory. Therefore arises the unspeakable importance of counting the cost.
Let me try to show precisely and specifically what it costs to be a true Christian. Let us suppose that someone is motivated to serve Christ and feels drawn and inclined to follow Him. Let us suppose that some affliction or some sudden death or an awakening sermon has stirred his conscience and made him feel the value of his soul so that he desires to be a true Christian. No doubt there is everything to encourage him. His sins may be freely forgiven, however many and great. His heart may be completely changed, however cold and hard. Christ and the Holy Spirit, mercy and grace are all ready for him, but still he should count the cost. Let us see specifically, one by one, the things that his Christian religion will cost him. It will cost him his self-righteousness. He must cast away all pride and prideful thoughts and any conceit of his own goodness. He must be content to go to heaven as a poor sinner saved only by free grace, owing all to the merit and righteousness of another. He must really feel the words of the prayer book that he has erred and gone astray like a lost sheep, that he has left undone the things he ought to have done, and done the things he ought not to have done, and that there is no health in him. He must be willing to give up all trust in his own morality, respectability, praying, Bible reading, church going, and sacraments, and he must trust in nothing but Jesus Christ. This sounds difficult to some. I do not wonder why. Sir, said a godly farmer to the well-known James Harvey, it is harder to deny proud self than sinful self, but it is absolutely necessary. Footnote. James Harvey, 1714 through 1758, was an English clergyman, an author, and was a member of the famous Holy Club of Oxford that included John and Charles Wesley and George Whitfield. Text resumes. Let us remember this first and foremost. It will cost us our self-righteousness to be a true Christian. It will cost him his sins. He must be willing to give up every habit and practice that is wrong in God's sight. He must set his face against it, quarrel with it, break off from it, fight with it, crucify it, and labor to keep it under subjection, no matter what the world around him may say or think. He must do this honestly and fairly. There must be no separate truce with any special sin that he loves. He must consider all sins to be his deadly enemies, and he must hate every false way. Whether little or great, whether open or secret, all his sins must be thoroughly renounced. They may struggle hard with him every day, and may sometimes almost get the mastery over him, but he must never give in to them. He must keep up a perpetual war with his sins. It is written, Cast away from you all your iniquities. Ezekiel 18.31 Redeem thy sins and thine iniquities. Daniel 4.27 And cease to do evil. Isaiah 1.16 This also seems difficult. Our sins are often as dear to us as our children. We love them, hug them, cleave to them, and delight in them. To part with him is as hard as cutting off a right hand or plucking out a right eye. But it must be done. The parting must come. If wickedness was sweet in the sinner's mouth, if he hid it under his tongue, if it seemed good unto him and he did not forsake it, yet it must be given up if he wants to be saved. Job 20, 12-13 He and sin must quarrel if he and God are to be friends. Christ is willing to receive any sinners, but he will not receive them if they will cling to their sins. To be a Christian will cost us our sins. It will cost him his love of ease. He must take pains and trouble if he intends to run a successful race toward heaven. He must daily watch and be on his guard, like a soldier on the enemy's ground. He must take heed to his behavior every hour of the day, in every company and in every place in public as well as in private, among strangers as well as at home. He must be careful with his time, his tongue, his temper, his thoughts, his imagination, his motives, and his conduct in every relation of life. He must be diligent about his prayers, his Bible reading, 
and his use of Sundays, with all their means of grace. In attending to these things he may come far short of perfection, but he cannot safely neglect any of them. Scripture The soul of the sluggard desires and attains nothing, but the soul of the diligent shall be made fat. Proverbs 13.4 This also sounds difficult. There is nothing we naturally dislike as much as trouble in living our religion. We hate trouble. We secretly wish we could have a vicarious Christianity and could be good by having someone else be good for us, having everything done for us. Anything that requires exertion and labor is entirely against the grain of our hearts, but the soul can have no gains without pains. To be a Christian will cost us our love of ease. It will cost him the favor of the world. He must be content to be thought poorly of by others if he pleases God. He must not think it is a strange thing to be mocked, ridiculed, slandered, persecuted, and even hated. He must not be surprised to find his beliefs and Christian lifestyle despised and held up to scorn. He must accept that many people will consider him to be foolish, fanatical, and overzealous. He must understand that his words will be twisted and his actions misrepresented. In fact, he must not be surprised if some call him crazy. The master says, Remember the word that I said unto you, The slave is not greater than his lord? If they have persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they have kept my word, they will keep yours also. John 15.20 I must say that this also sounds difficult. We naturally dislike unjust dealing and false accusations, and we find it very difficult to be accused without cause. We would not be flesh and blood if we did not want to have the good opinion of our neighbors. It is always unpleasant to be spoken against, forsaken, lied about, and left standing alone. But there is no help for it. The cup that our master drank must be drunk by his disciples. They must be despised and rejected among men. Isaiah 53.3 To be a Christian will cost us the favor of the world. This is the account of what it costs to be a true Christian. I admit that the list is a heavy one, but what item could be removed? Bold indeed must that person be who would dare to say that we may keep our self-righteousness, our sins, our laziness, and our love of the world, and yet be saved. I admit that it costs much to be a true Christian, but who in his right mind can doubt that it is worth any cost to have one soul saved? When the ship is in danger of sinking, the crew thinks nothing of casting overboard the precious cargo. When an arm or leg is affected by gangrene, one will submit to any severe operation, even to amputation, to save one's life. Surely a Christian should be willing to give up anything that stands between him and heaven. A Christianity that costs nothing is worth nothing. A cheap Christianity without a cross will prove in the end to be a useless Christianity without a crown. I will now explain why counting the cost is of such great importance to a person's soul. I could easily settle this question by laying down the principle that no duty established by Jesus Christ can ever be neglected without damage. I could show how many closed their eyes throughout life to the nature of saving Christianity and refuse to consider what it really costs to be a Christian. I could describe how at last, when life is flowing away, they wake up and make a few erratic efforts to turn to God. I could tell you how they find, to their amazement, that repentance and conversion are not such easy matters as they had supposed, and that it costs a great deal to be a true Christian. They discover that habits of pride, sinful indulgence, love of ease, and worldliness are not as easily laid aside as they had thought. And so, after a small struggle, they give up in despair and leave the world without hope, without grace, and unfit to meet God. They had flattered themselves all their days that Christianity would be easy work when once they took it up seriously. But they opened their eyes too late and discover for the first time that they are ruined because they never counted the cost. There is one group of people to whom I especially want to address myself regarding this topic. It is a large group, 
a growing group, a group that in these days is in specific danger. Let me try to describe this group in a few plain words. This deserves our utmost attention. The group I speak of are not thoughtless about Christianity. They think much about it. They are not ignorant of Christianity. They know the basic beliefs pretty well. Their great defect, though, is that they are not rooted and grounded in their faith. They have too often picked up their knowledge secondhand, from being in religious families or from being trained in religious ways. But they have never worked it out by their own inward experience. Too often they have quickly taken up a profession of Christianity under the pressure of circumstances, from emotional feelings, from physical excitement, or from a general desire to do like others around them, but without any solid work of grace in their hearts. People like this are in a place of great danger. They are precisely those, according to Bible examples, who need to be exhorted to count the cost. Due to neglecting to count the cost, Large numbers of the children of Israel perished miserably in the wilderness between Egypt and Canaan. They left Egypt full of zeal and fervor, as if nothing could stop them. But when they found dangers and difficulties in the way, their courage soon cooled down. They had never imagined that there would be trouble. They had thought they would be safely in the promised land in a few days. So when enemies... Difficulties, hunger, and thirst began to make their presence known. The Israelites murmured against Moses and God, and would gladly have gone back to Egypt. They had not counted the cost, and so they lost everything and died in their sins. Because they neglected to count the cost, many of our Lord Jesus Christ's hearers went back after a time and walked no more with him. John six sixty six. When they first saw his miracles and heard his preaching, they thought that the kingdom of God would immediately appear. They cast in their lot with his apostles and followed him without thinking of the consequences. But when they found that there were difficult doctrines to be believed, hard work to be done, and harsh treatment to be endured, their faith gave way entirely and proved to be nothing at all. They had not counted the cost and so made shipwreck of their profession of following Jesus. For failing to count the cost, King Herod returned to his old sins and destroyed his soul. He liked to hear John the Baptist preach. He observed and honored him as a just and holy man. He even did many things that were right and good, Mark 6.20. But when he found that he must give up his darling Herodias, his religion entirely broke down. He had not considered this. He had not counted the cost. For lack of counting the cost, Demas left the company of Paul, rejected the gospel, turned his back on Christ, and renounced heaven. For a long time he had journeyed with the great apostle to the Gentiles and was actually a fellow laborer, Philemon 124. But when he realized that he could not have the friendship of this world as well as the friendship of God, he gave up his Christianity and clung to the world. Demas has forsaken me, Paul said, having loved this present world, 2 Timothy 4.10. He had not counted the cost. Because they do not count the cost, the hearers of powerful evangelical preachers often come to miserable ends. They are stirred and excited into professing what they have not really experienced. They receive the word with a joy so extravagant that it almost startles mature Christians. They continue for a time with such zeal and fervor that they seem likely to outgain all others. They talk and work for spiritual purposes with such enthusiasm that they make older believers feel ashamed. But when the novelty and freshness of their feelings is gone, a change comes over them. They prove to have been nothing more than stony ground hearers. The description the great master gives in the parable of the sower is exactly demonstrated. Temptation or persecution arises because of the word, and they are offended. Matthew 13, 21 Little by little their zeal melts away, and their love becomes cold. In time their seats are empty in the assembly of God's people, and they are heard of no more among Christians. Why? They had never counted the cost. Because they never counted the cost, 
Hundreds of professed converts under religious revivals go back to the world after a time and bring disgrace on Christianity. They begin with a sadly mistaken notion of what true Christianity is. They imagine that it consists in nothing more than a so-called coming to Christ and having strong inward feelings of joy and peace. So when they find out after a while that there is a cross to be carried, that our hearts are deceitful and that there is a busy devil always near us, they cool down in disgust and return to their old sins. Why? Because they never really knew what Bible Christianity is. They had never learned that they had to count the cost. For failure to count the cost, the children of religious parents often do not turn out well, and they bring disgrace on Christianity. Familiar from their earliest years with the form and theory of the gospel, taught even from infancy to repeat the most common Bible verses, being used to being instructed in the gospel every week or even to instruct others in Sunday school, they often grow up professing Christianity without knowing why or without ever having thought seriously about it. Then, when the realities of grown-up life begin to press upon them, they often astound everyone by dropping all their Christian ways and plunging right into the world. Why? Because they had never thoroughly understood the sacrifices that Christianity involves. They had never been taught to count the cost. These are serious and painful truths, but they are truths. They all help to show the immense importance of the subject I am now considering and they help us realize the absolute necessity of pressing this subject on all who profess a desire for holiness. They urge us to cry aloud in all the churches, Count the cost! I will boldly say that it would be good if the duty of counting the cost were more frequently taught than it is. Impatient hurry is the order of the day with many professing Christians. Instantaneous conversions and immediate peace are the only results they seem to care for from the gospel. Compared with these, all other things are tossed aside. To produce them is the main goal and purpose, apparently, of all their labors. I say without hesitation that such a weak, one-sided mode of teaching Christianity is troublesome in the extreme. Let no one mistake my meaning. I thoroughly approve of offering a full free, present, immediate salvation in Christ Jesus. I thoroughly approve of urging the possibility and the duty of immediate, instantaneous conversion. In these matters I give place to no one, but I do say that these truths should not be set before people thoughtlessly or without explanation. They ought to be told honestly what it is they are taking up if they profess a desire to come out from the world and serve Christ. They should not be moved into the ranks of Christ's army without being told what the warfare entails. They should be told honestly to count the cost. Does anyone ask what our Lord Jesus Christ's practice was in this matter? Let him read what Luke records. He tells us that on a certain occasion that great multitudes went with him, and he turned and said unto them, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother and wife and children, and brethren, and sisters, and even his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. And whosoever does not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. Luke fourteen twenty five through 27 I must plainly say that I cannot reconcile this passage with the lives of many modern Christian pastors and teachers. Yet to my mind, this doctrine is as clear as the sun at noonday. It shows us that we should not hurry people into professing discipleship without warning them plainly to count the cost. Does anyone ask what the practice of the eminent and best preachers of the gospel has been in days gone by? I am confident to say that they have all borne testimony to the wisdom of our Lord's dealing with the multitudes to which I have just referred. Luther, Latimer, Baxter, Wesley, Whitfield, Berridge, and Roland Hill were all extremely aware of the deceitfulness of man's heart. They knew very well that all is not gold that glitters, that conviction is not conversion, that feeling is not faith, that sentiment is not grace, and that all blossoms do not come to fruit. 
Do not be deceived, was their constant cry. Consider well what you do. Do not run before you are called. Count the cost. If we desire to do good, let us never be ashamed of walking in the steps of our Lord Jesus Christ. Work hard if you will, and if you have the opportunity for the souls of others, urge them to consider their ways. Compel them with holy intensity to come in, to lay down their arms, and to yield themselves to God. Offer them salvation, ready, free, full, immediate salvation. Urge Christ and all his benefits on their acceptance. In all your work, though, tell the truth, and tell the whole truth. Be ashamed to use the common art of a recruiting sergeant. Do not speak only of the uniform, the pay, and the glory but also speak of the enemies, the battle, the armor, the vigilance, the marching, and the drills. Do not present only one side of Christianity. When you speak of the cross on which Christ died for our redemption, do not keep back the cross of self-denial that must be carried. Explain fully what Christianity involves. Exhort people to repent and come to Christ, but urge them at the same time to count the cost. I will now give some suggestions that will help people to properly count the cost. I would be negligent indeed if I did not say something on this branch of my subject. I have no desire to discourage anyone or to keep anyone back from Christ's service. It is my heart's desire to encourage everyone to go forward and take up the cross. Let us count the cost by all means and count it carefully. But let us remember that if we consider it properly, and look at it from all sides, there is nothing that should make us afraid. Let us mention some things that should always enter into our calculations in counting the cost of true Christianity. Set down, honestly and fairly, what you will have to give up and go through if you become Christ's disciple. Leave nothing out. Put it all down. Then write down side by side the following points that I am going to give you. Do this, fairly and honestly and I will not be afraid of the result. Count up and compare the profit and the loss. If you are a true-hearted and holy Christian, you may possibly lose something in this world, but you will gain the salvation of your immortal soul. It is written, For what shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Mark 8.36 Count up and compare the praise and the blame if you are a true-hearted and holy Christian. You may possibly be blamed by others, but you will have the praise of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Your blame will come from the lips of a few erring, blind, fallible men and women. Your praise will come from the King of kings and Judge of all the earth. Only those whom He blesses are really blessed. It is written, Blessed are ye when men shall revile you, and persecute you, and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice, and be exceeding glad, for great is your reward in the heavens. Matthew 5, 11-12 Count up and compare the friends and the enemies if you are a true-hearted and holy Christian. On the one side is the enmity of the devil and the wicked. On the other side you have the favor and friendship of the Lord Jesus Christ. Your enemies, at most, can only bruise your heel. They may rage loudly and travel sea and land to try to ruin you, but they cannot destroy you. Your friend is able to save to the uttermost all those who come unto God by him. Hebrews 7.25 No one will ever pluck his sheep out of his hand. John 10.28 It is written, Be not afraid of those that kill the body, and after that have no more that they can do but I will forewarn you whom you shall fear. Fear him who, after being killed, has power to cast into hell. Yea, I say unto you, fear him. Luke 12, 4-5 Count up and compare the life that now is and the life that is to come if you are a true-hearted and holy Christian. The present time, no doubt, is not a time of ease. It is a time of watching and praying, fighting and struggling, believing and working but it is only for a few years. The future time is the season of rest and refreshing. Sin will be cast out. Satan will be bound. 
Best of all, it will be a rest forever. It is written, For our tribulation, which is momentary and light, prepares an exceeding and eternal weight of glory unto us, while we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. 2 Corinthians 4, 17-18 Count up and compare the pleasures of sin and the happiness of God's service, if you are a true-hearted and holy Christian. The pleasures that the worldly man gets by his ways are hollow, unreal, and unsatisfying. They are like the fire of thorns, flashing and crackling for a few minutes, and then quenched forever. The happiness that Christ gives to his people is something solid, lasting, and substantial. It does not depend upon health or circumstances. It never leaves anyone, even in death. It ends in an incorruptible crown of glory. 1 Peter 5 4. It is written, The joy of the hypocrite is but for a moment. Job 20 verse 5. And the laughter of the fool is as the crackling of thorns under a pot. Ecclesiastes 7 6. However, it is also written, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give unto you. Not as the world gives, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled. Neither let it be afraid. John 14.27 Count up and compare the trouble that true Christianity involves and the troubles that are in store for the wicked beyond the grave. Admit for a moment that Bible reading, praying, repenting, believing, and holy living require effort and self-denial. It is all nothing compared to that wrath to come that is stored up for the impenitent and unbelieving. 1 Thessalonians 1.10 a single day in hell will be worse than a whole life spent carrying the cross. Where their worm does not die and the fire is never quenched are things that we cannot fully conceive or describe. Mark 9.48 It is written, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime didst receive thy good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things. But now he is comforted here, and thou art tormented. Luke 16.25 Count up and compare the number of those who turn from sin and the world and serve Christ and the number of those who forsake Christ and return to the world. On the one side you will find thousands, on the other you will find none. Multitudes every year are turning out of the broad way and entering the narrow. None who really enter the narrow way grow tired of it and return to the broad way. The footsteps in the downward road are often to be seen leaving it. The footsteps in the road to heaven are all one way. It is written, The way of the wicked is as darkness, Proverbs 4.19, and the way of transgressors is hard, Proverbs 13.15. It is also written, though, that the path of the just is as the light of the morning star that shines more and more until the day is perfect, Proverbs 4.18. Such calculations as these, no doubt, are often not done correctly. Many people, I am well aware, are always wavering between two opinions. 1 Kings 18.21 They cannot make up their minds that it is worthwhile to serve Christ. The losses and the gains, the advantages and the disadvantages, the sorrows and the joys, and the helps and the hindrances appear to them so nearly balanced that they cannot decide to choose the ways of God. They cannot add these things up correctly. They cannot make the result as clear as it should be. What is the secret of their mistakes? It is a lack of faith. To come to a proper conclusion about our souls, we must have some of that mighty principle that is described in the 11th chapter of Hebrews. Let me try to show how that principle operates in the great business of counting the cost. How was it that Noah persevered in building the ark? He stood alone amid a world of sinners and unbelievers. He had to endure scorn, ridicule, and mocking. What was it that steadied his arm and made him patiently work on and face it all? It was faith. He believed in a wrath to come. He believed there was no safety except in the ark that he was preparing. Believing, he did not place much value on the world's opinion. 
he counted the cost by faith and had no doubt that to build the ark was gain. Hebrews 11.7 How was it that Moses gave up the pleasures of Pharaoh's house and refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter? How was it that he chose instead to join himself with a despised people like the Hebrews, risking everything in this world to carry out the great work of their deliverance from bondage? To the eye of the flesh, he was losing everything and gaining nothing. What was it that moved him? It was faith. He believed that there was one far above Pharaoh who would carry him safe through all that he would do. He believed that the recompense of the reward was far better than all the honors of Egypt. He counted the cost by faith as seeing him who is invisible. He was convinced that to forsake Egypt and go out into the wilderness was gain. Hebrews 11, 23-29 how was it that Saul the Pharisee made up his mind to become a Christian? The cost and sacrifices of the change were incredibly great. He gave up all his brilliant prospects among his own people. Instead of having man's favor, he brought upon himself man's hatred, enmity, and persecution, even unto death. What was it that enabled him to face it all? It was faith. He believed that Jesus, who met him on the way to Damascus, could give him a hundredfold more than he gave up, and in the world to come, everlasting life. Mark 10.30 By faith he counted the cost and saw clearly on which side the right choice lay. He believed firmly that to carry the cross of Christ was gain. Let us consider these things well. That faith that made Noah, Moses, and Paul do what they did is the great secret of reaching a right conclusion about our souls. That same faith must be our helper when we sit down to count the cost of being a true Christian. That same faith is to be had for the asking. He gives greater grace. James 4, 6 Armed with that faith, we will set things down at their true value. Filled with that faith, we will neither add to the cross nor subtract from the crown. Our conclusions will all be correct. Our sum total will be without error. In conclusion, think seriously about whether your current version of Christianity costs you anything. Very likely it costs you nothing. Very probably it does not cost you trouble, time, thought, care, effort, reading, praying, self-denial, conflict, working, or labor of any kind. Now notice what I say. Such a Christianity as this will never save your soul. It will not give you peace while you live, nor hope while you die. It will not support you in the day of affliction, nor cheer you in the hour of death. Christianity that costs nothing is worth nothing. Awake before it is too late. Awake and repent. Awake and be converted. Awake and believe. Awake and pray. Do not rest until you can give a satisfactory answer to my question, What does it cost? If you lack inspiring motives for serving God, think about what it costs to provide salvation for your soul. Think how the Son of God left heaven and became a man, suffered on the cross and lay in the grave to pay your debt to God and work out for you a complete redemption. Think about all this and learn that it is no little matter to possess an immortal soul. It is worthwhile to take some trouble about your soul. Lazy man or woman, has it really come to this, that you will miss heaven because you will not take the time to count the cost? Are you really determined to make shipwreck forever merely because you do not want to exert yourself? Away with the cowardly, unworthy thought. Arise and be strong. Say to yourself, Whatever it costs, I will strive to enter in at the straight gate. Matthew seven thirteen through 14 Look at the cross of Christ and take fresh courage. Look ahead to death, judgment, and eternity and be in earnest. It might cost much to be a Christian, but you can be sure that it is worth the cost. If anyone really feels that he has counted the cost and taken up the cross, I urge him to persevere and press on. 
you might often feel your heart faint and be greatly tempted to give up in despair. Your enemies seem so many, your troubling sins so strong, your friends so few, and the way so steep and narrow that you hardly know what to do. Still, I say, persevere and press on. The time is very short. A few more years of watching and praying, a few more tossings on the sea of this world, a few more deaths and changes, a few more winters and summers, and all will be over. We will have fought our last battle and will need to fight no more. The presence and company of Christ will make up for all we suffer here below. When we see as we have been seen and look back on the journey of life, we will wonder at our own faintness of heart. We will marvel that we made so much of our cross and thought so little of our crown. We will marvel that in counting the cost, we could have ever doubted on which side lay the greatest reward. Let us take courage. We are not far from home. It might cost much to be a true Christian and a consistent believer, but it is well worth the price. Additional Thoughts on Revival I would like to explain a little bit about true revivals, for which I am deeply grateful. If Christ is preached, I rejoice, whoever the preacher may be. If souls are saved, I rejoice, no matter where this occurs, but it is a sad fact that there are sometimes false and effective aspects that occur during a true revival of God. There can be a disproportionate magnifying of some points. Some of these points are instantaneous conversion, the invitation of unconverted sinners to come to Christ, and the possession of inward joy and peace as a test of conversion. Instantaneous conversion, no doubt, ought to be encouraged, but people should not be led to suppose that there is no other sort of conversion, and that unless they are suddenly and powerfully converted to God, they are not converted at all. The duty of coming to Christ at once, just as we are, should be urged upon all hearers. It is the very cornerstone of gospel preaching, but people ought to be told to repent as well as to believe. They should be told why they are to come to Christ, what they are to come for, and from where their need arises. The nearness of peace and comfort in Christ should be proclaimed, but people should be taught that the possession of strong inward joys and high frames of mind are not essential to justification, and that there may be true faith and true peace without such very triumphant feelings. Joy alone is no certain evidence of grace. The work of the Holy Spirit in converting sinners is far too much narrowed and confined to one single way. Not all true converts are converted instantaneously like Saul and the Philippian jailer. Sinners are not sufficiently instructed about the holiness of God's law, the depth of their sinfulness, and the real guilt of sin. To be constantly telling a sinner to come to Christ is of little use unless you tell him, why he needs to come, and fully show him his sins. Faith is often not properly explained. In some cases, people are taught that mere feeling is faith. In others, they are taught that if they believe that Christ died for sinners, they have faith. At this rate, the very demons are believers. The possession of inward joy and assurance is often made essential to believing. Yet assurance is certainly not the essence of saving faith. There can be faith when there is no assurance. To insist on all believers at once rejoicing as soon as they believe is most unsafe. Some, I am quite sure, will rejoice without believing, while others will believe who cannot immediately rejoice. Last but not least, the sovereignty of God in saving sinners and the absolute necessity of preventing grace are far too much overlooked. Many talk as if conversions could be manufactured at man's pleasure, and as if there were no such text as this. It is not of him that wills, nor of him that runs, but of God that has mercy. Romans 9.16 The harm done by the theological system I refer to is very great. On the one hand, Many humble-minded Christians are totally discouraged. 
they think they have no grace because they cannot attain the joyous emotions and feelings that are urged upon them. On the other hand, many graceless people are deceived into thinking they are converted because, under the pressure of excitement and temporary feelings, they are led to profess themselves Christians. And all this time, the thoughtless and ungodly look on with contempt and find new reasons to neglect Christianity completely. There are two passages of Scripture that should be frequently and fully expounded in the present day by all who preach the gospel, especially by those who have anything to do with revivals. One passage is the parable of the sower. That parable is not recorded three times without good reason and a deep meaning. The other passage is our Lord's teaching about counting the cost and the words that he spoke to the great multitudes whom he saw following him. It is very noteworthy that in that occasion he did not say anything to flatter these volunteers or encourage them to follow him. Instead, he saw what their case needed. He told them to stand still and count the cost. I am not sure that most modern preachers would have adopted this course of treatment. Chapter 6 Growth Grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. 2 Peter 3.18 the subject of the text above is one that I dare not leave out of this book about holiness. It is a topic that should be deeply interesting to every true Christian. It naturally raises questions. Do we grow in grace? Do we make progress in our Christianity? I do not expect these questions to be of interest to a mere formal Christian. The one who has nothing more than a kind of Sunday morning religion whose Christianity is like his Sunday clothes, put on once a week and then laid aside, cannot, of course, be expected to care about growing in grace. He knows nothing about such matters. They are foolishness unto him, 1 Corinthians 2.14. However, to everyone who is earnest and sincere about his soul and who hungers and thirsts after spiritual life, the questions ought to come home with searching power. Do we make progress in our Christian lives? Do we grow? These questions are always useful, but especially so at certain times. A Saturday night, a communion Sunday, a birthday, the end of a year. All these are seasons that should cause us to think and make us look within. Time is flying quickly. Life is quickly fleeing away. The hour is daily drawing nearer when the reality of our Christianity will be tested, and it will be seen whether we have built on the rock or on the sand. Matthew seven twenty four through 27 Certainly it is wise for us to examine ourselves from time to time and take account of our souls. Are we progressing in spiritual things? Are we growing in holiness? These questions are of special importance in our day. Defective beliefs and strange opinions are floating in people's minds on some points of doctrine, including the point of growth and grace as an essential part of true holiness. It is totally denied by some people. Others try to explain it away until it is gone. It is misunderstood by most and is therefore neglected. In a day like this, it is beneficial to look directly at the whole subject of Christian growth. In considering this subject, there are three things that I want to bring forward and establish. One, the reality of Christian growth. There is such a thing as growth in grace. Two, the characteristics of Christian growth. There are characteristics by which growth in grace can be known. Three, the method of Christian growth. There are methods that must be used by those who desire to grow in grace. I may not know you who are reading this, but I am not ashamed to ask you to pay close attention to its message. The subject is not a mere matter of speculation and controversy. It is an eminently practical subject in Christianity. It is intimately and inseparably connected with the whole question of sanctification. 
it is a leading characteristic of true saints that they grow. The spiritual health and prosperity and the spiritual happiness and comfort of every true-hearted and holy Christian are intimately connected with the subject of spiritual growth. 1. There is such a thing as growth in grace. It seems at first sight to be a strange and sad thing if any Christian denies this point, but it is fair to remember that human understanding, as well as the human will, is fallen. Disagreements about doctrines are often nothing more than disagreements about the meaning of words. I try to hope that it is so in this case. I try to believe that I mean one thing when I speak of growth and grace, while my brethren who deny it mean quite another. Let me, therefore, clear the way by explaining what I mean. When I speak of growth in grace, I do not for a moment mean that a believer's portion in Christ can grow. I do not mean that he can grow in safety, acceptance with God, or security. I do not mean that he can ever be more justified, more pardoned, more forgiven, or more at peace with God than he is at the first moment he believes. I strongly believe that the justification of a believer is a finished, perfect, and complete work, and that the weakest saint, though he may not know and feel it, is as completely justified as the strongest. I strongly believe that our election, calling, and standing in Christ are not gradual, and do not increase or decrease. If anyone imagines that by growth in grace I mean growth in justification, He has missed the mark and is utterly mistaken about the whole point I am considering. I would go to the stake, God helping me, for the glorious truth that in the matter of justification before God, every believer is complete in Christ. Colossians 2.10 Nothing can be added to his justification from the moment he believes, and nothing can be taken away. When I speak of growth in grace, I only mean growth in the degree size, strength, vigor, and power are the graces that the Holy Spirit plants in a believer's heart. I contend that every one of those graces can grow, progress, and increase. I believe that repentance, faith, hope, love, humility, zeal, courage, and the like can be little or great, strong or weak, and may vary greatly in the same person at different periods of his life. When I speak of someone growing in grace, I simply mean that his sense of sin is becoming deeper, his faith stronger, his hope brighter, his love more extensive, and his spiritual mindedness more evident. He feels more of the power of godliness in his own heart. He manifests more of it in his life. He is going on from strength to strength, from faith to faith, and from grace to grace. I leave it to others to describe such a person's condition by any words they please. For myself, I think the truest and best account of him is that he is growing in grace. One main base on which I build this doctrine of growth in grace is the plain language of Scripture. If words in the Bible mean anything, there is such a thing as growth, and believers ought to be exhorted to grow. What does Paul say? Your faith grows exceedingly. 2 Thessalonians 1.3 We beseech you, brethren, that ye continue to grow. 1 Thessalonians 4.10 Growing in the knowledge of God. Colossians 1.10 Having hope of the increase of your faith. 2 Corinthians 10.15 The Lord make you to multiply and make charity to abound. 1 Thessalonians 3.12 Let us grow up into him in all things. Ephesians 4.15 this I pray, that your charity may abound yet more and more. Philippians 1.9 We beseech and exhort you in the Lord Jesus, that in the manner ye were taught of us, how ye ought to walk and to please God, so ye would continue to grow. 1 Thessalonians 4.1 What does Peter say? Desire the rational milk of the word, that ye may grow thereby. 1 Peter 2.2 Grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, 2 Peter 3.18. I do not know what other people think of such texts, but to me they seem to establish the doctrine for which I contend, and they are incapable of any other explanation. 
Growth in grace is taught in the Bible. I could stop here and say no more. The other base, however, on which I build the doctrine of growth in grace is the base of fact and experience. I ask any honest reader of the New Testament whether or not he can see degrees of grace in the New Testament saints, whose histories are recorded as plainly as the sun at noonday. I ask him whether or not he can see in the very same people as great a difference between their faith and knowledge at one time and at another, as between the same person's strength when he is an infant and when he is a grown-up man. I ask him whether or not the Scripture distinctly recognizes this in the language it uses when it speaks of weak faith and strong faith, and of Christians as newborn babes, little children, young men, and fathers. 1 Peter 2.2, 1 John 2.12-14 I ask him above all whether or not his own observation of believers does not bring him to the same conclusion. What true Christian would not confess that there is as much difference between the degree of his own faith and knowledge when he was first converted and his present attainments as there is between a sapling and a fully grown tree? His graces are the same in principle, but they have grown. I do not know how these facts seem to others, but to my eyes they seem to prove most conclusively that growth in grace is a real thing. I feel almost ashamed to remain so long upon this part of my subject. In fact, if anyone intends to say that the faith, hope, knowledge, and holiness of a newly converted person are as strong as those of an old established believer and need no increase, it is a waste of time to argue further. There is no doubt they are as real but not as strong. They are as genuine but not as vigorous. They are as much seeds of the Spirit's planting but are not yet as fruitful. If anyone asks how they are to become stronger, I say that it must be by the same process by which all things having life increase. They must grow. This is what I mean by growth in grace. Footnote True grace is progressive, of a spreading, growing nature. It is with grace as it is with light. First, there is the daybreak. Then it shines brighter to the full noonday. The saints are not only compared to stars for their light, but to trees for their growth. Isaiah 61.3, Hosea 14.5 A good Christian is not like Hezekiah's son that went backwards, nor Joshua's son that stood still but is always advancing in holiness and increasing with the increase of God. The growth of grace is the best evidence of the truth of grace. Things that have not life will not grow. A picture will not grow, a stake in a hedge will not grow, but a plant that hath vegetative life will grow. The growing of grace shows it to be alive in the soul. Thomas Watson, 1620-1686 English Puritan nonconformist preacher and author from his book, A Body of Divinity. Text resumes. Let us turn now to a more practical view of the great subject before us. I want people to look at growth in grace as a thing of infinite importance to the soul. No matter what others may think, I believe that our best interest is in having a right view of the question, do we grow? Growth in grace is the best evidence of spiritual health and prosperity. In a child, or a flower, or a tree, we are all aware that when there is no growth, there is something wrong. Healthy life in an animal or plant will always show itself by progress and increase. It is the same with our souls. If they are progressing and doing well, they will grow. Growth in grace is one way to be happy in our Christianity. God has wisely linked together our comfort and our increase in holiness. He has graciously made it in our interest to press on and aim high in our Christianity. There is a vast difference between the amount of sensible enjoyment that one believer has in his Christianity compared to another. You can be sure that ordinarily the person who feels the most joy and peace in believing, Romans 15:13 and has the clearest witness of the Spirit in his heart, is the person who grows. Growth in grace is one secret of usefulness to others. Our influence on others for good depends greatly on what they see in us. 
The children of the world measure Christianity quite as much by their eyes as by their ears. The Christian who is always at a standstill, who to all appearances remains the same, with the same little faults, weaknesses, troubling sins, and little weaknesses, is seldom the Christian who does much good. The person who shakes and stirs minds and sets the world thinking is the believer who is continually improving and going forward. People think there is life and reality when they see growth. Growth in grace pleases God. It might seem to be a wonderful thing, no doubt, that anything done by such creatures as we are can give pleasure to the Most High God, but it is so. The Scripture speaks of walking so as to please God. 1 Thessalonians 4.1 The Scripture says there are sacrifices with which God is well pleased. Hebrews 13.16 The farmer loves to see the plants on which he has bestowed labor, flourishing, and bearing fruit. It cannot but disappoint and grieve him to see them stunted and standing still. What does our Lord Himself say? Scripture, I am the true vine, and my Father is the husbandman. In this is my Father clarified, in that ye bear much fruit, and in this manner ye shall be my disciples. John 15, 1 and 8. The Lord takes pleasure in all His people, but especially in those who grow. Growth in grace is not only possible, but is something for which believers are accountable. To tell an unconverted person, dead in sins, to grow in grace would doubtless be absurd. To tell a believer who is awakened and alive to God to grow is only calling him to a plain scriptural duty. He has a new set of standards within him, and it is a solemn duty not to quench it. Neglect of growth robs him of privileges, grieves the spirit, and makes the chariot wheels of his soul move heavily. Whose fault is it, I would like to know, if a believer does not grow in grace? The fault, I am sure, cannot be laid on God. He delights to give more grace, James 4, 6. He has pleasure in the peace of his slave, Psalm 35, 27. The fault, no doubt, is our own. We ourselves are to blame, and no one else, if we do not grow. 2. There are characteristics by which growth in grace can be known. Let me take it for granted that we do not question the reality of growth in grace and its vast importance. So far, so good. But now you want to know how anyone can find out whether he is growing in grace or not. I first answer that question by observing that we are very poor judges of our own condition, and that bystanders often know us better than we know ourselves. I answer further that there are undoubtedly certain great characteristics and signs of growth and grace, and that wherever you see these marks, you see a growing soul. I will now discuss some of these signs of growing in grace. One sign of growth in grace is increased humility. The person whose soul is growing feels his own sinfulness and unworthiness more every year. He is ready to say with Job, I am vile. Job 40, verse 4. With Abraham, I am but dust and ashes. Genesis eighteen twenty seven. With Jacob, I am not worthy of the least of all the mercies. Genesis thirty two ten. With David, I am a worm. Psalm 22, 6. With Isaiah, I am a man of unclean lips. Isaiah 6, 5. And with Peter, Lord, I am a sinful man. Luke 5, 8. The nearer one grows to God and the more he sees of God's holiness and perfection, the more thoroughly he is aware of his own countless imperfections. The farther he travels on the way to heaven, the more he understands what Paul meant when he said that he was not already perfect, Philippians 3.12, that he was not worthy to be called an apostle, 1 Corinthians 15.9, that he was less than the least of all saints, Ephesians 3.8, and that he was chief of sinners. 1 Timothy 1.15 The more ready he is for glory, the more like ripe corn he hangs down his head. The brighter and clearer his light and understanding are, the more he sees of the shortcomings and infirmities of his own heart. When first converted, he would tell you he only saw a little of them compared to what he sees now. 
Do you want to know if you are growing in grace? Be sure that you look within for increased humility. Another sign of growth in grace is increased faith and love toward our Lord Jesus Christ. The person whose soul is growing finds more in Christ to rest upon every year, and he rejoices more that he has such a Savior. No doubt he saw much in him when he first believed. His faith laid hold on the atonement of Christ and gave him hope. But as he grows in grace, he sees a thousand things in Christ that he never dreamed of at first. His love and power, his heart and his intentions, his work as substitute, intercessor, priest, advocate, physician, shepherd, and friend all unfold themselves to a growing soul in an unspeakable manner. The person who is growing in grace discovers a worthiness in Christ for the needs of his soul that he did not know even the half of before. Do you want to know if you are growing in grace? Then look within and see if you have increased knowledge of Christ. Another sign of growth in grace is increased holiness of life and conversation. The person whose soul is growing gets more dominion over sin, the world, and the devil every year. He becomes more careful about his temperament, his words, and his actions. He's more watchful over his conduct in every aspect of life. He strives more to be conformed to the image of Christ in all things, to follow him as his example, and to trust in him more deeply as his Savior. He's not content with old attainments and former grace. He forgets the things that are behind and reaches forward unto those things that are before, making higher, upward, forward, onward his continual motto, Philippians 3.13. On earth he thirsts and desires to have a will more entirely in unison with God's will. In heaven, the main thing that he looks for next to the presence of Christ is complete separation from all sin. Do you want to know if you are growing in grace? Then look within for increased holiness. Another sign of growth in grace is increased spirituality of taste and mind. The person whose soul is growing takes more interest in spiritual things every year. He does not neglect his duty in the world. He carries out every duty of life faithfully diligently and conscientiously, whether at home or abroad, but the things he loves best are spiritual things. The ways, trends, amusements, and recreations of the world have a continually decreasing place in his heart. He does not condemn them all as downright sinful or say that those who have anything to do with them are going to hell, but they have a constantly diminishing hold on his own affections and gradually seem smaller and less important in his eyes. Godly friends, habits, activities, and conversation appear of ever-increasing value to him. Do you want to know if you are growing in grace? Then look within for a greater desire for the things of God and less affection for the things of the world. Another sign of growth in grace is increase of love. The person whose soul is growing is more full of love every year, of love to all people, but especially of love toward true Christian brethren. His love will show itself actively in a growing disposition to do kindnesses, to help others, to be good-natured to everybody, to be generous, sympathizing, thoughtful, tender-hearted, and considerate. It will show itself passively in a growing disposition to be humble and patient toward others, to put up with provocation and not stand upon rights, to be patient and to restrain rather than quarrel. A soul growing in grace will try to put the best construction on other people's conduct and to believe all things and hope all things even to the end. There is no more certain sign of backsliding and falling off in grace than an increasing disposition to find fault, pick holes, and see weak points in others. Do you want to know if you are growing in grace? Then look within for increasing love. One more sign of growth in grace is increased zeal and diligence in trying to do good to souls. 
The person who is really growing will take greater interest in the salvation of sinners every year. Missions at home and abroad, along with all efforts to increase biblical light and diminish spiritual darkness, will have a greater place in his attention every year. He will not become weary in well-doing, Galatians 6.9, because he does not see every effort succeed. He will not care less for the progress of Christ's cause on earth as he grows older, though he will learn to expect less. He will just work on and do his duty, whether giving, praying, preaching, speaking, or visiting, whatever the result may be, and will consider his work its own reward. One of the most certain signs of spiritual decline is a decreased interest about the souls of others and the growth of Christ's kingdom. Do you want to know if you're growing in grace? Then look within for increased concern about the salvation of souls. These are the most trustworthy signs of growth in grace. Let us examine them carefully and consider what we know about them. I can certainly believe that they will not please some professing Christians in our day, those excitable, emotional religionists whose only notion of Christianity is that of a state of perpetual joy and ecstasy, who tell you that they have progressed far beyond the region of conflict and soul humiliation, will no doubt regard the characteristics I have mentioned as legalistic, carnal, and producing bondage. I cannot help that. I call no one master in these things. I only desire that my statements will be judged according to Scripture. I firmly believe that what I have said is not only scriptural, but it is agreeable to the experience of the most eminent saints in every age. Show me someone in whom the six qualities I have mentioned can be found. He is the one who can give a satisfactory answer to the question, Are we growing in grace? 3. There are methods that must be used by those who desire to grow in grace. The words of James must never be forgotten. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of lights. James 1.17 This is no doubt as true of growth in grace as it is of everything else. It is the gift of God, but still it must always be kept in mind that God is pleased to work by means. God has ordained means as well as ends. He who wants to grow in grace must use the means of growth. I'm afraid that this point is too often overlooked by believers. Many admire growth in grace in others and wish that they themselves were like them, but they seem to suppose that those who grow do so because of some special gift from God, and that since they have not received this gift, they are content to sit still. This is a dreadful delusion, and one against which I desire to testify with all my might. I wanted to be distinctly understood that growth in grace is bound up with the use of means within the reach of all believers, and that, as a general rule, growing souls are what they are because they use these means and methods. Please pay careful attention while I explain the means of growth. Cast away forever the wrong thinking that if a believer does not grow in grace, it is not his fault. Settle it in your mind that a believer, a person made alive by the Holy Spirit, is not a mere dead creature, but is a being of mighty capacities and responsibilities. Let the words of Solomon sink down into your heart. The soul of the diligent shall be made fat. Proverbs 13.4 one thing essential to growth in grace is diligence in the use of private means of grace. By this, I understand such things as someone must use by himself alone, and no one can use for him. This includes private prayer, private reading of the Bible, and private meditation and self-examination. The person who does not exert any effort about these three things must never expect to grow. These are the roots of true Christianity. If a person is wrong here, he is wrong all the way through. This is the whole reason why many professing Christians never seem to grow spiritually. They are careless and not diligent about their private prayers. They read their Bibles only a little and with very little enthusiasm or desire. They give themselves no time to meditate upon and examine the condition of their souls. 
It is useless to try to deny that the age we live in is full of distinct dangers. It is an age of much activity and of much hurry, bustle and excitement in Christian activity. Many are running to and fro, no doubt, and knowledge is increased, Daniel 12.4. Multitudes are ready to attend religious public meetings, events, or anything else in which there is excitement and emotion. Few, though, seem to remember the absolute necessity of making time to meditate in your heart and desist. Psalm 4.4 Without this, however, there is seldom any deep spiritual success. I suspect that Christians a few hundred years ago read their Bibles more and were more frequently alone with God than they are in the present day. Let us remember this point. Private devotion must receive our first priority if we desire our souls to grow. Another thing that is essential to growth in grace is carefulness in the use of public means of grace. By this I understand to include those means that we have within our reach as members of Christ's visible church. In this I include the ordinances of regular Sunday worship, uniting with God's people in common prayer and praise the preaching of the Word, and the sacrament of the Lord's Supper. I firmly believe that the manner in which these public means of grace are used has much to say to the prosperity of a believer's soul. It is easy to use them in a cold and heartless way. The very familiarity of them is apt to make us careless. Religious tradition, ritual, and ceremonies are likely to make us sleepy, callous, and unfeeling. This is a snare into which too many professing Christians fall. If we want to grow spiritually, we must be on our guard here. This is a matter in which the Holy Spirit is often grieved, and that is detrimental to many saints. Let us strive to use the old prayers, sing the old hymns, kneel at the old communion rail, and hear the old truths preached with as much freshness and hunger as when we first believed. It is a sign of bad health when a person loses enjoyment for his food, and it is a sign of spiritual decline when we lose our appetite for means of grace. Whatever we do about public means, let us always do it with our might. Ecclesiastes 9.10 This is the way to grow. Another thing essential to growth in grace is watchfulness over our conduct in the little matters of everyday life. Our tempers, our tongues, how we carry out our duties of life, how we use our time, each and all must be vigilantly attended to if we want our souls to prosper. Life is made up of days, and days are made up of hours, and the little things of every hour are not too little to be beneath the care of a Christian. When a tree begins to decay at its root or heart, The mischief is first seen at the extreme end of the little branches. He that despises little things, says an uninspired writer, shall fall by little and little. Ecclesiasticus 19.1 That witness is true. Let others despise us, if they like, and call us precise and over-careful. Let us patiently hold to our way, remembering that we serve a precise God that our Lord's example is to be imitated in the least things as well as the greatest, and that we must take up our cross daily, Luke 9.23, and hourly rather than sin. We must strive to have a Christianity that, like the sap of a tree, runs through every twig and leaf of our character and sanctifies all. This is one way to grow. Another thing that is essential to growth and grace is caution about the company we keep and the friendships we form. Perhaps nothing affects someone's character more than the company he keeps. We are influenced by the ways and tone of those with whom we live and talk, and, sadly, we get harm far more easily than good. Disease is infectious, but health is not. If a professing Christian deliberately chooses to be closely acquainted with those who are not friends of God and who cling to the world, his soul is certain to be harmed. It is hard enough to serve Christ under any circumstances in such a world as this. 
but it is twice as hard to do so if we are friends of the thoughtless and ungodly. Mistakes in friendship or marriage engagements are the whole reason why some have entirely ceased to grow. Evil companions corrupt good character. 1 Corinthians 15.33 The friendship of the world is enmity with God. James 4.4 4. Let us seek friends who will motivate us to pray, read the Bible, and use our time wisely. Let us seek friends who are concerned about our souls, our salvation, and a world to come. Who can tell the good that a friend's word in season may do, or the harm that it can stop? This is one way to grow. Footnote. Let those be your closest companions who have made Christ their main companion. Do not so much look at the outside of people as their inside. Look most to their internal worth. Many people have their eyes upon the outside of one who professes to be a Christian, but give me a Christian who is concerned with the internal worth of people, who makes those who are most filled with the fullness of God his closest and best companions. Thomas Brooks, 1608-1680 through Puritan nonconformist pastor and author. Text resumes. One more thing that is absolutely essential to growth in grace is regular and habitual communion with the Lord Jesus. I'm not referring to the Lord's Supper. Rather, I mean that daily habit of private and close communion between the believer and his Savior that can only be carried on by faith, prayer, and meditation. It is a habit, I'm afraid, of which many believers know little. A person can be a believer and have his feet on the rock, and yet live far below how he ought to live. It is possible to have union with Christ and yet to have little, if any, communion with Him. All true Christians should have much communion with Jesus Christ. The names and offices of Christ as laid down in Scripture appear to me to show unmistakably that this communion between the saint and his Savior is not merely an idea, but it is a real, true thing. Between the bridegroom and his bride, between the head and his members, between the physician and his patients, between the advocate and his clients, between the shepherd and his sheep, between the master and his scholars, there is evidently implied a habit of familiar communion of daily petitions for things needed, of daily pouring out and unburdening our hearts and minds. Such a habit of dealing with Christ is clearly something more than a vague, general trust in the work that Christ did for sinners. It is getting close to Him and laying hold of Him with confidence, as a loving, personal friend. This is what I mean by communion. I do not believe that anyone will ever grow in grace who does not know something practically of the habit of communion with God. We must not be content with the general routine knowledge that justification is by faith and not by works, and that we should put our trust in Christ. We must go further than this. We must seek to have personal intimacy with the Lord Jesus and to deal with Him as a man deals with a loving friend. We must realize what it is to turn to Him first in every need, to talk to Him about every difficulty, to consult with Him about every step, to spread before Him all our sorrows, to get Him to share in all our joys, to do everything as in His sight, and to go through every day leaning on Him and looking to Him. This is the way that Paul lived. Scripture The life which I now live in the flesh I live by the faith of the Son of God, Galatians 2.20. To me, to live is Christ, Philippians 1.21. It is ignorance of this way of living that makes so many see no beauty in the book of the Song of Solomon, but it is the person who lives in this way, who keeps up constant communion with Christ, I emphatically say, whose soul will grow. Far more could be said about this subject of growth and grace, but I've said enough. I hope to convince you that the subject is one of great importance. Let me conclude this with some practical applications. For those who know nothing whatever about growth in grace, they have little or no concern about Christianity. Occasional Sunday church attendance makes up the substance of their Christianity. 
They are without spiritual life, and of course they cannot presently grow in grace. Are you one of these people? If you are, you're in a sad condition. Years are slipping away, and time is flying by. Graveyards are filling up, and families are thinning. Death and judgment are getting nearer to us all, yet you live like one asleep about your soul. How absurd! What foolishness! What suicide can be worse than this? Awake before it's too late. Awake, arise from the dead, and live for God. Turn to Him who is sitting at the right hand of God, waiting to be your Savior and friend. Turn to Christ, and cry earnestly to Him about your soul. There is yet hope. He who called Lazarus from the grave has not changed. He who commanded the widow's son at Nain to arise from his coffin and do miracles yet for your soul. Seek him at once. Seek Christ if you do not want to be lost forever. Do not stand still, merely talking and meaning and intending and wishing and hoping. Seek Christ that you may live and live so you may grow. For those who ought to know something of growth and grace but currently know nothing at all, they have made little or no progress since they were first converted. They seem to have settled on their leaves, Zephaniah 1.12. They go on from year to year, content with old grace, old experience, old knowledge, old faith, old measure of attainment, old religious expressions, and old set phrases. Like the Gibeonites, their bread is always moldy, and their shoes are worn and patched. Joshua 9, 12-13 They never appear to make any progress. Are you one of these people? If you are, you are living far below your privileges and responsibilities. It is time to examine yourself. If you have reason to hope that you are a true believer, and yet do not grow in grace, there must be a fault, a serious fault, somewhere. It is not the will of God that your soul should stand still. He gives greater grace, James 4, 6. He takes pleasure in the peace of his slave, Psalm 35, 27. It cannot be for your own happiness or usefulness that your soul should stand still. Without growth, you will never rejoice in the Lord, Philippians 4, 4. Without growth, you will never do good to others. Certainly, this lack of growth is a serious matter. It should cause you to search your heart. There must be some secret thing, Job 15.11. There must be some reason. Take the advice I give you. Resolve this very day that you will find out the reason why you are standing still and not growing in grace. Search every corner of your soul with a faithful and firm hand. Search from one end of the camp to the other until you find out the Achan who is weakening your hands. Joshua 7. Begin by appealing to the Lord Jesus Christ, the great physician of souls, and ask Him to heal the secret ailment within you, whatever it may be. Begin as if you had never pleaded with Him before, and ask for grace to cut off the right hand and pluck out the right eye. Matthew 5, 29-30 Never, never be content if your soul does not grow. For the sake of your own peace and your usefulness and for the honor of your Maker's cause, resolve to find out the reason why. For those who are really growing in grace, but are not aware of it and do not recognize it, their very growth is the reason why they do not see their growth. Their continual increase in humility prevents them from realizing that they are progressing. Like Moses when he came down from the mount from communing with God, their faces shine, and like Moses, they are not aware of it. Exodus 34.29 Such Christians, I freely admit, are not common, but they are to be found every once in a while. Like angels' visits, they are few and far between. Happy is the neighborhood where such growing Christians live. To meet them and see them and be in their company is like meeting and seeing a bit of heaven upon earth. What should I say to such people? What can I say? Should I awaken them to a consciousness of their growth and tell them to be pleased with it? 
I will do nothing of the kind. Should I tell them to be satisfied with their own attainments and look at their own superiority over others? God forbid. I will do nothing of the kind. To tell them such things would do them no good. To tell them such things would be a useless waste of time. If there is any one feature about a growing soul that especially characterizes him, it is his deep sense of his own unworthiness. He never sees anything to be praised in himself. He only feels that he is an unprofitable servant and the chief of sinners. It is the righteous in the picture of the judgment day who ask, Lord, when did we see thee hungry and feed thee, or thirsty and give thee drink? Matthew 25, 37 Extremes do indeed meet strangely sometimes. The conscience-hardened sinner and the eminent saint are in one respect quite alike. Neither of them fully realizes his own condition. The one does not see his own sin, and the other does not see his own grace. But will I say nothing to growing Christians? Is there no word of counsel I can address to them? The sum and substance of all that I can say is to be found in two sentences. Go forward. Go on. We can never have too much humility, too much faith in Christ, too much holiness, too much spirituality of mind, too much love or too much zeal in doing good to others. Let us then be continually forgetting those things which are behind and extending myself unto those things which are ahead. Philippians 3.13 The best Christians in these matters are infinitely below the perfect pattern of the Lord. Whatever the world may say, we can be sure there is no danger of any of us becoming too good. Let us cast to the winds as idle talk the common idea that it is possible to be extreme and go too far in the Christian life. This is a favorite lie of the devil, and one that he circulates with much effort. No doubt there are enthusiasts and fanatics to be found who bring evil report upon Christianity by their extravagances and foolishness. But if anyone says that a mortal man can be too humble, too loving, too holy, or too diligent in doing good, he must either be an infidel or a fool. It is easy to go too far in serving pleasure and money, but in following the things that make up true Christianity and in serving Christ, there can be no extreme. Let us never measure our Christianity by that of others and think we are doing enough if we think we are doing better than our neighbors. This is another snare of the devil. Let us mind our own business. What is that to thee? said our master on a certain occasion. Follow thou me. John 21, 22. Let us follow on, aiming at nothing short of perfection. Let us follow on, making Christ's life and character our only pattern and example. Let us follow on, remembering daily that at our best we are miserable sinners. Let us follow on, never forgetting that it signifies nothing whether we are better than others or not. At our very best, we are far worse than we ought to be. There will always be room for improvement in us. We will be debtors to Christ's mercy and grace to the very end. Let us stop looking at others and comparing ourselves with them. We will find enough to do if we look at our own hearts. Last but not least, if we know anything about growth and grace and desire to know more, let us not be surprised if we have to go through much trial and affliction in this world. I firmly believe it is the experience of nearly all the most eminent saints. Like their blessed master, they have been men of sorrows and acquainted with weakness, Isaiah 53, 3, and made perfect through sufferings, Hebrews 2, 10. It is a remarkable saying of our Lord that every branch in him that bears fruit, his father purges it, that it may bring forth more fruit. John 15, 2. It is a sad fact that constant worldly prosperity as a general rule is harmful to a believer's soul. We cannot stand it. Sickness, losses, crosses, anxieties, and disappointments seem absolutely necessary to keep us humble watchful and spiritual-minded. They are as needful as the pruning knife to the vine and the refiner's furnace to the gold. 
They are not pleasant to flesh and blood. We do not like them, and we often do not see their meaning. Scripture. No chastening at present seems to be cause for joy, but rather for grief. Nevertheless, afterward it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness. Hebrews 12.11 When we reach heaven, we will find that it all worked out for our good. If we love growth and grace, let these thoughts abide in our minds. When days of darkness come upon us, let us not consider it a perplexing thing. Rather, let us remember that lessons are learned on such days that would never have been learned in sunshine. Let us say to ourselves, This also is for my profit, that I may be a partaker of God's holiness. It is sent in love. I am in God's best school. Correction is for instruction. This is meant to make me grow. I now conclude the subject of growth and grace. I hope I have said enough to set some of you thinking about it. All things are growing older. The world is growing old, and we ourselves are growing older. A few more summers, a few more winters, a few more sicknesses, a few more sorrows, a few more weddings, a few more funerals, a few more meetings, a few more partings. And then what? The grass will be growing over our graves. Would it not be good now to look within ourselves and ask our souls a simple question? In Christianity, in the things that concern our peace, in the great matter of personal holiness, are we making progress? Are we growing? Chapter 7 Assurance for I am now ready to be offered, and the time of my release is at hand. I have fought a good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. From now on there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but unto all those also that have loved his appearing. Second Timothy 4, 6-8 in the words of the Bible verses at the top of this page, we see the Apostle Paul looking three ways, downward, backward, and forward. He's looking downward to the grave, backward to his own ministry, and forward to that great day, the day of judgment. It will do us good to stand by the Apostle's side for a few minutes and pay attention to the words he uses. Happy is that soul who can look where Paul looked, and then speak as Paul spoke. He looks downward to the grave, and he does it without fear. Hear what he says, I am now ready to be offered. I am like an animal brought to the place of sacrifice and bound with cords to the very horns of the altar. The drink offering, which generally accompanies the offering, is already being poured out. The last ceremonies have been gone through. Every preparation has been made. Only the death blow remains, and then all is over. The time of my release is at hand. I'm like a ship about to unmoor and put to sea. Everything on board is ready. I only wait for the moorings to be cast off that fasten me to the shore, and I will then set sail and begin my voyage. These are remarkable words to come from the lips of a child of Adam, like ourselves. Death is a solemn thing and never so much so as when we see it close at hand. The grave is a chilling, heart-sickening place, and it is vain to pretend it has no terrors. Yet here is a mortal man who can look calmly into the narrow house appointed for all living, Job 30, 23, and say, while he stands upon the brink, I see it all, and I'm not afraid. Paul looks backward to his ministerial life and he does it without shame. Hear what he says, I have fought a good fight. Here he speaks as a soldier. I have fought that good fight with the world, the flesh, and the devil, from which so many retreat and draw back. I have finished the race. Here he speaks as one who has run for a prize. I have run the race marked out for me. I have gone over the ground appointed for me, however rough and steep. I have not turned aside because of difficulties, 
nor have I been discouraged by the length of the course. I am at last in sight of the goal. I have kept the faith. Here he speaks as a steward. I have held fast that glorious gospel that was committed to my trust. I have not mingled it with man's traditions, nor spoiled its simplicity by adding my own inventions, nor allowed others to adulterate it without opposing them to the face. As a soldier, a runner, a steward, he seems to say, I am not ashamed. The Christian is happy who, as he leaves the world, can leave such a testimony behind him. A good conscience will save no one. It will not wash away any sin or lift us one hair's breadth toward heaven, yet a good conscience will be found to be a pleasant visitor at our bedside in a dying hour. There is a fine passage in Pilgrim's Progress that describes Old Honest's passage across the river of death. The river, says Bunyan, overflowed its banks in some places, but Mr. Honest, in his lifetime, had spoken to one good conscience to meet him there. And there he was, ready to lend him his hand, and he helped him over. We may be sure there is a mine of truth in that passage. The Apostle Paul looks forward to the great day of judgment, and he does it without doubt. Notice his words. From now on there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but unto all those that have loved his appearing. A glorious reward, he seems to say, is ready and laid up in store for me, even that crown that is only given to the righteous. In the great day of judgment, the Lord will give this crown to me and to all others who have loved him as an unseen Savior and have longed to see him face to face. My work on earth is over. This one thing now remains for me to look forward to and nothing more. Let us observe that the Apostle Paul speaks without any hesitation or distrust. He regards the crown as a sure thing, as his own already. He declares with unfaltering confidence his firm persuasion that the righteous judge will give it to him. Paul was no stranger to all the circumstances and accompaniments of that solemn day to which he referred. The great white throne, the assembled world, the open books, the revealing of all secrets, the listening angels, the tremendous sentence, and the eternal separation of the lost and saved were all things with which he was well acquainted, but none of these things moved him. His strong faith looked past them all, and he only saw Jesus, his all-prevailing advocate, the blood of sprinkling, and his sin washed away. A crown, he says, is laid up for me. The Lord himself will give it to me. He speaks as if he saw it all with his own eyes. These are the main things that these verses contain. I will not write about most of them because I want to confine myself to the specific topic of holiness. I will only try to consider one point in the passage. That point is the strong fulfillment of your hope, Hebrews 6.11, with which the Apostle Paul looks forward to his own prospects in the day of judgment. I will do this the more willingly because of the great importance that is attached to the subject of assurance and the great neglect with which it is often treated. I will do it at the same time with fear and trembling. I feel that I am treading on very difficult ground, and that it is easy to speak rashly and unscripturally in this matter. The road between truth and error here is an especially narrow pass, and if I will be enabled to do good to some without doing harm to others, I will be very thankful. There are four things I want to mention on the subject of assurance, and it might help if I list them now. Firstly, I will try to show that an assured hope, such as Paul here expresses, is a true and scriptural thing. Secondly, I will make a broad concession that a person might never arrive at this assured hope and yet be saved. Thirdly, I will give some reasons why an assured hope is greatly to be desired. Lastly, I will try to point out some reasons why an assured hope is so seldom attained. 
I ask special attention of all who take an interest in the main subject of this book. If I am not greatly mistaken, there is a very close connection between true holiness and assurance, and I want to show the nature of that connection. At present, I content myself with saying that where there is the most holiness, there is generally the most assurance. 1. An assured hope is a true and scriptural thing. Assurance, such as Paul expresses in 2 Timothy 4, 6-8, quoted at the beginning of this chapter, is not a mere opinion or feeling. It is not the result of much imagination or of hopeful and positive thoughts. It is a positive gift of the Holy Spirit given without reference to one's bodily frame or health. And it is a gift that every believer in Christ ought to aim at and seek after. In matters like these, the first question should be, What does the Bible say? I answer that question without the least hesitation. The Word of God appears to me to teach distinctly that a believer can arrive at an assured confidence with regard to his own salvation. I confidently say, as God's truth, that a true Christian, a converted person, can reach such a comfortable degree of faith in Christ that he will generally feel entirely confident as to the pardon and safety of his soul. He is able to seldom be troubled with doubts, seldom be distracted with fears, and seldom be distressed by anxious uncertainties. Though bothered by many inward conflicts with sin, he will look forward to death without trembling and to judgment without dismay. This, I say, is the doctrine of the Bible. This is my account of assurance. I will ask my readers to notice it distinctly. I say neither less nor more than I have here laid down. Such a statement as this is often disputed and denied. Many cannot see the truth of it at all. The Church of Rome denounces assurance in the most unmeasured terms. The Council of Trent declares sharply that a believer's assurance of the pardon of his sins is a vain and ungodly confidence. And Cardinal Bellarmine, the well-known champion of Roman Catholicism, calls it a prime error of heretics. Footnote. Robert Bellarmine, 1542 through 1621, was a Jesuit and a cardinal in the Roman Catholic Church. He also was a cardinal inquisitor and took part in some of the trials against some alleged heretics, including Giordano Bruno, who was burned at the stake, and Galileo. Bellarmine was a loyal defender of the Roman Catholic Church. Text resumes. The vast majority of the worldly and thoughtless Christians among us oppose the doctrine of assurance. It offends and annoys them to hear of it. They do not like others to feel comfortable and sure because they never feel that way themselves. Ask them if their sins are forgiven and they will probably tell you that they do not know. It is certainly not a surprise that they do not accept the doctrine of assurance. There are also some true believers who reject assurance or resist it as a doctrine filled with danger. They think that it borders on presumption. They seem to think that it is humble never to feel sure, never to be confident, and to live in a certain degree of doubt and suspense about their souls. This is to be regretted, and it does much harm. I freely admit that there are some presumptuous people who profess to feel a confidence for which they have no scriptural basis. There are always some people who think well of themselves when God thinks poorly of them, just as there are some who think poorly of themselves when God thinks well of them. There will always be such people. There never yet was a scriptural truth without abuses and counterfeits. God's election, man's helplessness, and salvation by grace are all abused truths. There will be fanatics and enthusiasts as long as the world stands. But despite all this, assurance is a reality and a true thing, and God's people must not let themselves be driven from the use of a truth simply because it is abused by some people. My answer to all who deny the existence of real, well-grounded assurance is simply this. What does the Bible say? If assurance is not there, I have not another word to say about it. But does not Job say, For I know that my Redeemer lives, 
and that he shall rise at the latter day over the dust. And afterward from this, my stricken skin and from my own flesh, I must see God. Job 19.25-26 Does not David say, Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For thou art with me, thy rod and thy staff shall comfort me. Psalm 23.4 Does not Isaiah say, Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on thee, because he trusts in thee? Isaiah 26.3 Does he not also say, The work of righteousness shall be peace, and the effect of righteousness, rest and security forever? Isaiah 32.17 Does not Paul say to the Romans, I am certain that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any creature shall be able to separate us from the charity of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Romans 8, 38-39 Does he not say to the Corinthians, For we know that if the earthly house of this our habitation were dissolved, we have a building of God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens, 2 Corinthians 5, 1, and that we are always confident, knowing that while we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord, 2 Corinthians 5, 6. Does he not say to Timothy, I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day, 2 Timothy 1, 12. Does he not speak to the Colossians of the fulfilled understanding? Colossians 2.2 2. Does not the author to the Hebrews write of the full assurance of faith? Hebrews 10.22 And the fulfillment of your hope? Hebrews 6.11 Does not Peter specifically say, Give all the more diligence to make your calling and election sure? 2 Peter 1.10 Does not John say, We know that we are passed from death unto life? 1 John 3.14 These things I have written unto you that believe in the name of the Son of God, that ye may know that ye have eternal life. 1 John 5.13 And we know that we are of God. 1 John 5.19 What can we say to these things? I want to speak with all humility on any disputed point. I'm only a poor, fallible child of Adam myself, but I must say that in the passages I have just quoted, I see something far higher than the mere hopes and trusts with which so many believers seem content in this day. I see the language of persuasion, confidence, and knowledge, and I might almost say of certainty. I feel for my own part that if I take these verses in their plain, obvious meaning, the doctrine of assurance is true. My answer, furthermore, to all who dislike the doctrine of assurance as bordering on presumption is this. It can hardly be presumption to tread in the steps of Peter, Paul, Job, and John. They were all eminently humble and lowly-minded men, if ever any were, and yet they all speak of their own condition with an assured hope. Surely this should teach us that deep humility and strong assurance are perfectly compatible and that there is not any necessary connection between spiritual confidence and pride. Many have attained to such an assured hope as our text describes even in modern times. I will not concede for a moment that it was a specific privilege confined to the apostolic day. There have been, in our own land, many believers who have appeared to walk in almost uninterrupted fellowship with the Father and the Son, and who have seemed to enjoy an almost unceasing sense of the light of God's reconciled countenance shining down upon them, and many have left their experience on record. I could mention well-known names, if space permitted. The thing has been and still is, and that is enough. Lastly, it cannot be wrong to be confident in a matter where God speaks unconditionally to believe decidedly when God promises decidedly, and to have a sure persuasion of pardon and peace when we rest on the word and oath of him who never changes. It is an utter mistake to suppose that the believer who feels assurance is resting on anything he sees in himself. He simply leans on the mediator of the new covenant, 
and the scripture of truth. He believes that the Lord Jesus means what he says, and he takes him at his word. Assurance, after all, is no more than a full-grown faith. It is a mature faith that grasps Christ's promise with both hands. It is a faith that argues, like the good centurion, If the Lord speak the word only, then I am healed. Matthew 8, 8. Wherefore then should I doubt? Footnote. To be assured of our salvation, Augustine says, is no arrogant stoutness. It is our faith. It is no pride. It is devotion. It is no presumption. It is God's promise. Bishop Jewell's Defense of the Apology. 1570. If the ground of our assurance rested in and on ourselves, it might justly be called presumption. But the Lord, and the power of His might, being the ground thereof, they either know not what is the might of His power, or else too lightly esteem it, who account assured confidence thereon presumption. Gouges Whole Armor of God, 1647 Upon what ground is this certainty built? Surely not upon anything that is in us. Our assurance of perseverance is grounded wholly upon God. If we look upon ourselves, we see cause of fear and doubting. But if we look up to God, we shall find cause enough for assurance. Author Hildersham on John 4, 1632 Our hope is not hung upon such an untwisted thread as I imagined so. The strong rope of our fastened anchor is the oath and promise of Him who is eternal truth. Our salvation is fastened with God's own hand and Christ's own strength to the strong stake of God's unchangeable nature. Rutherford's Letters, 1637. Text resumes. We can be sure that Paul was the last man in the world to build his assurance on anything of his own. He who could write himself down as the chief of sinners, 1 Timothy 1.15, had a deep sense of his guilt and corruption but he had a still deeper sense of the length and breadth of Christ's righteousness imputed to him. He who could cry, O wretched man that I am, Romans 7.24, had a clear view of the fountain of evil within his heart, but he had a still clearer view of that other fountain that can remove all sin and uncleanness. He who thought himself less than the least of all saints, Ephesians 3.8, had a strong and abiding feeling of his own weakness, but he had a still stronger feeling that Christ's promise that his sheep shall never perish could not be broken. John 10.28 Paul knew, if ever anyone did, that he was a poor, frail boat floating on a stormy ocean. He saw the rolling waves and roaring tempest by which he was surrounded, but then he looked away from self to Jesus, and he was not afraid. He remembered that anchor within the veil that is both sure and steadfast, Hebrews 6.19. He remembered the word, work, and constant intercession of him who loved him and gave himself for him, Ephesians 5.2. It was this and nothing else that enabled him to say so boldly, a crown is laid up for me and the Lord will give it to me. And to conclude so certainly, the Lord will preserve me. I will never be defeated. I will not dwell longer on this part of the subject. I think I have shown some good ground for the assertion I made that assurance is a true thing. Number two. I move on to the second point, that a believer might never arrive at this assured hope that Paul expresses, yet he might still be saved. I admit this most freely. I do not dispute it for a moment. I would not desire to make one contrite heart sad that God has not made sad, to discourage one weak child of God, or to leave the impression that people do not have any part in Christ unless they feel assurance. A person can have saving faith in Christ and yet never enjoy an assured hope like the Apostle Paul enjoyed. To believe and have a glimmering hope of acceptance is one thing, To have joy and peace and believing and to abound in hope is quite another. Romans 15, 13 All God's children have faith. Not all have assurance. This should never be forgotten. 
I know that some great and good men have held a different opinion. I believe that some excellent ministers of the gospel, at whose feet I would gladly sit, do not agree with the distinction I have stated. I desire to call no man master. I dread as much as anyone the idea of healing the wounds of conscience slightly. Jeremiah 8.11 But I think that any view other than that which I have given would be a most uncomfortable gospel to preach and one very likely to keep souls back a long time from the gate of life. I do not refrain from saying that by grace a person can have sufficient faith to flee to Christ, sufficient faith really to lay hold on Him, really to trust in Him, really to be a child of God, and really to be saved, and yet to His last day never be free from much anxiety, doubt, and fear. A letter, says an old writer, Thomas Watson, may be written which is not sealed, so grace may be written in the heart, yet the Spirit may not set the seal of assurance to it. A child may be born heir to a great fortune, and yet never be aware of his riches. He may live childish, die childish, and never know the greatness of his possessions. In the same way, a person can be an infant in Christ's family and can think as a baby, speak as a baby, and, though saved, never enjoy a strong hope, or know the real privileges of his inheritance. Let no one mistake my meaning when I dwell strongly on the reality, privilege, and importance of assurance. Do not do me the injustice to say that I teach that no one is saved unless they can say with Paul, I know and am persuaded that there is a crown laid up for me. I do not say so. I teach nothing of the kind. Beyond all question, a person must have faith in the Lord Jesus Christ if he is to be saved. I know no other way of access to the Father. I see no indication of mercy except through Christ. A person must feel his sins and lost condition, must come to Jesus for pardon and salvation, and must rest his hope on him and on him alone. If he only has faith to do this, however weak and feeble that faith may be, I will agree that based upon the word of God, he will not miss heaven. Let us never curtail the freeness of the glorious gospel or diminish its magnitude. Let us never make the gate more confined and the way narrower than pride and the love of sin have made it already. The Lord Jesus is very compassionate and of tender mercy. He does not regard the quantity of faith, but the quality. He does not measure its degree, but its truth. He will not break any bruised reed, nor quench any smoking flax. Isaiah 42.3 He will never let it be said that anyone perished at the foot of the cross. He that comes to me, he says, I will in no wise cast out. John 6.37 Yes, though one's faith is no bigger than a grain of mustard seed. Matthew 17.20 if it only brings him to Christ and enables him to touch the hem of his garment, Matthew 9, 21, 14, 35 through 36, he will be saved. He will be saved as certainly as the oldest saint in paradise. He will be saved as completely and eternally as Peter, John, or Paul. There are degrees in our sanctification, but there are none in our justification. What is written is written, and it will never fail. Whosoever believes on him, not whosoever has a strong and mighty faith, but whosoever believes on him shall not be ashamed. Romans 10.11 Remember, though, that all this time the poor believing soul might have no full assurance of his pardon and acceptance with God. He might be troubled with fear upon fear and doubt upon doubt. He might have many inward questions, concerns struggles and doubts, clouds and darkness, storm and tempest, to the very end. I will agree, I repeat, that plain, simple faith in Christ will save a person, even though he may never attain to assurance. But I will not agree that it will bring him to heaven with strong and abundant comfort. I will agree that it will land him safe in the harbor, but I will not agree that he will enter that harbor in full sail, confident and rejoicing. 
I will not be surprised if he reaches his desired haven weather-beaten and tempest-tossed, scarcely realizing his own safety until he opens his eyes in glory. I believe it is of great importance to keep this distinction between faith and assurance in view. It explains things that an inquirer in Christianity sometimes finds it hard to understand. Let us remember that faith is the root and assurance is the flower. You can never have the flower without the root, but it is just as certain that you can have the root and not the flower. Faith is that poor, trembling woman who came behind Jesus in the crowd and touched the hem of his garment, Mark 5.27. Assurance is Stephen standing calmly in the midst of his murderers, saying, I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God, Acts 7.56. Faith is the penitent thief crying, Lord, remember me, Luke 23.42. Assurance is Job sitting in the dust, covered with sores, saying, I know that my Redeemer lives, Job 19.25. Though he slay me, yet I will trust in him, Job 13.15. Faith is Peter's drowning cry as he began to sink, Lord, save me, Matthew 14.30. Assurance is that same Peter, later declaring before the council, This is the stone which was set at naught of you builders which has become the head of the corner. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men in which we can be saved. Acts 4, 11-12 Faith is the anxious, trembling voice, Lord, I believe. Help thou mine unbelief. Mark nine twenty four. Assurance is the confident challenge, Who shall accuse the chosen of God's elect? God is he that justifies them. Who is he that condemns them? Romans 8, 33 and 34. Faith is Saul praying in the house of Judas at Damascus, sorrowful, blind and alone. Acts 9, 11. Assurance is Paul, the aged prisoner, looking calmly into the grave and saying, I know whom I have believed. There is laid up for me a crown of righteousness. 2 Timothy 1, 12 and 4, 8. Faith is life. How great the blessing! Who can describe or realize the gulf between life and death? A living dog is better than a dead lion. Ecclesiastes 9.4 Life may be weak, frail, unhealthy, painful, trying, anxious, weary, burdensome, joyless, and smileless to the very end. Assurance is more than life. It is health, strength, power, vigor, activity, energy determination, and beauty. It is not a question of saved or not saved that lies before us, but of privilege or no privilege. It is not a question of peace or no peace, but of great peace or little peace. It is not a question between the wanderers of this world and the school of Christ, but it is one that belongs only to the school of Christ. It is between the beginning student and the wise. He who has faith does well. I would be happy if I thought all who read this book had faith. Blessed, thrice blessed, are they who believe. They are safe. They are washed. They are justified. They are beyond the power of hell. Satan, with all his malice, can never pluck them out of Christ's hand. He who has assurance, though, does far better. He sees more, feels more, knows more enjoys more, and has more days like those spoken of in Deuteronomy, even the days of the heavens upon the earth. Deuteronomy 11.21 3. I will now give some reasons why an assured hope is greatly to be desired. Please pay special attention to this point. I greatly wish that assurance was more desired than it is. Too many among those who believe begin doubting and go on doubting live doubting and die doubting, and they go to heaven in a kind of mist. It would not be good for me to belittle hopes and trusts, but I am afraid that many of us sit down content with them and go no further. I would like to see fewer who say, I hope so, in the Lord's family, and more who could say, I know and am persuaded. Oh, that all believers would desire the best gifts and not be content with less. 
Many miss the full tide of blessedness that the gospel was meant to convey. Many keep themselves in a low and starved condition of soul, while their Lord is saying, Eat, O friends, and drink abundantly, O beloved. Song of Solomon 5.1 And ask, and ye shall receive, that your joy may be fulfilled. John 16.24 Let us remember that assurance is to be desired because of the present comfort and peace it provides. Doubts and fears have power to ruin much of the happiness of a true believer in Christ. Uncertainty and suspense are bad enough in any condition. In the matter of our health, our property, our families, our affections, and our earthly callings, but they are never as bad as in the matter of our souls. As long as a believer cannot get beyond, I hope, or I trust, he obviously feels a degree of uncertainty about his spiritual state. The very words imply as much. He says, I hope, because he dares not say, I know. Assurance goes far to set a child of God free from this painful kind of bondage, and so ministers mightily to his comfort. It enables him to feel that the great business of life is settled, the great debt is paid, the great disease is healed, and the great work is finished. All other business, diseases, debts, and works are then small in comparison. In this way, assurance makes him patient in tribulation calm under bereavements, unmoved in sorrow, not afraid of bad news, and content in every condition, for it gives him firmness of heart. It sweetens his bitter cups. It lessens the burden of his crosses. It smooths the rough places over which he travels. It lightens the valley of the shadow of death. It makes him always feel that he has something solid beneath his feet and something firm under his hands. He knows that he has a sure friend along the way, and a sure home at the end. Footnote. Assurance will assist us in all duties. It will arm us against all temptations. It will answer all objections. It will sustain us in all conditions into which the saddest of times can bring us. If God be for us, who can be against us? Bishop Reynolds on Hosea 14. 1642. We cannot come amiss to him who has assurance. God is his. Has he lost a friend? His father lives. Has he lost an only child? God has given him his only son. Does he lack bread? God has given him the finest of the wheat, the bread of life. Are his comforts gone? He has a comforter. Does he meet with storms? He knows where to put in for harbor. God is his portion and heaven is his haven. Thomas Watson, 1662. Text resumes. Assurance will help a person bear poverty and loss. It will teach him to say, I know that I have in heaven a better and more enduring substance. I do not have silver and gold, but grace and glory are mine, and these can never make themselves wings and fly away. Because the fig tree shall not blossom, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. Habakkuk 3, 17-18 Assurance will support a child of God under the heaviest bereavements and help him to feel that it is well. 2 Kings 4, 26, NASB An assured soul will say, Though beloved ones are taken from me, yet Jesus is the same and is alive forevermore. Hebrews 13, 8 Christ, having been raised from the dead, dies no more. Romans 6, 9 Though my house is not as flesh and blood could wish, yet I have an everlasting covenant, ordered in all things, and it shall be kept. 2 Samuel 23.5 Assurance will enable a person to praise God and be thankful, even in prison, like Paul and Silas at Philippi. It can give a believer songs, even in the darkest night, Job 35.10. And it can provide joy when all things seem to be going against him. Job 35.10 and Psalm 42.8 Footnote These were John Bradford's words in prison, shortly before his execution. I have no request to make. If Queen Mary gives me my life, I will thank her. If she will banish me, I will thank her. If she will burn me, I will thank her. If she will condemn me to perpetual imprisonment, I will thank her.
This was Rutherford's experience when banished to Aberdeen. How blind are my adversaries, who sent me to a banqueting house, and not to a prison or a place of exile. My prison is a palace to me, and Christ's banqueting house. Letters Text resumes Assurance will enable a person to sleep even if facing the expectation of death soon, like Peter in Herod's dungeon. It will teach him to say, I will both lay me down in peace and sleep, for thou only, O Lord, dost make me to be confident. Psalm 4, eight. Assurance can make a person rejoice to suffer shame for Christ's sake, as the apostles did when put in prison at Jerusalem. Acts 5.41 it will remind him that he may rejoice and be exceeding glad, Matthew 5.12, and that there is in heaven an exceeding and eternal weight of glory that will make up for all our struggles and efforts and difficulties, 2 Corinthians 4.17. Assurance will enable a believer to meet a violent and painful death without fear, as Stephen did in the beginning of Christ's church, Acts 7, and as Cranmer, Ridley, Hooper, Latimer, Rogers, and Taylor did in England. It will bring to his heart the texts, Be not afraid of those that kill the body, and after that, have no more that they can do. Luke 12, 4. And Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Acts 7, 59. Footnote. These were the last words of Hugh McHale on the scaffold at Edinburgh, 1666. Now I begin my communion with God that shall never be broken off. Farewell, father and mother, friends and relations. Farewell, the world and all its delights. Farewell, meat and drinks. Farewell, sun and moon and stars. Welcome, God and Father. Welcome, sweet Lord Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant. Welcome, blessed Spirit of grace and God of all consolation. Welcome, glory. Welcome, eternal life. Welcome, death. O Lord, into thy hands I commit my spirit, for thou hast redeemed my soul, O Lord, God of truth. Text resumes. Assurance will support a person in pain and sickness, make up his bed, and smooth down his dying pillow. It will enable him to say, If my earthly house fails, I have a building of God. 2 Corinthians 5.1 I desire to depart and to be with Christ. Philippians 1.23 And my flesh and my heart fail. The strength of my heart is that God is my portion forever. Psalm 73.26 Footnote These were Samuel Rutherford's words on his deathbed. Oh, that all my brethren did know what a master I have served, and what peace I have this day. I shall sleep in Christ, and when I awake I shall be satisfied with his likeness. 1661. These were Richard Baxter's words on his deathbed. I bless God I have a well-grounded assurance of my eternal happiness and great peace and comfort within. 1691. Text resumes. The strong consolation that assurance can give in the hour of death is a point of great importance. We can depend on it that we will never think assurance is as precious as when our turn comes to die. In that awful hour, there are few believers who do not find out the value and privilege of an assured hope, whatever they may have thought about it during their lives. General hopes and trusts are all very well to live upon while the sun shines and the body is strong. But when we come to die, we will want to be able to say, I know and I feel. The river of death is a cold stream and we have to cross it alone. No earthly friend can help us. The last enemy, the king of terrors, is a strong foe. When our souls are departing, there is no comfort like the strong wine of assurance. There is a beautiful expression in the prayer book service for the visitation of the sick. The Almighty Lord, who is a most strong tower to all them that put their trust in Him, be now and evermore thy defense and make thee know and feel that there is no other name under heaven through whom ye may receive health and salvation, but only the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. The compilers of that service showed great wisdom there. They saw that when our eyes grow dim, the heart grows faint, and the spirit is on the eve of departing, 
We must know and feel what Christ has done for us, or else there cannot be perfect peace. Let us remember that assurance is to be desired because it tends to make a Christian an active, working Christian. Generally speaking, none do as much for Christ on earth as those who enjoy the fullest confidence of a free entrance into heaven, who trust not in their own works, but in the finished work of Christ. That sounds wonderful, I dare say, but it is true. A believer who lacks an assured hope will spend much of his time in inward searchings of heart about his own spiritual condition. Like a nervous hypochondriac, he will be full of his own ailments, his own doubtings and questionings, and his own conflicts and corruptions. Basically, you will often find he is so taken up with his internal warfare that he has little leisure for other things and little time to work for God. However, a believer who has, like Paul, an assured hope, is free from those harassing distractions. He does not trouble his soul with doubts about his own pardon and acceptance. He looks at the everlasting covenant sealed with blood, the finished work of Christ, and the never-broken word of his Lord and Savior, and therefore he considers his salvation settled. Thus he is able to give undivided attention to the work of the Lord and to do more in the long run. Consider, for example, two English immigrants settling down side by side in New Zealand or Australia. Give each of them a piece of land to clear and cultivate. Let the portions allotted to them be the same both in quantity and quality. Secure that land to them by every needful legal instrument. Let it be conveyed to them that they completely own it and it is theirs forever. Let the transfer of property be publicly registered and let the property be made sure to them by every deed and security that man's ingenuity can devise. Suppose then that one of them will set to work to clear his land and to bring it into cultivation, laboring at it day after day without intermission or cessation. Suppose in the meantime that the other person is continually leaving his work and going repeatedly to the public registry to ask whether the land really is his own whether there is not some mistake or whether there is not some flaw in the legal instruments that conveyed it to him. The one never doubts his title, but just diligently works on. The other hardly ever feels sure of his title, and he spends half his time in going to Sydney or Melbourne or Auckland with needless inquiries about it. Which of these two men will have made the most progress in a year's time? Who will have done the most for his land? got the greatest breadth of soil under tillage, have the best crops to show, and be altogether the most prosperous? Anyone with common sense could answer that question. I do not need to supply an answer. There can only be one reply. Undivided attention will always attain the greatest success. It is much the same in the matter of our title to mansions in the skies, John 14.2. No one will do as much for the Lord who bought him as the believer who sees his title clear and is not distracted by unbelieving doubts, questionings, and hesitations. The joy of the Lord will be that man's strength. Restore unto me, says David, the joy of your salvation. Then will I teach transgressors your ways. Psalm 51, 12-13, NASB Never were there such working Christians as the apostles. They seemed to live to labor. Christ's work was truly their meat and drink. They counted not their lives dear to themselves, Acts 20.24. 20, they spent and were spent. They laid down ease, health, and worldly comfort at the foot of the cross. One great cause of this, I believe, was their assured hope. They were men who could say, We know that we are of God, and the whole world lies in wickedness. 1 John 5.19 let us remember that assurance is to be desired because it tends to make a Christian a decided Christian. Indecision and doubt about our own state in God's sight is a shameful evil, and it is the mother of many evils. It often produces a wavering and unstable walk in following the Lord. Assurance helps to cut many knots and make the path of Christian duty clear and plain. Many who have hope that they are God's children and have true grace, however weak, are continually perplexed with doubts and points of practice. Should we do such and such a thing? 
Should we give up this family custom? Should we go into that group of people? How should we draw the line about visiting? What is to be the standard of our entertainment? And how do we dress? Are we never, under any circumstances, to dance? Never to touch a card? Never to attend parties of pleasure? These are the kinds of questions that seem to give them constant trouble. Very often, though, the simple root of their perplexity is that they do not feel assured that they are children of God. They have not yet settled the point of which side of the gate they are on. They do not know whether they are inside the ark or not. They believe that a child of God ought to act in a certain decided way, but they wonder if they are children of God themselves. If they only felt they were so, they would go straight forward and take a decided stand, but not being sure about it, their conscience is forever hesitating and coming to a deadlock. The devil whispers, Perhaps you are only a hypocrite. What right do you have to take a decided course? Wait until you really are a Christian. This whisper too often turns the scale and leads to some miserable compromise or wretched conformity to the world. I believe this is one main reason why so many today are inconsistent, uncertain, unsatisfactory, and half-hearted in their conduct about the world. Their faith fails. They have no assurance that they are Christ, so they are hesitant about breaking with the world. They hesitate from laying aside all the ways of the old men, because they are not quite confident that they have put on the new. I have little doubt that one secret cause of halting between two opinions is lack of assurance. When people can say decidedly, The Lord, He is the God, their course becomes very clear. 1 Kings 18.39 Finally, let us remember that assurance is to be desired because it tends to make the holiest Christians. This too sounds wonderful and strange, yet it is true. It is one of the paradoxes of the gospel, seemingly contrary at first to reason and common sense, yet it is a fact. Cardinal Bellarmine was seldom more contrary to the truth than when he said, Assurance tends to carelessness and sloth. He who is freely forgiven by Christ will always do much for Christ's glory, and he who enjoys the fullest assurance of this forgiveness will ordinarily keep up the closest walk with God. It is a faithful saying and worthy to be remembered by all believers that he who has this hope in him purifies himself, even as he is pure. 1 John 3, 3. A hope that does not purify is a mockery, a delusion, and a snare. None are so likely to maintain a watchful guard over their own hearts and lives as those who know the comfort of living in close communion with God. They know the benefit and will fear losing it. They will dread falling from the high position and ruining their own contentment by bringing clouds between themselves and Christ. He who goes on a journey with little money takes little thought of danger and cares little how late he travels. He, on the contrary, who carries gold and jewels, will be a cautious traveler. He will look well to his roads, his lodgings, and his company, and will run no risks. It is an old saying, however unscientific it may be, that the fixed stars are those that tremble most. The man who most fully enjoys the light of God's reconciled countenance will be a man tremblingly afraid of losing its blessed consolations and jealously fearful of doing anything to grieve the Holy Spirit. I recommend these four points for the serious consideration of all professing Christians. Would you like to feel the everlasting arms around you and hear the voice of Jesus daily drawing near to your soul and saying, I am your salvation? Psalm 35.3 NASB would you like to be a useful laborer in the vineyard in your day and generation? Would you like to be known by others as a bold, firm, decided, single-eyed, uncompromising follower of Christ? Do you want to be thoroughly spiritually minded and holy? I do not doubt that some readers will say, these are the very things our hearts desire. We long for them. We thirst after them, but they seem far from us. Has it never occurred to you that your neglect of assurance might possibly be the main reason for all your failures, that the low measure of faith that satisfies you might be the cause of your low degree of peace? Can you think it is strange that your graces are weak and fading 
when faith, the root and mother of them all, is allowed to remain feeble and weak. Take my advice today. Seek an increase of faith. Seek an assured hope of salvation like the Apostle Paul's. Seek to obtain a simple, childlike confidence in God's promises. Seek to be able to say with Paul, I know whom I have believed. I am persuaded that he is mine and I am his. 2 Timothy 1.12 Song of Solomon 2.16 You have very likely tried other ways and methods and have completely failed. Change your plan. Change your course. Lay aside your doubts. Lean more entirely on the Lord's arm. Begin with complete trust. Cast aside your faithless lack of progress and take the Lord at His word. Come and cast yourself, your soul, and your sins upon your gracious Savior. Begin with simple believing and all other things will soon be added to you. 4. Now I will point out some probable causes why an assured hope is so seldom attained. This is a very serious question and ought to cause all of us to deeply and seriously search our hearts. Certainly, few of Christ's people seem to reach up to this blessed spirit of assurance. Many comparatively believe, but few are convinced. Many comparatively have saving faith, but few have that glorious confidence that shines forth in the language of Paul. I think we must all agree that this is the case. Why is this so? Why is something that two apostles have strongly urged us to seek after, something that few believers have experienced and know in our day? Why is an assured hope so rare? I desire to offer a few suggestions on this point with all humility. I know that many at whose feet I would gladly sit both in earth and heaven have never attained assurance. Perhaps the Lord sees something in the natural disposition of some of His children that makes assurance not good for them. Maybe in order to be kept in spiritual health, they need to be kept very low. God only knows. Still, after every allowance, I am afraid that there are many believers without an assured hope, whose case may too often be explained by causes such as those listed below. One common cause is a defective view of the doctrine of justification. I'm inclined to think that justification and sanctification are unintentionally mixed together in the minds of many believers. They receive the gospel truth that there must be something done in us as well as something done for us if we are true members of Christ, and in this they are right. Maybe without being aware of it, they seem to pick up the idea that their justification is in some degree affected by something within themselves. They do not clearly see that Christ's work and not their own work either in whole or in part, either directly or indirectly, is the only ground of their acceptance with God. They do not see that justification is something entirely outside our ability, for which nothing whatsoever is necessary on our part except simple faith, and that the weakest believer is as fully and completely justified as the strongest. Many people seem to forget that we are saved and justified as sinners and only sinners, and that we can never attain to anything higher even if we would live to the age of Methuselah. Redeemed sinners, justified sinners, and renewed sinners we doubtless must be, but sinners, 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 we will be always to the very end. They do not seem to understand that there is a vast difference between our justification and our sanctification. Our justification is a perfect finished work, and it does not come in varying degrees. Our sanctification is imperfect and incomplete and will be so to the last hour of our lives. Some people seem to think that a believer can at some point in his life be somewhat free from corruption and attain to a kind of inward perfection. However, not finding this angelic state of things in their own hearts, they at once conclude that there must be something very wrong with them, and so they go mourning all their days, oppressed with fears that they have no part or inheritance in Christ, and they refuse to be comforted. Let us consider this point well. If any believing soul desires assurance and does not have it, let him ask himself first if he is quite sure that he is sound in the faith, if he knows how to distinguish things that differ, and if his eyes are thoroughly clear in the matter of justification. 
he must know what it is simply to believe and to be justified by faith before he can expect to feel assured. In this matter, as well as in many others, the old Galatian heresy is the most fertile source of error, both in doctrine and in practice. Scripture, are ye so foolish? Having begun by the Spirit, are ye now made perfect by the flesh? Galatians 3.3 3. People ought to seek clearer views of Christ and what Christ has done for them. Happy is the person who really understands justification by faith without the deeds of the law. Romans 3.20 Another common cause of the absence of assurance is slothfulness about growth in grace. I think many true believers hold dangerous and unscriptural views on this point. I do not mean they do so intentionally, but they do hold them. Many people seem to think that once they are converted, they do not have much more to attend to. They think that a state of salvation is a kind of easy chair in which they can just sit still, lie back, and be happy. They seem to think that grace is given to them that they may enjoy it, and they forget that it is given, like a talent, to be used employed, and improved. Such people lose sight of the many direct commands to increase, to grow, to abound more and more, to add to our faith and similar commands, and in this condition of doing little, this state of mind of sitting still, I never marvel that they miss assurance. I believe it should be our continual aim and desire to go forward, and our watchword on every returning birthday and at the beginning of every year should be, continue to grow. 1 Thessalonians 4.1 We should desire more knowledge, more faith, more obedience, and more love. If we have brought forth thirtyfold, we should seek to bring forth sixty. If we have brought forth sixty, we should strive to bring forth a hundred. Matthew 13.23 The will of the Lord is our sanctification, and it ought to be our will too. 1 Thessalonians 4.3 one thing that we can depend upon is that there is an inseparable connection between diligence and assurance. Give all the more diligence, says Peter, to make your calling and election sure. 2 Peter 1.10 We desire, writes the author of Hebrews, that each one of you show the same diligence until the end for the fulfillment of your hope. Hebrews 6.11 The soul of the diligent, says Solomon, shall be made fat. Proverbs 13.4 there is much truth in the old maxim of the Puritans. Faith of adherence comes by hearing, but faith of assurance does not come without doing. Is any reader of this book one of those who desires assurance but does not have it? Mark my words, you will never get it without diligence, however much you may desire it. There are no gains without pains in spiritual things, any more than in worldly things. The soul of the sluggard desires and attains nothing. Proverbs 13.4 Another common cause of a lack of assurance is an inconsistent walk in life. With grief and sorrow, I feel constrained to say that I am afraid that nothing more frequently prevents people from attaining an assured hope than an inconsistent life. The stream of professing Christianity in this day is far wider than it formerly was, and I am afraid we must admit that it is also much shallower. Inconsistency of life is utterly destructive of peace of conscience. The two things are incompatible. They cannot and will not go together. If you intend to have your besetting sins and cannot make up your minds to give them up, if you will refrain from cutting off the right hand and plucking out the right eye when occasion requires it, then I will presume that you will have no assurance. A hesitant, undecided walk a reluctance to take a bold and decided line, a readiness to conform to the world, an uncertain witness for Christ, a lingering tone of Christianity, and avoiding a high standard of holiness in spiritual life all make up a sure recipe for bringing an affliction upon the garden of your soul. It is useless to think that you will feel assured and persuaded of your own pardon and acceptance with God unless you regard all God's commandments concerning all things to be right and hate every sin, whether great or small. Scripture, I have esteemed all thy precepts concerning all things to be right, and I have hated every false way. Psalm 119, 128. 
One Achan allowed in the camp of your heart will weaken your hands and lay your means of comfort low in the dust. Joshua 7 You must be daily sowing to the Spirit if you are to reap the witness of the Spirit. You will not find and feel that all the Lord's ways are ways of pleasantness. Proverbs 3.17 Unless you labor in all your ways to please the Lord. Footnote Would you have your hope strong? Then keep your conscience pure. Thou cannot defile one without weakening the other. The godly person who is loose and careless in his holy walking will soon find his hope languishing. All sin disposes the soul that tampers with it to trembling fears and shakings of heart. William Gurnall One great and too common cause of distress is the secret maintaining of some known sin. It puts out the eye of the soul or dims it and stupefies it so that it can neither see nor feel its own condition, but especially it provokes God to withdraw himself, his comforts, and the assistance of his spirit. Richard Baxter's Saints' Everlasting Rest The stars that have least circuit are nearest the pole, and men whose hearts are least entangled with the world are always nearest to God and to the assurance of his favor. Worldly Christians remember this, You and the world must part, or else assurance and your souls will never meet. Thomas Brooks Text resumes. I thank God that our salvation in no way depends on our own works. By grace we are saved, not by works of righteousness, but through faith, without the deeds of the law. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, Titus 3, 5, Romans 3, 28. Never, though, would I want any believer to forget for a moment that our sense of salvation depends much on the manner of our living. Inconsistency will dim our eyes and bring clouds between us and the sun. The sun is the same behind the clouds, but you will not be able to see its brightness or enjoy its warmth, and your soul will be gloomy and cold. It is in the path of holy living that the dayspring of assurance will visit you and shine down upon your heart. Scripture The secret of the Lord is for those that fear Him, and He will show them His covenant. Psalm 25.14 To him that orders his ways aright, I will show the salvation of God. Psalm 50.23 Those who love thy law have great peace, and nothing shall cause them to stumble. Psalm 119.165 If we walk in the light, as He is in the light, we have communion with Him in the midst of us. 1 John 1, 7. Let us not love in word, neither in tongue, but in deed and in truth. And in this we know that we are of the truth and have our hearts certified before him. 1 John 3, 18 and 19. And in this we do know that we have known him if we keep his commandments. 1 John 2, 3. Paul was a man who applied himself to always have a conscience void of offense toward God and toward man. Acts 24.16 He could say with boldness, I have fought a good fight. I have kept the faith. 2 Timothy 4.7 I do not therefore wonder that the Lord enabled him to add with confidence, From now on there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day. 2 Timothy 4.8 If any believer in the Lord Jesus desires assurance and does not have it, let him think over this point also. Let him look at his own heart, his own conscience, his own life, his own ways, and his own home. Perhaps when he has done that, he will be able to say, There is a reason why I have no assured hope. I leave the three matters I have just mentioned to the individual consideration of every reader. I am sure they are worth examining. May we examine them honestly, and may the Lord give us understanding in all things. To the unsaved In closing this important inquiry, let me speak first to those who have not yet given themselves to the Lord, to those who have not yet come out from the world, chosen the good part, and followed Christ. I ask you to learn the advantages and comforts of a true Christian. I do not want you to judge the Lord Jesus Christ by his people. The best servants can only give you a poor idea of that glorious master. Nor do I want you to judge of the benefits and advantages of his kingdom by the measure of comfort to which many of his people attain. 
Sadly, most of us are poor creatures. We come very short of the blessedness we might enjoy. You can depend upon it, though, that there are glorious things in the city of our God that they who have an assured hope taste, even in this lifetime. There are lengths and breadths of peace and consolation there that it has not entered into your heart to conceive. There is bread enough and to spare in our Father's house, even though many of us certainly eat but little of it and continue weak. The Master must not be blamed, for it is our own fault. After all, the weakest child of God has a wealth of comforts within him of which you know nothing. You see the conflicts and struggles of the surface of his heart, but you do not see the pearls of great price that are hidden in the depths below. The weakest member of Christ would not change places with you. The believer who possesses the least assurance is far better off than you are. He has a hope, however faint, but you have none at all. He has a portion that will never be taken from him, a Savior who will never be taken from him, a Savior that will never forsake him, a treasure that will never fade away, however little he may realize it all at present. But as for you, if you die as you are, your expectations will all perish. Oh, that you were wise. Oh, that you understood these things. Oh, that you would consider your latter end. I feel deeply for you in these latter days of the world. I feel sad for those whose treasure is all on earth and whose hope is all on this side of the grave. Yes, for when I see old kingdoms and dynasties shaken to the very foundation, when I see, as we all have a few years ago, kings and princes and rich men and great men fleeing for their lives and scarcely knowing where to hide their heads, when I see property dependent on public confidence melting like snow in the spring, when I see public stocks and funds losing their value, when I see these things, I feel sorry for those who have nothing better than this world can give them and who have no place in the kingdom that will never end. Take advice from a minister of Christ this very day. Seek durable riches, a treasure that cannot be taken from you, and a city that has lasting foundations. Hebrews 11.10 Do as the Apostle Paul did. Give yourself to the Lord Jesus Christ and seek that incorruptible crown he is ready to bestow. Take his yoke upon you and learn of him. Matthew 11.29 Come away from a world that will never really satisfy you and depart from sin that will bite like a serpent if you hold on to it. Come to the Lord Jesus as lowly sinners and he will receive you, pardon you, give you his renewing spirit and fill you with peace. This will give you more real comfort than the world has ever done. There is a void in your heart that nothing but the peace of Christ can fill. Enter in and share our joys. Come with us and sit down by our side. To the saved. Lastly, let me turn to all believers who read these pages and speak to them a few words of brotherly counsel. The main thing that I urge upon you is this. If you do not have an assured hope of your own acceptance in Christ, resolve this day to seek it, labor for it, Strive after it, pray for it, give the Lord no rest until you know whom you have believed. 2 Timothy 1.12 I really think that the small amount of assurance today among those who are considered to be God's children is a shame and a reproach. It is a thing to be greatly regretted, says Robert Trail, that many Christians have lived twenty or forty years since Christ called them by His grace, yet doubting in their life. Let us call to mind the earnest desire expressed that every one of the Hebrews should seek after full assurance, and let us endeavor, by God's blessing, to roll this reproach away. Hebrews 6.11 Believing reader, do you really mean to say that you have no desire to exchange hope for confidence, trust for persuasion, and uncertainty for knowledge? Because weak faith will save you, Will you therefore rest content with it? Because assurance is not essential to your entrance into heaven, will you therefore be satisfied without it upon earth? This is not a healthy condition for your soul to be in, 
This is not how Christians thought in the apostolic days. Arise at once and go forward. Do not remain stuck at the foundation of Christianity. Go on to perfection. Do not be content with a day of small things. Never despise it in others, but never be content with it yourself. Believe me, assurance is worth seeking. You forsake your own mercies when you rest content without it. The things I speak are for your peace. If it is good to be certain in earthly things, how much better is it to be sure in heavenly things? Your salvation is a fixed and certain thing. God knows it. Why would you not seek to know it too? There is nothing unscriptural in this. Paul never saw the book of life, and yet Paul says, I know and am persuaded. 2 Timothy 1.12 Make it, then, your daily prayer to have an increase of faith. According to your faith be your peace. Cultivate that blessed root more, and sooner or later, by God's blessing, you may hope to have the flower. You might not attain to full assurance all at once. It is good sometimes to be kept waiting. We do not value things that we get without any effort. Though it tarry, wait for it. Habakkuk 2.3 Keep seeking and expect to find. There is one thing, however, of which I do not want you to be ignorant. You must not be surprised if you have occasional doubts after you have gotten assurance. You must not forget that you are on earth and not in heaven. You are still in the body and have indwelling sin. The flesh will lust against the spirit to the very end. The leprosy will never be out of the walls of the old house until death takes it down. Leviticus 14 There is a devil, too, a strong devil. He is a devil who tempted the Lord Jesus and caused Peter to fall, and he wants you to know it. There will always be some doubts. He who never doubts has nothing to lose. He who never fears possesses nothing truly valuable. He who is never jealous knows little of deep love. Do not be discouraged. You will be more than conquerors through him who loved you. Romans 8.37 Finally, do not forget that assurance is something that can be lost for a time, even by the brightest Christians, unless they are careful. Assurance is a most delicate plant. It needs daily, hourly watching, watering, tending, and cherishing. Watch and pray even more when you have it. As Samuel Rutherford says, make much of assurance. Be always upon your guard. When Christian slept in the arbor in Pilgrim's Progress, he lost his certificate. Keep that in mind. David lost assurance for many months by falling into transgression. Peter lost it when he denied his Lord. Both undoubtedly found it again, but not until after bitter tears. Spiritual darkness comes on horseback and goes away on foot. It is upon us before we know that it is coming. It leaves us slowly, gradually, and not until after many days. It is easy to run downhill. It is hard work to climb up. Remember my caution. When you have the joy of the Lord, watch and pray. Above all, grieve not the Spirit. Ephesians 4.30 Quench not the Spirit. 1 Thessalonians 5.19 Do not distress the Spirit. Do not drive Him away by messing around with small bad habits and little sins. Little clashings between husbands and wives make unhappy homes, and small inconsistencies, known and allowed, will bring in a lack of familiarity between you and the Spirit. The conclusion of the entire sermon is heard. Ecclesiastes 12.13 the person who walks with God in Christ will generally be kept most closely in the greatest peace. The believer who follows the Lord most fully and strives for the highest degree of holiness will, ordinarily, enjoy the most assured hope and have the clearest certainty of his own salvation. Chapter 8 Moses, an Example By faith, 
Moses, when he was come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. Esteeming the reproach of the Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt, for he had respect unto the recompense of the reward. Hebrews 11, 24-26 The characters of God's most eminent saints, as seen and described in the Bible, form a most useful part of the Holy Scripture. Abstract doctrines, principles, and precepts are all most valuable in their way, but nothing is more helpful than a pattern or example. Do we want to know what practical holiness is? Let us sit down and study the picture of an eminently holy man. I propose to set before my readers the history of a man who lived by faith and left us a pattern of what faith can do in promoting holiness of character. To all who want to know what living by faith means, I offer Moses as an example. The eleventh chapter of Hebrews, from which my text is taken, is a great chapter. It deserves to be printed in golden letters. I can well believe it must have been most comforting and encouraging to a converted Jew. I suppose no members of the early church found as much difficulty in a profession of Christianity as the Hebrews did. The way was narrow to all, but preeminently so to them. The cross was heavy to all, but surely they had to carry twice the weight. This chapter would refresh them. It would be as wine unto those that have heavy hearts. Proverbs 31.6 Its words would be as pleasant as a honeycomb, sweet to the soul and medicine to the bones. Proverbs 16.24 The three verses I am going to explain are far from being the least interesting in the chapter. Indeed, I think few, if any, have so strong a claim on our attention, and I will explain why I say so. It seems to me that the work of faith described in the story of Moses comes home more especially to our own case. The men of God who are named in the former part of the chapters are all beyond question examples to us, but we cannot literally do what most of them did, no matter how much our spirit may be similar to theirs. We are not called upon to offer a literal sacrifice like Abel, build a literal ark like Noah, or literally leave our country, live in tents, and offer up our Isaac like Abraham. The faith of Moses comes near to us. It seems to operate in a way more familiar to our own experience. It made him live in such a way as we must sometimes live ourselves in the present day each in our own walk of life, if we want to be consistent Christians. It is for this reason that I think these three verses deserve more than ordinary consideration. I have nothing but the simplest things to say about them. I will only try to show the greatness of the things Moses did and the principle on which he did them. Then we might be better prepared for the practical instruction that the verses appear to provide to everyone who will receive it. First, I will speak of what Moses gave up and refused. Moses gave up three things for the sake of his soul. He felt that his soul would not be saved if he kept them, so he gave them up. And in so doing, I say that he made three of the greatest sacrifices that man's heart can possibly make. Let us see. He gave up power and greatness. He refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. We all know his history. The daughter of Pharaoh had preserved his life when he was an infant. She had even adopted him and educated him as her own son. According to some writers of history, she was Pharaoh's only child. Some go so far as to say that in the common order of things, Moses would one day have been the king of Egypt. That may or may not be, we cannot say. It is enough for us to know that based upon his connection with Pharaoh's daughter, Moses might have been, if he had wanted to be, a very great man. If he had been content with the position in which he found himself at the Egyptian court, he might easily have been among the greatest, if not the very greatest, in all the land of Egypt. Let us consider for a moment how great this temptation was. He was a man with the same passions as we have. 
he might have had as much greatness as earth can well give. Position, power, place, honor, titles, and dignities were all before him and within his grasp. These are the things for which many people are continually struggling. These are the prizes for which there is an incessant race in the world around us to obtain. To be somebody, to be looked up to, to raise themselves in society, to gain power. These are the very things for which many sacrifice time, thought, health, and life itself. But Moses would not take them as a gift. He turned his back upon them. He refused them. He gave them up. Even more than this, Moses refused pleasure. Pleasure of every kind, no doubt, was at his feet if he had wanted to take it up. Sensual pleasure, intellectual pleasure, social pleasure, whatever he could imagine. Egypt was a land of artists, a residence of intellectual men, a resort of everyone who had skill or science of any description. There was nothing that could feed the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life that someone in Moses' position might not easily have commanded and possessed as his own. 1 John 2.16 Let us think again how great this temptation was also. Pleasure is the one thing for which millions live. They differ, perhaps, in their views of what makes up real pleasure, but all agree in seeking first and foremost to obtain it. Pleasure and enjoyment in the holidays is the great object to which many schoolchildren look forward. Pleasure and satisfaction in making himself independent is the mark on which many young men and women in business fix their eyes. Pleasure and ease in retiring from business with a fortune is the aim that the businessman sets before him. Pleasure and bodily comfort at his own home is what the poor man desires. Pleasure and fresh excitement in politics, traveling, amusement, friends, and books is the goal toward which the rich person is striving. Pleasure is the shadow that all alike are hunting, high and low, rich and poor, old and young, one with another each perhaps pretending to despise his neighbor for seeking it, each in his own way seeking it for himself, each secretly wondering why he does not find it, and each firmly persuaded that somewhere or other it is to be found. This was the cup that Moses had before his lips. He might have drunk as deeply as he liked of earthly pleasure, but he refused it. He turned his back upon it. He gave it up. Moses also refused riches. The treasures in Egypt is an expression that seems to tell of boundless wealth that Moses might have enjoyed if he had been content to remain with Pharaoh's daughter. We might well suppose that these treasures would have been a mighty fortune. Enough is still remaining in Egypt to give us a little idea of the money at its king's disposal. The pyramids, obelisks, temples, and statues are still standing there as witnesses. The ruins at Karnak, Luxor, Dendera, and many other places are still the mightiest buildings in the world. They testify to this day that the man who gave up Egyptian wealth gave up something that even our own minds would find it hard to calculate and estimate. Let us consider once more how great this temptation was. Let us consider the power of money for a moment, the immense influence that the love of money has in people's minds. Let us look around us and observe how people covet it and what amazing effort and trouble they will go through to obtain it. Tell them of an island many thousand miles away where something may be found that might be profitable if imported, and at once a fleet of ships will be sent to get it. Show them a way to make one percent more of their money, and they will consider you among the wisest of people. They will, almost, fall down and worship you. To possess money seems to hide defects, to cover faults, and to clothe a person with virtues. People can look past much if you are rich, but Moses is a man who could have been rich, but refused the wealth. 
He did not want Egyptian treasures. He turned his back upon them. He refused them. He gave them up. These were the things that Moses refused. Power, pleasure, riches, all three at once. Add to all this that he did it deliberately. He did not refuse these things in a hasty fit of youthful excitement. He was forty years old. He was in the prime of life. He knew what he was about. He was a highly educated man, taught in all the wisdom of the Egyptians. Acts 7.22 He could weigh both sides of the question. In addition to this, Moses did not refuse them because he was required to. He was not like the dying man who tells us that he desires nothing more in this world simply because he is leaving the world and cannot keep it. Moses was not like the poor man who makes a virtue of necessity and says he does not want riches because he cannot get them. He was not like the old man who boasts that he has laid aside worldly pleasures because he is worn out and cannot enjoy them. No, Moses refused what he could have enjoyed. Power, pleasure, and riches did not leave him, but he left them. You may judge whether or not I am right in saying that his was one of the greatest sacrifices mortal man ever made. Others have refused much, but none, I think, have refused as much as Moses. Others have done well in the way of self-sacrifice and self-denial, but he excels them all. The second thing I want to consider is what Moses chose. I think his choices were as wonderful as his refusals. He chose three things for his soul's sake. The road to salvation led through them, and he followed it. In doing so, he chose three of the last things that we are willing to take up. For one thing, he chose suffering and affliction. He left the ease and comfort of Pharaoh's court and openly took part with the children of Israel. They were enslaved and persecuted, an object of distrust, suspicion, and hatred and anyone who befriended them was sure to taste something of the bitter cup that they were daily drinking. To the eye of sense, there seemed no chance of their deliverance from Egyptian bondage without a long and doubtful struggle. A settled home and country for them must have appeared to be something never likely to be obtained, however much desired. In fact, if ever anyone seemed to be openly choosing pain, trials, poverty, need, distress, anxiety, and perhaps even death, Moses was that man. Let us think how wonderful this choice was. Flesh and blood naturally try to avoid pain. It is in us all to do so. We draw back from suffering by a kind of instinct, and we avoid it if we can. If two courses of action were set before us that both seem right, we generally take the one which is least disagreeable to flesh and blood. We spend our days in fear and anxiety when we think affliction is coming near us, and we use every means to escape it. When it does come, we often worry and complain under its burden. And if we do happen to bear it patiently, we consider it a great victory. But look here. Here is a man with the same emotions and feelings as we have, and he actually chose affliction. Moses saw the cup of suffering that was before him if he left Pharaoh's court, and he chose it, preferred it, and embraced it. Even more than this, he chose the company of a despised people. He left the society of the great and wise among whom he had been brought up, and joined himself to the children of Israel. He who had lived from infancy in the midst of power, riches, and luxury came down from his high position and cast in his lot with poor men, slaves, serfs, bondservants, oppressed, destitute, afflicted, tormented, laborers in the brick kiln. How wonderful this choice was! We generally think it is enough for us to carry our own troubles. We might be sorry for others who are lowly and despised. We might even try to help them. We might donate some money or even speak up on their behalf. But we generally stop there. Here, though, is a man who does far more. Moses does not merely feel sorry for despised Israel. 
but he actually goes down to them, adds himself to their society, and lives with them. You would be surprised if some famous person in Washington, D.C. or London were to give up house, fortune, and position in society and go live on a small income on some crowded street in the inner city for the sake of doing good. This would convey a very faint and feeble notion of the kind of thing that Moses did. He saw a despised people, and he chose their company in preference to that of the noblest in the land. He became one of them, their fellow, their companion in tribulation, their ally, their associate, and their friend. But he did even more. He chose reproach and scorn. Who can imagine the flood of derision and ridicule that Moses would have had to face in turning away from Pharaoh's court to join Israel? People would tell him he was crazy, foolish, weak, insensible, and out of his mind. He would lose his influence. He would forfeit the favor and good opinion of all among whom he had lived. But none of these things moved him. He left the court and joined the slaves. What a choice this was. There are few things more powerful than ridicule and scorn. These can do far more than blatant hate and persecution. Many men who would march up to a cannon's mouth, lead a hopeless mission, or storm a breach have found it impossible to face the mockery of a few companions and have flinched from the path of duty to avoid it. To be laughed at, to be made a joke of, to be ridiculed and taunted, to be considered weak and stupid, to be thought a fool. There was nothing grand in all this, and many cannot make up their minds to face it. Yet here is a man who made up his mind to willingly face it, and he did not withdraw from the trial. Moses saw reproach and scorn before him, and he chose to accept them for his portion in life. Moses chose affliction the company of a despised people, and scorn. Realize, too, that Moses was not a weak, ignorant, illiterate person who did not know what he was doing. We are specifically told that he was mighty in his words and in deeds, Acts 7.22, and yet he still chose as he did. Consider, too, the circumstances of his choice. He was not required to choose as he did. No one forced him to take such a course. The things he chose did not force themselves upon him against his will. He went after them. They did not come after him. All that he did, he did of his own free choice, voluntarily, and of his own accord. You can judge whether or not it is true that his choices were as wonderful as his refusals. Since the world began, I suppose, no one ever made such a choice as Moses did, as revealed in our text. Now I will speak of the beliefs and values that caused Moses to do as he did. How can his conduct be accounted for? What possible reason can be given for it? To refuse that which is generally called good, and to choose that which is commonly thought evil, is not the way of flesh and blood. This is not the typical manner of man. This requires some explanation. What will that explanation be? We have the answer in the text. I do not know whether its greatness or its simplicity is more to be admired. It all lies in one little word, and that word is faith. Moses had faith. Faith was the driving force behind his wonderful conduct. Faith made him do as he did, choose what he chose, and refuse what he refused. He did it all because he believed. God set before the eyes of his mind his own will and purpose. God revealed to Moses that a Savior was to be born of the descendants of Israel, that mighty promises were bound up in these children of Abraham and yet to be fulfilled, and that the time for fulfilling a portion of these promises was at hand. Moses put credit in this and believed. Every step in his wonderful career Every action in his journey through life after leaving Pharaoh's court, his choice of that which seemed evil to others, his refusal of that which seemed good, all must be traced to this fountain. All will be found to rest on this foundation. 
God had spoken to Moses, and he had faith in God's word. He believed that God would keep his promises. He believed that God would do what he had said, and that what he had covenanted he would surely perform. Moses believed that with God nothing was impossible. Reason and sense might say that the deliverance of Israel was out of the question because the obstacles were too many and the difficulties too great. But faith told Moses that God was all-sufficient. God had undertaken the work, and it would be done. Moses believed that God was all-wise. Reason and sense might have told him that his line of action was absurd that he was throwing away useful influence and destroying all chance of benefiting his people by breaking with Pharaoh's daughter. But faith told Moses that if God said, Go this way, it must be the best. Moses believed that God was all-merciful. Reason and sense might suggest that a more pleasant manner of deliverance could be found, that some compromise might be reached and that many hardships might be avoided. But faith told Moses that God was love and that he would not give his people one drop of bitterness beyond what was absolutely needed. Faith was a telescope to Moses. It made him see the good land of far off. He saw rest, peace, and victory when weak-sided reason could only see trial and barrenness, storm and tempest, weariness and pain. Faith was an interpreter to Moses. It made him pick out a comfortable meaning in the dark commands of God's handwriting, while ignorant sense could see nothing in it but mystery and foolishness. Faith told Moses that all this power and greatness was of the earth, worldly, a poor, vain, empty thing, frail, fleeting, and passing away. Moses saw by faith that there was no true greatness like that of serving God. God was the king, and Moses was the true nobleman who belonged to the family of God. It was better to be the lowest in heaven than the greatest in hell. Faith told Moses that worldly pleasures were pleasures of sin. They were mingled with sin, they led to sin, they were ruinous to the soul, and they were displeasing to God. It would be little comfort to have pleasure while God was against him. It is better to suffer and obey God than to be at ease and sin. Faith told Moses that these pleasures were only temporary. They could not last. They were all short-lived. They would soon weary him. He would have to leave them all in a few years. Faith told him that there was a reward in heaven for the believer far richer than the treasures in Egypt, durable riches that rust could not corrupt and where thieves could not break through and steal. Matthew 6, 19 through 20. The crown there would be incorruptible, and the weight of glory would be exceeding and eternal. 1 Corinthians 9, 25, 2 Corinthians 4, 17. Faith moved Moses to look away to an unseen heaven rather than have his eyes impressed with Egyptian gold. Faith told Moses that affliction and suffering were not real evils. They were part of the school of God in which he trains the children of grace for glory. There were the medicines that are needed to purify our corrupt wills, the furnace that must burn away our dross, and the knife that must cut the ties that bind us to the world. Faith told Moses that the despised Israelites were the chosen people of God. He believed that to them belonged the adoption, the covenant, the promises, and the glory. Moses believed that from them the seed of the woman was one day to be born who would bruise the serpent's head, that the special blessing of God was upon them, that they were lovely and beautiful in his eyes, and that it was better to be a doorkeeper among the people of God than to reign in the palaces of wickedness. Faith told Moses that all the reproach and scorn poured out on him was the reproach of the Christ that it was honorable to be mocked and despised for Christ's sake, that whoever persecuted Christ's people was persecuting Christ himself, and that the day must come when his enemies would bow before him and lick the dust. Moses saw all this and much more by faith. 
These were the things he believed, and believing, he did what he did. He was convinced of them, and embraced them. He considered them as certainties. He regarded them as actual truths, and he accepted them as certainly as if he had seen them with his own eyes. Moses acted on them as realities, and this made him the man that he was. He had faith. He believed. Do not be amazed that he refused greatness, riches, and pleasure. He looked far forward. With the eye of faith, Moses saw kingdoms crumbling into dust, riches taking to themselves wings and fleeing away, pleasures leading on to death and judgment, and only Christ and his little flock enduring forever. Do not be surprised that Moses chose affliction, a despised people, and reproach. He beheld things below the surface. With the eye of faith he saw affliction lasting only for a moment, reproach rolled away and ending in everlasting honor, and the despised people of God reigning as kings with Christ in glory. Was he not right? Does he not speak to us, though dead this very day? The name of Pharaoh's daughter is forgotten. The city where Pharaoh reigned is not known. The treasures in Egypt are gone, but the name of Moses is known wherever the Bible is read and is still a standing witness that he who lives by faith is blessed. Now I will wind this all up by trying to set forth some practical lessons that appear as legitimate consequences from this history of Moses. What does all this have to do with us? Some people will say that we do not live in Egypt, we have seen no miracles, and we are not Israelites. Stay a little longer if this is what you're thinking, and by God's help I will show you that we can all learn and be instructed here. Let him who wants to live a Christian life and really be holy take notice of the history of Moses and get wisdom. For one thing, if you ever want to be saved, you must make the choice that Moses made. You must choose God instead of the world. Pay careful attention to what I say. Do not overlook this, though all the rest be forgotten. I do not say that the statesman must give up his office, or that the rich man must forsake his possessions. Let no one think that I mean this. I am saying that if a person desires to be saved, no matter what his position in life is, he must be prepared for tribulation. He must make up his mind to choose much that seems troublesome, and to give up and refuse much that seems good and beneficial. This probably sounds strange to some who read these pages. I know that you might have a certain form of religion and are content in your way. There is a common, worldly kind of Christianity today that many have and think is enough. It is a cheap Christianity that offends no one and is worth nothing. I am not speaking of religion of this kind. However, if you really are sincere about your soul, if your Christianity is something more than a mere fashionable Sunday coat, if you are determined to live by the Bible, and if you are resolved to be a New Testament Christian, then you will soon learn that you must carry a cross. You must endure difficult things. You must suffer on behalf of your soul as Moses did, or you cannot be saved. The world in this century is what it always was. The hearts of people are still the same. The offense of the cross has not ceased. God's true people are still a despised little flock. True evangelical religion still brings with it reproach and scorn. A real servant of God will still be thought by many to be a weak enthusiast and a fool. It all comes down to this. Do you want your soul to be saved? Then remember, you must choose whom you will serve. You cannot serve God and the world. You cannot be on two sides at once. You cannot be a friend of Christ and a friend of the world at the same time. You must come out from the children of this world and be separate. You must put up with much ridicule, trouble, and opposition, or you will be lost forever. You must be willing to think and do things that the world considers foolish. You must be willing to hold opinions that are only held by a few. It will cost you something. The stream is strong and you must go against it. 
The way is narrow and steep, and it is no use to say it is not. You can depend on it, though, that there can be no saving Christianity without sacrifices and self-denial. Are you now making any sacrifices? Does your Christianity cost you anything? I set the matter before your conscience in all affection and tenderness. Are you, like Moses, preferring God to the world or not? I beg you not to take shelter under that dangerous word, we, we should, we hope, we intend, and the like. I ask you plainly, what are you doing yourself? Are you willing to give up anything that keeps you back from God? Are you clinging to the Egypt of the world and saying to yourself, I must have it, I must have it, I cannot give it up? Is there any cross in your Christianity? Are there any sharp corners in your Christianity, anything that ever clashes and comes in collision with the earthly mindedness around you? Or is it all smooth and rounded off and comfortably fitted into custom and fashion? Do you know anything of the afflictions of the gospel? Is your faith and practice ever a subject of scorn and reproach? Are you thought a fool by anyone because of your soul? Have you left Pharaoh's daughter? and wholeheartedly join the people of God. Are you casting all on Christ? Search and see. These are difficult inquiries and rough questions. I cannot help it. I believe they are founded on biblical truths. Remember that it is written, And great multitudes went with him, and he turned and said unto them, If any one comes to me and does not hate his father, and mother, and wife, and children, and brethren, and sisters, and even his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. And whosoever does not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. Luke fourteen twenty five through 27 Many, I am afraid, want glory, but have no desire for grace. They would gladly have the wages, but not the work, the harvest, but not the labor, the reaping, but not the sowing the reward but not the battle. This cannot be, however. As John Bunyan said, the bitter must go before the sweet. If there is no cross, there will be no crown. The second thing I say is this. Nothing will ever enable you to choose God before the world except faith. Nothing else will do it. Knowledge will not. Emotion will not. A regular use of outward form and ritual will not and good companions will not. All these may do something, but the fruit they produce has no power of continuance. It will not last. A religion springing from such sources will only endure as long as there is no tribulation or persecution because of the word. Mark 4.17 But as soon as there is any, the form of Christianity will dry up. It is a clock without a mainspring or weights. Its face may be beautiful, and you can turn its hands, but it will not run. A Christian life that is to stand must have a living foundation, and there is none other but faith. There must be a real heartfelt belief that God's promises are certain and can be depended on. There must be a sincere belief that all that God says in the Bible is true, and that every doctrine contrary to this is false, whatever anyone may say. There must be a real belief that all God's words are to be received, however difficult and disagreeable they may be to flesh and blood, and that His way is right and all others wrong. There must be this, or you will never come out from the world. Take up the cross, follow Christ, and be saved. You must learn to believe that God's promises are better than worldly possessions, that things unseen are better than things seen, that things in heaven, not yet in sight, are better than things on earth before your eyes, and that the praise of the invisible God is better than the praise of visible man. Then and only then will you make a choice like Moses and prefer God to the world. I ask every reader if you have this faith. If you have, you will find it possible to refuse that which seems good and choose that which seems contrary to the ideals of this world. You will think nothing of today's losses in the hope of tomorrow's gains. You will follow Christ in the dark and stand by Him to the very end. 
If you do not have this faith, though, I warn you that you will never war a good warfare and that you will never run so as to obtain 1 Corinthians 9.24. You will soon be offended and will turn back to the world. Above all this, there must be a real abiding faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. The life that you live in the flesh, you must live by faith of the Son of God. Galatians 2.20 There must be an established habit of continually leaning on Jesus, looking unto Jesus, drawing out of Jesus, and using Him as the manna of your soul. You must strive to be able to say, To me, to live is Christ. Philippians 1.21 And I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Philippians 4.13 this was the faith by which the old saints obtained a good report. This was the weapon by which they overcame the world. This made them what they were. This was the faith that made Noah go on building his ark while the world looked on and mocked. This faith allowed Abraham to give the best land to Lot and to dwell peacefully in tents. This faith allowed Ruth to cleave to Naomi and turn away from her country and her gods. It enabled Daniel to continue in prayer, even though he knew the lion's den was prepared. This faith gave the three Hebrew children the strength to refuse to worship idols, even though the fiery furnace was before their eyes. This faith allowed Moses to forsake Egypt, not fearing the wrath of Pharaoh. These people all acted as they did because they believed. They saw the difficulties and troubles of doing what they did, but they saw Jesus by faith above them all, and they pressed on. Well may the Apostle Peter speak of faith as precious faith. 2 Peter 1.1 1, 1. The third thing I want to say about this is that the true reason why so many people are worldly and ungodly is that they have no faith. We must be aware that multitudes of professing Christians would never think for a moment of doing what Moses did. It is useless to speak soft words and close your eyes to the truth. The person must be blind who does not see thousands around him who are daily preferring the world to God, placing the things of time before the things of eternity and the things of the body before the things of the soul. We might not like to admit this, and we try hard to pretend it is not this way, but it is so. Why do they do so? No doubt they will all give us reasons and excuses. Some will talk of the snares of the world, some of the lack of time, some of the unique difficulties of their position, some of the cares and concerns of life, some of the strength of temptation, some of the power of passions, and some of the effects of bad companions. But what do all these excuses amount to? There is a far simpler way to account for the state of their souls. They do not believe. One simple sentence, like Aaron's rod, will swallow up all their excuses. They have no faith. They do not really think that what God says is true. They secretly flatter themselves, thinking it will surely not be fulfilled. There must certainly be some other way to heaven beside that which the Bible speaks of. There certainly cannot be so much danger of being lost. Basically, they do not put total confidence in the words that God has written and spoken, and so they do not act upon them. They do not thoroughly believe in hell, and so do not flee from it, nor heaven, so they do not seek it, nor the guilt of sin, so they do not turn from it nor the holiness of God, so they do not fear Him, nor their need of Christ, so they do not trust in Him or love Him. They do not have confidence in God, and so risk nothing for Him. Like the boy named Passion in Pilgrim's Progress, they must have their good things now. They do not trust God, and so they cannot wait. How is it with us? Do we believe all the Bible? Let us ask ourselves that question. It is a much greater thing to believe all the Bible than many suppose. Happy is the person who can lay his hand on his heart and say, I am a believer. We talk of unbelievers sometimes as if they were the rarest people in the world. 
I admit that open, avowed atheism is happily not very common now. Footnote. Ryle wrote this in the 19th century. He might not think that open atheism is as rare today as it was then. Text resumes. There is, however, a vast amount of practical infidelity around us that is as dangerous in the end as the principles of Voltaire and Paine. There are many who go to church Sunday after Sunday and make a point of declaring their belief in all that the apostolic and Nicene creeds contain. Yet these very people live all week as if Christ had never died, as if there were no judgment and no resurrection of the dead, and as if there were no everlasting life at all. There are many who will say, Oh, we know it all, when spoken to about eternal things and the value of their souls. Yet their lives clearly show that they do not know anything as they should know. The saddest part of their condition is that they think they do know. It is a sad truth and worthy of all consideration that in God's sight, knowledge not acted upon is not just useless and unprofitable. It is much worse than that. It will add to our condemnation and increase our guilt in the judgment day. A faith that does not influence a person's life and actions is not worthy of the name. There are only two classes in the Church of Christ, those who believe and those who do not believe. The difference between the true Christian and the mere outward professor of Christianity just lies in one word. The true Christian is like Moses. He has faith, while the person who merely professes outwardly has none. The true Christian believes, and therefore lives as he does. The one who merely professes to be a Christian does not believe, and therefore he is what he is, an unbeliever. Well, where is our faith? Let us not be faithless, but believing. The last thing I say is that the true secret of doing great things for God is to have great faith. I believe that we are all apt to err on this point. We think too much and talk too much about graces, gifts, and attainments, and we do not sufficiently remember that faith is the root and mother of them all. In walking with God, a person will only go as far as he believes and no further. His life will always be in proportion to his faith. His peace, patience, courage, and works will all be according to his faith. If you read the lives of eminent Christians such as Wesley, Whitfield, then Martin, Bickersteth, Simeon, or McShane, you are inclined to say what wonderful gifts and graces these men had. I answer that you should instead give honor to the main grace that God puts forward in the 11th chapter of Hebrews. You should give honor to their faith. You can depend on it that faith was the driving force in the character of each and all. I can imagine someone saying, they were so prayerful, that made them what they were. I then ask why they prayed so much. Simply because they had much faith. What is prayer but faith speaking to God? Someone else might say, they were so diligent and hardworking, that accounts for their success. I ask why they were so diligent. Simply because they had faith. What is Christian diligence but faith at work? Another person will say, they were so bold and brave. That made them so useful. I ask why they were so bold. Simply because they had much faith. What is Christian boldness but faith honestly doing its duty? Someone else might say, it was their holiness and spirituality that made them what they were. I then ask what made them holy. Nothing but a living, realizing spirit of faith. What is holiness but faith visible and faith incarnate? Does any reader desire to grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ? Do you want to bring forth much fruit? Do you want to be eminently holy and useful? Is it your desire to be bright and shine as a light in your day? Do you want to, like Moses, make it clear as noonday that you have chosen God before the world? I am sure that every true believer will reply, Yes, 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 these are the things we long for and desire. Then take the advice I give you today. Go and plead to the Lord Jesus Christ 
as the disciples did, Lord, increase our faith. Luke 17, 5. Faith is the root of a real Christian's character. If your root is right, your fruit will soon abound. Your spiritual prosperity will always be according to your faith. He who believes will not only be saved, but will never thirst. He will overcome. He will be established. He will walk firmly on the waters of this world. And he will do great works. Reader, if you believe the things contained in this book, and if you desire to be thoroughly holy, begin to act on your belief. Take Moses for your example. Walk in his steps. Go and do thou likewise. Luke 10, 37. Chapter 9 Lot, a beacon. He lingered. Genesis 19, 16. The holy scriptures which were written for our learning contain beacons as well as patterns. They show us examples of what we should avoid as well as examples of what we should follow. Lot is set as a beacon to the whole Church of Christ. His character is put before us in one little sentence. He lingered. Let us look at this beacon for a few minutes. Let us consider Lot. Who is this man who lingered? He is the nephew of faithful Abraham. When did he linger? He lingered on the very morning Sodom was to be destroyed. Where did he linger? He lingered within the walls of Sodom itself. Before whom did he linger? He lingered under the eyes of the two angels who were sent to bring him out of the city. Even then, he lingered. The words are solemn and full of food for thought. They should sound like a trumpet in the ears of all who make any profession of Christianity. They should make every reader think. These could be the very words your soul needs. The voice of the Lord Jesus commands you to remember Lot's wife, Luke 17, 32. The voice of one of his ministers invites you this day to remember Lot. Let me try to show, one, what Lot was himself. Two, what the text already quoted tells you of him. Three, what reasons may account for his lingering. And four, what kind of fruit his lingering brought forth? I ask for the special attention of all who have reason to hope they are real Christians and desire to live holy lives. Let it be a settled principle in our minds. If we follow holiness, that we must not linger. Once more I say, Lot is a beacon. 1. What was Lot? This is a most important point. If I do not mention this, I might miss that class of professing Christians I especially want to help. If I did not make it quite clear, many might say after reading this book, Lot was a bad man, a poor, wicked, dark creature, an unconverted man, a child of this world. No wonder he lingered. But pay attention to what I now say. Lot was nothing of the kind. Lot was a true believer, a converted person, a real child of God, a justified soul, a righteous man. Do any of you have grace in your heart? So did Lot. Do you have a hope of salvation? So did Lot. Are you a traveler in the narrow way that leads unto life? So was Lot. This is not merely my own opinion, a mere random thought, or an idea unsupported by Scripture. I do not want you to believe it simply because I say it. The Holy Spirit has placed the matter beyond controversy by calling Lot just and righteous, 2 Peter 2, 7-8, and has given us good evidence of the grace that was in him. One evidence is that he lived in a wicked place, seeing and hearing evil all around him, 2 Peter 2, 8, yet was not wicked himself. To be a Daniel in Babylon an Obadiah in Ahab's house, an Abijah in Jeroboam's family, a saint in Nero's court, or a righteous man in Sodom, one must have the grace of God. Without grace, it would be impossible. 
Another evidence is that he afflicted his righteous soul with the deeds of those unjust people that he saw around him. 2 Peter 2.8 He was wounded, grieved, pained, and hurt at the sight of sin. Lot felt like holy David who says, I beheld the transgressors and was grieved because they did not keep thy words. Psalm 119.158 And rivers of waters ran down my eyes because they did not keep thy law. Psalm 119.136 This was like Paul who says, I have great sorrow and continual pain in my heart for my brethren, those who are my kinsmen according to the flesh. Romans 9, 2-3 Nothing will account for this but the grace of God. Another evidence is that he afflicted his righteous soul from day to day with the unlawful deeds he saw. 2 Peter 2, 8 He did not eventually become indifferent and lukewarm about sin, as many do. Familiarity and habit did not take off the fine edge of his feelings, as too often is the case. Many people are shocked and startled at the first sight of wickedness, and yet end up becoming so used to seeing it that they view it with comparative unconcern. This is especially the case with those who live in towns and cities. Such people often become utterly indifferent about Sabbath-breaking and many other forms of open sin, but it was not so with Lot. Again, this is a great indication of the reality of his grace. Lot was a just and righteous man, a man sealed and stamped as an heir of heaven by the Holy Spirit himself. Before we move on, let us remember that a true Christian might have many blemishes, defects, and infirmities, and yet still be a true Christian. We do not despise gold because it is mixed with much dross. We must not undervalue grace because it is accompanied by much corruption. Read on and you will see that Lot paid dearly for his lingering. But as you read, do not forget that Lot was a child of God. 2. What does the text, already quoted, tell us about Lot's behavior? The words are amazing and astounding. He lingered. The more we consider the time and circumstances, the more perplexing we will think they are. Lot knew the awful condition of the city in which he stood. The cry of its abominations had waxed great before the face of the Lord. Genesis 19.13 Yet he lingered. Lot knew the fearful judgment coming down on all within its walls. The angels had said plainly, The Lord has sent us to destroy it. Genesis 19.13 Yet he lingered. Lot knew that God was a God who always kept his word, and if he said he would do something, he would definitely do it. He could hardly be Abraham's nephew and live with him for a while and not be aware of this, yet he lingered. Lot believed there was danger, for he went to his sons-in-law and warned them to flee. Up, he said, get you out of this place, for the Lord will destroy this city. Genesis 19.14 Yet he lingered. Lot saw the angels of God standing by, waiting for him and his family to leave. He heard the voice of those ministers of wrath ringing in his ears to hurry him. Arise, take thy wife and thy two daughters who are here, lest thou be consumed in the iniquity of the city. Genesis 19.15 Yet he lingered. He was slow when he should have been quick, backward when he should have been forward, trifling when he should have been rushing, loitering when he should have been hurrying, and cold when he should have been hot. It's more than strange. It seems almost incredible. It appears too strange to be true, but the Spirit writes it down for our learning. And so it was. Perplexing as it might appear at first, I'm afraid that there are many of the Lord Jesus Christ's people very much like Lot. I ask every reader of this book to remember well what I say. I will repeat it so that there will be no mistake about my meaning. I have shown you that Lot lingered, I say that there are many Christian men and Christian women today very much like Lot. There are many real children of God who appear to know far more than they live up to and who see far more than they practice, yet they continue in this condition for many years. It is amazing that they go as far as they do and yet no further.
They acknowledge Christ and love the truth. They like sound preaching and agree with every article of gospel doctrine when they hear it. But there is still something indescribable that is not satisfactory about them. They are constantly doing things that disappoint the expectations of their more advanced Christian friends. It is amazing that they think as they do, yet stand still. They believe in heaven, and yet do not seem to look forward to it very much. They believe in hell, and yet do not seem to fear it. They say that they love the Lord Jesus, but the work they do for him is small. They claim to hate the devil, but they often appear to tempt him to come to them. They know the time is short, but they live as if it were long. They know they have a battle to fight, yet others might think they were at peace. They know they have a race to run, yet they often look like people sitting still. They know the judge is at the door and there is wrath to come, yet they appear half asleep. It is astonishing that they are what they are, yet have not progressed more than what they have. What can we say of these people? They often bewilder godly friends and family members. They often cause great concern. They often give rise to great doubts and searchings of heart. They may be classed under one sweeping description. They are all brothers and sisters of Lot. They linger. These are the ones who get the notion into their minds that it is impossible for all believers to be so very holy and very spiritual. They admit that true holiness is a beautiful thing. They like to read about it in books and even to see it occasionally in others, but they do not think that all Christians are meant to aim at so high a standard. At any rate, they seem to have made up their minds that it is beyond their reach. These are the ones who get into their heads false ideas of love, as they call it. They are deathly afraid of being thought of as intolerant and narrow-minded, and they are always running to the opposite extreme, They would gladly please everybody and be agreeable to everyone, but they forget that first they should be sure that they please God. These are the people who are afraid of sacrifices and who retreat from self-denial. They never appear able to apply our Lord's command to take up the cross, Matthew 16, 24, cut off the right hand and pluck out the right eye, Matthew 5, 29-30. They cannot deny that our Lord used these expressions, but they never find a place for them in their own Christianity. They spend their lives in trying to make the gate wider and the cross easier to carry, but they never succeed. These are the people who are always trying to remain in the world. They are ingenious in discovering reasons for not clearly separating themselves and in making convincing excuses for attending questionable amusements and keeping up questionable friendships. One day you are told that they attended a Bible study, and the next day you might hear they went to a nightclub. One day they fast and pray, or go to the Lord's table and receive the Lord's supper, and another day they go to the casino in the morning and a movie at night. One day they are almost beside themselves under the sermon of some dramatic and emotional preacher, and another day they are weeping over some romance novel. They are constantly trying to convince themselves that to join a little with worldly people on their own ground does good. Yet in their case, it is very clear that not only do they do no good, but they only receive harm. These are people who cannot find it in their hearts to quarrel with their troubling sin, whether it is laziness, idleness, anger, pride, lust, selfishness, impatience, or whatever else it may be. They allow it to remain a tolerably quiet and undisturbed resident of their hearts. They try to excuse it due to their health, personality, temperament, trials, or by saying that is just how they are. Their father, mother, or grandmother was the same way, and so, they say, they cannot help it. When you meet them again, a year or two later, they are still making the same excuses This can all be summed up in a single sentence. They are the brothers and sisters of Lot. They linger. If you are a lingering soul, you are not happy. You know you are not. It would be strange indeed if you were. Lingering is the sure destruction of happy Christianity. A lingerer's conscience forbids him to enjoy inward peace. Maybe at one time you did run well, but you have left your first love 
You have not felt the same comfort since, and you never will until you return to your first works. Revelation 2.5 Like Peter, when the Lord Jesus was taken prisoner, you are following the Lord afar off. And just like Peter, you will find the way unpleasant and difficult. Come and look at Lot. Come and notice Lot's history. Come and consider Lot's lingering. And be wise. 3. Let us now consider the reasons for Lot's lingering. This is a matter of great importance, and I ask you to pay the most serious attention to it. To know the root of a disease is one step toward a remedy. He who is forewarned is forearmed. Who is there among the readers of this book who feels secure and has no fear of lingering? Come and listen while I tell you a few passages of Lot's history. Do as he did, and it will be a miracle indeed if you do not get into the same state of soul in time. One thing I observe in Lot is that he made a wrong choice early in life. There was a time when Abraham and Lot dwelt together. They both became rich and could live together no longer. Abraham, the elder of the two, in the true spirit of humility and courtesy, gave Lot the choice of the country when they resolved to part company. If thou, he said, will take the left hand, then I will go to the right. Or if thou depart to the right hand, then I will go to the left. Genesis 13, 9. What did Lot do? We are told that he saw that the plains of Jordan near Sodom were rich, fertile, and well watered. It was a good land for cattle and was full of pastures. Lot had large flocks and herds, and it suited his requirements. This was the land he chose for a residence, simply because it was a rich, well-watered land. Genesis 13.10 It was near the town of Sodom. Lot did not care about that. The people of Sodom, who would be his neighbors, were wicked. That did not matter to him. They were wicked sinners before God. That made no difference to him. The pasture was rich. The land was good. Lot wanted such a country for his flocks and herds, and that was all the reason he needed. No other argument mattered to him. Lot chose by sight and not by faith. He did not ask counsel of God to preserve him from mistakes. He looked to the things of time and not of eternity. He thought of his worldly profit and not of his soul. He considered only what would help him in this life. He forgot the solemn business of the life to come. This was a bad beginning. I observe also that Lot joined with sinners when there was no reason for him to do so. We are first told that he pitched his tents toward Sodom. Genesis 13.12 This, as I have already shown, was a huge mistake. But the next time Lot is mentioned, we find him actually living in Sodom itself. The Spirit says specifically that he dwelt in Sodom. Genesis 14.12 He had left his tents. He had forsaken the country. He occupied a house in the very streets of that wicked town. We are not told the reason for this change. We are not aware that any occasion could have necessitated it. We are sure that there could have been no command of God. Maybe his wife liked the town better than the country, for the sake of society. It is plain that she had no grace herself. Maybe she convinced Lot that it was needful for the benefit of his daughters so they could marry and get settled in life. Maybe the daughters wanted to live in the town for the sake of fun company. They were evidently not serious-minded young women. Maybe Lot liked it himself in order to seem more important with his flocks and herds. People never lack reasons to try to justify what they want to do. One thing is very clear. Lot dwelt in the midst of Sodom without good cause. When a child of God does these two things that I have named, we should never be surprised if we eventually hear unfavorable accounts about his soul. We never need to be surprised if he stops listening to the warning voice of affliction, as Lot had done, Genesis 14.12, and ends up being a lingerer in the day of trial and danger, as Lot was. I know no more certain way to damage your own soul and to go backward about your eternal concerns than to make a wrong choice in life 
an unscriptural choice, and settle yourself down unnecessarily in the midst of worldly people. This is the way to make the pulse of your soul beat feebly and sluggishly. This is the way to make the edge of your feeling about sin become blunt and dull. This is the way to dim the eyes of your spiritual discernment until you can scarcely distinguish good from evil and you stumble as you walk. This is the way to bring a moral paralysis on your feet and limbs and make you go stumbling and trembling along the road to Zion as if the grasshopper was a burden. This is the way to let your worst enemy into the camp, to give the devil an advantage in the battle, to tie your arms in fighting, to bind your legs in running, to dry up the sources of your strength, to destroy your energies, and to cut off your own hair like Samson, and to give yourself into the hands of the Philistines, to put out your own eyes, grind at the mill, and become a slave. I call on every reader to listen well to what I am saying. Write these things down in your mind. Do not forget them. Recall them in the morning. Restore them to your memory at night. Let them sink down deeply into your heart. If you ever want to be safe from lingering, beware of needless mingling with worldly people. Beware of Lot's choice. If you do not want to settle down into a dry, dull, sleepy, lazy, barren, desolate, carnal, mindless, lethargic state of soul, beware of Lot's choice. Remember this in choosing a place to live or a residence. It is not enough that the house is comfortable, the situation good, the air fine, the neighborhood pleasant, the rent or price low and the living cheap. There are other things still to be considered. You must think of your immortal soul. Will the house you think of help you toward heaven or hell? Is the gospel preached nearby? Is Christ crucified within reach of your door? Is there a real man of God near who will watch over your soul? I urge you, if you love life, not to overlook this. Beware of Lot's choice. Remember this in choosing a job career, or profession in life. It is not enough that the salary is high, the wages good, the work light, the advantages numerous, and the prospects of advancement most favorable. Think of your mortal soul. Will it be prospered or drawn back? Will you have your Sundays free and be able to have one day in the week for your spiritual business? I urge you, by the mercies of God, to be careful what you do. Make no careless decision. Consider this in every light, in the light of God as well as in the light of the world. Gold may be bought too dear. Beware of Lot's choice. Remember this in choosing a husband or wife if you are unmarried. It is not enough that your eye is pleased, that your tastes are met, that your mind finds congeniality, that there is warmth and affection, and that there is a comfortable home for life. There needs to be something more than this. There is a life yet to come. Think of your immortal soul. Will it be helped upward or dragged downward by the union you are planning? Will it be made more heavenly or more earthly, drawn nearer to Christ or to the world? Will the Christianity in your soul grow stronger or will it decay? I ask you, by all your hopes of glory, allow this to enter into your calculations. Think, as Richard Baxter said, and think, and think again before you commit yourself. Be ye not unequally yoked, 2 Corinthians 6.14. Matrimony is nowhere named among the means of conversion. Remember Lot's choice. Remember this if you are ever offered a good position in your career. It is not enough to have good pay and regular employment the confidence of your employer, and the best chance of advancing in your company. These things are very good in their way, but they are not everything. How will your soul fare if you work at a company that makes you work on Sundays? What day in the week will you have for God in eternity? What opportunities will you have for hearing the gospel preached? I solemnly warn you to consider this. It will profit you nothing to fill your bank account if you bring leanness and poverty to your soul.
Beware of trading the Lord's Day for the sake of advancement in the career. Remember Esau's mess of pottage. Beware of Lot's choice. Some reader might think a Christian does not need to fear. He is a sheep of Christ. He will never perish, and he cannot come to much harm. It cannot be that such small matters can be of great importance. Well, you might think so, but I warn you that if you neglect these matters, your soul will never prosper. A true Christian will certainly not be cast away if he lingers, but if he does linger, it is a waste of time to suppose that his Christianity will thrive. Grace is a tender plant. Unless you cherish it and nurse it well, it will soon become sick in this evil world. It might wilt, although it cannot die. The brightest gold will soon become dim when exposed to a damp atmosphere. The hottest iron will soon become cold. It requires pains and toil to bring it to a red heat. It requires nothing but leaving it alone, or adding a little cold water for it to become black and hard. You might be an earnest, zealous Christian now. You might feel like David in his prosperity when he said, I shall never be moved, Psalm 36. Do not be deceived, though. You only have to walk in Lot's steps and make Lot's choice, and you will soon come to Lot's condition of soul. Allow yourself to do as he did, dare to act as he acted, and you can be sure that you will soon discover that you have become a poor lingerer like him. You will find, like Samson, that the presence of the Lord is no longer with you. You will prove to be, to your own shame, an undecided, hesitating person in the day of trial. There will come a rotting on your religion that will eat out its vitality without your knowing it. There will come a slow consumption on your spiritual strength that will waste it away insensibly. In time, you will wake up to find your hands hardly able to do the Lord's work, your feet hardly able to carry you along the Lord's way, and your faith no bigger than a grain of mustard seed. This might happen at some turning point in your life, at a time when the enemy is coming in like a flood and your need is the greatest. If you do not want to become a lingerer in Christianity, consider these things. Beware of doing what Lot did. 4. Let us inquire now what kind of fruit Lot's lingering spirit produced. I do not want to skip over this point for many reasons, especially in the present day. There are many who will feel inclined to say, After all, Lot was saved. He was justified. He got to heaven. That's all I need. If I just get to heaven, I'll be content. If this is the thought of your heart, listen to me a little longer. I will show you one or two things in Lot's history that deserve attention and might convince you to change your mind. I think it is of primary importance to dwell upon this subject I will always contend that eminent holiness and eminent usefulness are quite closely connected. Happiness and following the Lord go fully side by side. If believers linger, they should not expect to be useful in their day and generation. They should not expect to be very saintly and Christlike, and they should not expect to enjoy much comfort and peace in believing. Let us notice that Lot did no good among the inhabitants of Sodom. Lot probably lived in Sodom many years. No doubt he had many precious opportunities for speaking about the things of God and trying to turn souls away from sin. But Lot seems to have accomplished nothing at all. He appears to have had no weight or influence with the people who lived around him. He possessed none of that respect and reverence that even the people of the world will frequently concede to a bright servant of God. Not one righteous person could be found in all Sodom outside the walls of Lot's home. Not one of his neighbors believed his testimony. Not one of his acquaintances honored the Lord whom he worshipped. Not one of his servants served his master's God. None of the people cared at all for his opinion when he tried to restrain their wickedness. This fellow came into sojourn, they said, and is he to lift himself up as a judge? Genesis 19.9 his life carried no weight. His words were not listened to. His religion drew none to follow him. Truly, this does not surprise me. Generally, lingering souls do no good to the world and bring no credit to God's cause. Their salt has too little savor to season the corruption around them. 
They are not epistles of Christ who can be known and read of all. 2 Corinthians 3 2. There is nothing magnetic, attractive, and Christ reflecting about their ways. Let us remember this. Let us observe that Lot did not help any of his family, relatives, or acquaintances toward heaven. We are not told how large his family was, but we know that he at least had a wife and two daughters when he was called out of Sodom. But whether Lot's family was large or small, one thing I think is perfectly clear. There was not one person among them who feared God. When he went out and spoke unto his sons-in-law, those who were to marry his daughters, and warn them to flee from the judgments coming on Sodom, we are told that he seemed as one that mocked unto his sons-in-law. Genesis 19.14 What fearful words those are! It was just like saying, Who cares about what you say? As long as the Genesis 19.14 world stands, these things will be painful proof of the contempt with which a lingerer in Christianity is regarded. What was Lot's wife? She left the city with him, but she did not go far. She did not have faith to see the need of such a quick escape. She left her heart in Sodom when she began to flee. She looked back from behind her husband, despite the plainest command not to do so. Escape, for thy soul do not look behind thee, neither stop thou in all the plain. Escape to the mountain, lest thou be consumed. Genesis 19.17 Lot's wife looked back and was at once turned into a pillar of salt. What about Lot's two daughters? They escaped, but only to do the devil's work. They later tempted their father to wickedness and led him to commit the vilest of sins. In summary, Lot seems to have stood alone in his family. He was not made the means of keeping one soul back from the gates of hell. This does not surprise me. Lingering souls are seen through by their own families, and when they are seen through, they are despised. Even if their nearest relatives understand nothing else in Christianity, they understand inconsistency. They draw the sad but natural conclusion, saying, Certainly, if he believed all that he claims to believe, he would not live and do as he does. Lingering parents rarely have godly children. The eye of the child drinks in far more than the ear. A child will always observe what you do much more than what you say. Let us remember this. Let us consider that Lot did not leave any godly evidence behind him when he died. We only know a little about Lot after his flight from Sodom, and all that we do know is unsatisfactory. His pleading for Zoar was only minor, and his later departure from Zoar and his conduct in the cave all tell the same story. It all shows the weakness of the grace that was in him, and how low the condition of his soul was into which he had fallen. We do not know how long he lived after his escape. We do not know where or when he died, whether he saw Abraham again, how he died, or anything that he later said or thought. All these things are hidden to us. We are told of the last days of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, and David, but not one word about Lot. Oh, what a gloomy deathbed the deathbed of Lot must have been. The scripture appears to draw a veil around him on purpose. There is a painful silence about his end. He seems to have gone out like an expiring lamp and left a bad taste behind him. If we had not been specifically told in the New Testament that Lot was just and righteous, I really believe we would have doubted whether Lot was saved at all. I do not wonder, at his sad end, though, lingering believers will generally reap according as they have sown. Their lingering often meets them when their spirit is departing. They have little peace at the end. They reach heaven, to be sure, but they reach it in sad difficulty, weary and footsore, in weakness and tears, in darkness and storm. They are saved, yet so as by fire. 1 Corinthians 3.15 I ask every reader of this book to consider the three things I have just mentioned. Do not misunderstand my meaning. It is amazing to observe how willingly people grab at the littlest excuse for misunderstanding the things that concern their souls. I am not saying that all believers who do not linger will be great instruments of usefulness to the world. 
Noah preached 120 years, and no one believed him. The Lord Jesus was not esteemed by his own people, the Jews. Nor yet do I tell you that believers who do not linger will all be the means of converting their families and relatives. Many of David's children were ungodly. The Lord Jesus was not believed on even by his own brothers. I do say, though, that it is nearly impossible not to see some connection between Lot's evil choice and Lot's lingering, and between Lot's lingering and his lack of benefit to his family and the world. I believe that the Holy Spirit meant for us to see it. I believe the Holy Spirit meant to make him a beacon to all professing Christians. I am sure that the lessons I have tried to draw from the whole history deserve serious reflection. Now, let me speak a few parting words to all who read this book, and especially to all who call themselves believers in Christ. I have no desire to make your heart sad. I do not want to give you a gloomy view of the Christian life. My only object is to give you friendly warnings. I desire your peace and comfort. I would gladly see you happy as well as safe, and joyful as well as justified. I write as I have done for your good. You live in a day when a religion full of lot-like lingerers abounds. The stream of people professing to be Christians is far broader than it once was, but it is far less deep in many places. A certain kind of Christianity is almost fashionable now, to belong to some church and show a zeal for its interests, to talk about the leading controversies of the day, to buy popular religious books as fast as they come out and lay them on your table, to attend meetings, seminars, and workshops, to discuss the merits of preachers, and to be enthusiastic and excited about every new form of sensational Christian trend that pops up. These are all comparatively easy and common attainments now. They no longer make a person stand out. They require little or no sacrifice. They require no cross. However, to walk closely with God, to be truly spiritually minded, to behave like strangers and pilgrims, to be distinct from the world in how we use our time, to be different from the world in our conversation, entertainment, and clothing, to bear a faithful witness for Christ in all places, to leave a trace of our Master everywhere we go and in all company, to be prayerful, humble, unselfish, good-tempered, untroubled, easily pleased, charitable, patient, and meek, and to be jealously afraid of all types of sin and tremblingly alive to our danger from the world, these are still rare things. They are not common among those who are called true Christians, and worst of all, their absence is not felt and mourned as it should be. In a time like this, I dare to offer counsel to every believing reader of this book. Do not turn away from it. Do not be angry with me for speaking plainly. I urge you to give all the more diligence to make your calling and election sure. 2 Peter 1.10 I urge you not to be slothful, not to be careless, not to be content with a small measure of grace, and not to be satisfied with being a little better than the world. I solemnly warn you not to attempt doing what can never be done, to serve Christ and yet stay in with the world. I call upon you and implore you to be a wholehearted Christian, to pursue eminent holiness, to aim at a high degree of sanctification, to live a consecrated life, to present your body a living sacrifice unto God, Romans 12.1, and to walk in the Spirit, Galatians 5.25. I instruct and exhort you by all your hopes of heaven and desires of glory, if you want to be happy and useful, do not be a lingering soul. Do you want to know what the times demand? The shaking of nations, the uprooting of ancient things, the overturning of kingdoms, the turmoil and restlessness of men's minds. What do they say? They all cry aloud, Christian, do not linger. Do you want to be found ready for Christ at his second appearing, with your loins girded, your lamp burning, and yourself bold and prepared to meet him? Then do not linger. Do you want to enjoy much sensible comfort in your Christianity? 
to feel the witness of the Spirit within you, to know whom you have believed, and not to be a gloomy, complaining, sour, downcast, and melancholy Christian, then do not linger. Would you like to enjoy strong assurance of your own salvation in the day of sickness and on your deathbed? Do you want to see with the eye of faith heaven opening and Jesus rising to receive you? Then do not linger. Do you desire to leave much evidence of your true Christianity behind you when you are gone? Would you like to be laid in the grave with comfortable hope and have others talk of your destiny after death without a doubt? Then do not linger. Do you want to be useful to the world in your day and generation? Do you want to draw people from sin to Christ, to have your doctrine be appealing to others, and to make your master's cause beautiful and attractive in their eyes? Then do not linger. Do you desire to help your children and relatives toward heaven and have them say, We want to go with you? Do you not want to make them unbelievers and despisers of Christianity? then do not linger. Would you like a great crown in the day of Christ's appearing, not be the least and smallest star in glory, and not find yourself the last and lowest in the kingdom of God? Then do not linger. Oh, let not one of us linger. Time does not linger. Death does not linger. Judgment does not linger. The devil does not linger. The world does not linger. Let the children of God not linger. Does anyone feel that he is a lingerer? Does your heart feel heavy and your conscience wounded while you have been reading these pages? Does something within you whisper, This describes me. Then listen to what I am saying. It is not well with your soul. Awake and try to do better. If you are a lingerer, you must go to Christ at once and be cured. You must use the old remedy. You must bathe in the old fountain. You must turn again to Christ and be healed. The way to do something is to do it. Do this at once. Do not think for a moment that your case is past recovery. Do not think that because you have been living in a dry, sleepy, heavy state of soul for a long time that there is no hope of revival. Is not the Lord Jesus Christ an appointed physician for all spiritual ailments? Did he not cure every form of disease when he was upon earth? Did he not cast out every kind of demon? Did he not raise poor backsliding Peter and put a new song in his mouth? Oh, do not doubt, but sincerely believe that he will yet revive his work within you. Simply stop lingering. Confess your foolishness and come. Come to Christ at once. Blessed are the words of the prophet. Only acknowledge thine iniquity. Return, ye rebellious sons, and I will heal your rebellion. Jeremiah 3, verses 13 and 22. Let us all remember the souls of others, as well as our own. If at any time we see any brother or sister lingering, let us try to awaken them, arouse them and stir them up. Let us all exhort one another as we have opportunity. Hebrews 3.13 Let us motivate others unto charity and unto good works. Hebrews 10.24 Let us not be afraid to say to each other, Brother or sister, have you forgotten Lot? Awake and remember Lot. Awake and linger no more. Chapter 10 A Woman to be Remembered Remember Lot's Wife, Luke 17, 32 There are few warnings in Scripture more solemn than that above. The Lord Jesus Christ says to us, Remember Lot's wife. Lot's wife professed to follow God. Her husband was a righteous man, 2 Peter 2, 8. She left Sodom with him on the day that Sodom was destroyed. She looked back toward the city from behind her husband, against God's clear command. She was struck dead at once and turned into a pillar of salt. The Lord Jesus Christ holds her up as a beacon to his church. He says, Remember Lot's wife. It is a solemn warning when we think of the person Jesus names. He does not tell us to remember Abraham, Isaac, 
Jacob, Sarah, Hannah, or Ruth. No, he singles out one whose soul was lost forever. He cries to us, Remember Lot's wife. It is a solemn warning when we consider the subject Jesus is discussing. He is speaking of his own second coming to judge the world. He's describing the dreadful state of unreadiness in which many will be found. The last days are on his mind when he says, Remember Lot's wife. It is a solemn warning when we think of the person who gives it. The Lord Jesus is full of love, mercy, and compassion. He is one who will not break the bruised reed nor quench the smoking flax. Matthew 12.20 He could weep over unbelieving Jerusalem and pray for the men who crucified him, yet he even thinks it is good to remind us of lost souls. Even he says, remember Lot's wife. It is a solemn warning when we think of the people to whom it was first given. The Lord Jesus was speaking to his disciples. He was not addressing the scribes and Pharisees who hated him, but was speaking to Peter, James, John, and many others who loved him. Yet he thought it was good to warn even them. Even to them, he says, remember Lot's wife. It is a solemn warning when we consider the manner in which it was given. He does not merely say, beware of following and imitating Lot's wife. He uses a different word. He says, remember. He speaks as if we were all in danger of forgetting the subject. He stirs up our lazy memories. He urges us to keep the incident before our minds. He cries, remember Lot's wife. I would now like to examine the lessons that Lot's wife is meant to teach us. I am sure that her history is full of useful instruction to the church. The last days are upon us. The second coming of the Lord Jesus draws near. The danger of worldliness is continuously increasing in the church. Let us be provided with safeguards and antidotes against the disease that is around us. Let us become familiar with the story of Lot's wife. There are three things that I will do in bringing the subject before our minds in order. One, I will speak of the religious privileges that Lot's wife enjoyed. Two, I will speak of the sin that Lot's wife committed. And three, I will speak of the judgment that God inflicted upon her. I will first speak of the religious privileges that Lot's wife enjoyed. In the days of Abraham and Lot, true saving religion was scarce upon earth. There were no Bibles, no pastors, no churches, no tracts, and no missionaries. The knowledge of God was confined to a few favored families. Most of the inhabitants of the world were living in darkness, ignorance, superstition, and sin. Probably not one in a hundred had such a good example, such spiritual company, such clear knowledge, and such plain warnings as Lot's wife. Compared with millions of her fellow human beings in her time, Lot's wife was a favored woman. She had a godly man for her husband. She had Abraham, the father of the faithful, for her uncle by marriage. The faith, the knowledge, and the prayers of these two righteous men could have been no secret to her. It is impossible that she could have dwelt in tents with them for any length of time without knowing about the God to whom they belonged and whom they served. Religion with Abraham and Lot was no mere formal business. It was the ruling principle of their lives and the mainspring of all their actions. Lot's wife must have seen and known all this. This was no small privilege. When Abraham first received the promises, it is probable that Lot's wife was there. When he built his altar by his tent, between Ai and Bethel, it is probable she was there. When her husband was taken captive by Kedor Laomor and delivered by God's providence, she was there. When Melchizedek, king of Salem, came forth to meet Abraham with bread and wine, she was there. When the angels came to Sodom and warned her husband to flee, she saw them. When the angels took them by the hand and led them out of the city, she was one of those whom they helped to escape. Once more, I say, these were no small privileges. Yet what good effect had all these privileges on the heart of Lot's wife? None at all. Despite all her opportunities and means of grace, 
and despite all her special warnings and messages from heaven, she lived and died graceless, godless, impenitent, and unbelieving. The eyes of her understanding were never opened. Her conscience was never really stirred up and awakened. Her will was never really brought into a state of obedience to God. Her affections were never really set upon things above. The form of religion that she had was kept up for fashion's sake and not from feeling. It was a garment worn for the sake of pleasing her relatives, but not from any sense of its value. She did as others did around her in Lot's house. She conformed to her husband's ways, she made no opposition to his religion, and she allowed herself to be passively towed along in his wake. But all this time her heart was wrong in the sight of God. The world was in her heart, and her heart was in the world. In this condition she lived, and in this condition she died. In all this there is much to be learned. I see a lesson here that is of the utmost importance in the present day. We live in times when there are many people just like Lot's wife. Come and hear the lesson that her case is meant to teach. Learn that the mere possession of religious privileges will save no one's soul. You might have spiritual advantages of every description. You might live in the full sunshine of the richest opportunities and means of grace. You might enjoy the best preaching and teaching. You might dwell in the midst of light, knowledge, holiness, and good company. You might have all these things, and yet you yourself may remain unconverted and in the end be lost forever. I dare say that this doctrine is difficult for some readers. I know that many people think they do not need anything except religious privileges in order to become wholehearted Christians. They will admit that they are not yet what they should be, but they say that they are going through difficulties and hard times. They claim that if they only had a godly husband or a godly wife, godly friends or a godly employer, if they could hear good gospel preaching, if they had these advantages and privileges, then they would walk with God. It is all a mistake. It is a complete delusion. It requires something more than privileges and advantages to save souls. Joab was David's captain. Gehazi was Elisha's servant. Demas was Paul's companion. Judas Iscariot was Christ's disciple. And Lot had a worldly, unbelieving wife. They all died in their sins. They went down to the pit, despite knowledge, warnings, and opportunities. All these instances teach us is that it is not privileges alone that we need. We need the grace of the Holy Spirit. Let us value religious privileges, but let us not rest entirely upon them. Let us desire to have the benefit of them in all areas of our lives, but let us not put them in the place of Christ. Let us use them thankfully if God grants them to us, but let us take care that they produce some fruit in our hearts and lives. If they do not do any good, they often do harm. They sear the conscience, increase responsibility, and intensify condemnation. The same fire that melts the wax hardens the clay. The same sun that makes the living tree grow dries up the dead tree and prepares it for burning. Nothing hardens the heart of man as much as an empty familiarity with sacred things. Once more I say, it is not privileges alone that make people Christians but the grace of the Holy Spirit. Without that, no one will ever be saved. I ask the members of evangelical congregations to pay careful attention to what I'm saying. You think your pastor is an excellent preacher. You delight in his sermons. His sermons help you the most of any you have heard anywhere. You have learned many things since you attended his ministry. You consider it a great privilege to be one of his hearers, all of this is very good. It is a privilege. I would be thankful if ministers like yours were multiplied a thousandfold, but after all that, what do you have in your heart? Have you yet received the Holy Spirit? If not, you are no better than Lot's wife. I ask the children of religious parents to consider well what I am saying. 
It is the highest privilege to be the child of a godly father and mother and to be brought up in the midst of many prayers. It is a blessed thing indeed to be taught the gospel from our earliest infancy and to hear about sin, Jesus, the Holy Spirit, holiness, and heaven from the first moment we can remember. But take heed that you do not remain dead and unfruitful in the sunshine of all these privileges. Beware that your heart does not remain hard, unrepentant, and worldly despite the many advantages you enjoy. You cannot enter the kingdom of God on the credit of your parents' faith. You must eat the bread of life for yourself. You must have the witness of the Spirit in your own heart. You must have repentance of your own, faith of your own, and sanctification of your own. If not, you are no better than Lot's wife. I pray to God that all professing Christians may lay these things to heart. May we never forget that privileges alone cannot save us. Light and knowledge, faithful preaching, and abundant means of grace, and the company of holy people are all great blessings and advantages. Happy are they who have them. But after all, there is one thing without which privileges are useless. That one thing is the grace of the Holy Spirit. Lot's wife had many privileges, but Lot's wife had no grace. I will next speak of the sin that Lot's wife committed. The history of her sin is given by the Holy Spirit in few and simple words. Scripture. Then the wife of Lot looked back from behind him, and she became a pillar of salt. Genesis 19.26 We are told no more than this. There is a simple solemnity about this history. The sum and substance of her transgression lies in these three words. She looked back. Does that sin seem small to you? Does the failing of Lot's wife appear to be too minor to be visited with such a punishment? I dare say that this is what some people think. Give your attention to me while I reason with you on the subject. There was far more in that look than strikes you at first. It implied far more than it expressed. Listen, and you will hear. That look was a little thing, but it revealed the true character of Lot's wife. Little things will often show the state of a person's mind even better than great ones, and little symptoms are often the signs of deadly and incurable diseases. The fruit that Eve ate was a little thing, but it proved that she had fallen from innocence and had become a sinner. A crack in an arch seems a little thing, but it proves that the foundation is giving way and that the whole structure is unsafe. A little cough in the morning seems like an unimportant ailment, but it is often evidence of failing health that leads to decline, sickness, and death. A straw may show which way the wind blows, and one look can show the rotten condition of a sinner's heart. Matthew 5.28 That look was a little thing, but it told of disobedience in Lot's wife. The command of the angel was specific and unmistakable. Do not look behind thee. Genesis 19.17 Lot's wife refused to obey this command, but the Holy Spirit says that to hear is better than sacrifice. And rebellion is the sin of witchcraft, 1 Samuel 15, 22-23. When God speaks plainly by His word or by His messengers, man's duty is clear. That look was a little thing, but it told of proud unbelief in Lot's wife. She seemed to doubt whether God was really going to destroy Sodom. She seemed to not believe that there was any danger or any need to quickly flee. But without faith, it is impossible to please God. Hebrews 11.6 The moment someone begins to think he knows better than God, and that God is not serious when he warns and threatens, his soul is in great danger. When we cannot see the reason for what God does, our duty is to hold our peace and believe. That look was a little thing, but it told of the secret love of the world in Lot's wife. Her heart was in Sodom, though her body was outside. She had left her affections behind when she fled from her home. 
Her eye turned to the place where her treasure was, as the compass needle turns to the north. This was the crowning point of her sin. Scripture. The friendship of the world is enmity with God. James 4.4 4. If anyone loves the world, the charity of the Father is not in him. 1 John 2.15 I ask you to pay special attention to this part of our subject. I believe it is the part to which the Lord Jesus particularly intends to direct our minds. I believe he would have us observe that Lot's wife was lost by looking back to the world. Her profession was at one time good and believable, but she never really gave up the world. She seemed at one time to be on the road to safety, but even then, the lowest and deepest thoughts of her heart for the world. The immense danger of worldliness is the main lesson that the Lord Jesus wants us to learn. Oh, that we may all have an eye to see and a heart to understand. I believe there was never a time when warnings against worldliness were so much needed by the Church of Christ as they are today. Every age is said to have its own peculiar epidemic disease, the epidemic disease to which the souls of Christians are in danger of now is the love of the world. It is a pestilence that walks in darkness and a sickness that destroys at noonday. Psalm 91, six. It has caused many to fall down dead. Yea, all the strong men have been slain by her. Proverbs 7.26 I would willingly raise a warning voice and try to awaken the slumbering consciences of all who make a profession of Christianity. I would readily cry aloud, Remember the sin of Lot's wife. She was no murderess, adulteress, or thief, but she professed to follow God, and she looked back. There are thousands of baptized people in our churches who are proof against immorality and infidelity, and yet who become victims to the love of the world. There are thousands who run well for a season and seem likely to reach heaven, but by and by they give up the race and completely turn their backs on Christ. What has stopped them? Have they found the Bible not true? Did the Lord Jesus fail to keep his word? No, not at all. They have caught the epidemic disease. They are infected with the love of this world. I appeal to every true-hearted evangelical pastor. I ask him to look all around his congregation. I appeal to every old established Christian. I ask him to look all around his circle of acquaintances. I am sure that I am speaking the truth. I am sure that it is the right time to remember the sin of Lot's wife. How many children of Christian families begin well and end poorly? In the days of their childhood, they seem full of Christianity. They can repeat Bible verses and sing Christian songs in abundance. They have spiritual feelings and convictions of sin. They profess to love the Lord Jesus and desire heaven. They take pleasure in going to church and listening to sermons. They say things that their parents take as indications of grace. They do things that make their relatives say, Who shall this child be? Luke one sixty six. But sadly, their goodness often vanishes like the morning cloud and like the dew that passes away. The boy becomes a young man and cares for nothing but amusement, sports, parties, and excess. The girl becomes a young woman and cares for nothing but fashion, popularity, empty entertainment, and fun. Where is the spirituality that once seemed so promising? It is all gone. It is buried. It is overflowed by the love of the world. These people walk in the steps of Lot's wife. They look back. How many married people do well in Christianity to all appearance until their children begin to grow up and then they fall away? In the early years of their married life, they seem to follow Christ diligently and to witness a good confession of faith. They regularly attend the preaching of the gospel. They are fruitful in good works and are never seen in corrupt or immoral company. Their faith and practice are both sound and walk hand in hand. But often, a spiritual blight comes over the household when a young family begins to grow up and sons and daughters have to be brought up in this life. 
a leaven of worldliness begins to appear in their habits, clothing, entertainment, and use of time. They are no longer strict about the company they keep and the places they visit. Where is the obvious line of separation that they once observed? Where is the unswerving abstinence from worldly amusements that once marked their course? It is all forgotten. It is all laid aside like an old newspaper. A change has come over them. The spirit of the world has taken possession of their hearts. They walk in the steps of Lot's wife. They look back. How many young women seem to love Christianity until they are twenty or twenty-one, and then lose it all? Up to this time of their life, their conduct in Christian matters is all that could be desired. They keep up habits of private prayer, they read their Bibles diligently, they visit the poor when they have opportunity, and they teach in Sunday school when there is an opening. They minister to the physical and spiritual needs of the poor. They prefer Christian friends. They love to talk about the things of God. They tell others about their religious feelings and experience. But how often they prove as unstable as water and are ruined by the love of the world. Little by little they fall away and lose their first love. Little by little the things seen push the things unseen out of their minds. 2 Corinthians 4.18 and like the plague of locusts, eat up every green thing in their souls. Step by step, they go back from the principled position they once held. They cease to be concerned about sound doctrine. They pretend to find out that it is uncharitable to think that one person follows Jesus more closely than another. They discover that it is exclusive to attempt any separation from the customs of society. By and by they give their affections to some man who makes no pretense to Christianity and holiness. At last they end by giving up the last remnant of their own Christianity and becoming thorough children of the world. They walk in the steps of Lot's wife. They look back. How many members in our churches were at one time zealous and earnest professors of Christianity? but have now become lifeless, formal, and cold. There was a time when no one seemed so much alive in Christ as they were. None were so diligent in their attendance on the means of grace. None were so eager to promote the cause of the gospel and so ready for every good work. None were so thankful for spiritual instruction. None were apparently so desirous to grow in grace. But now everything has changed. The love of other things has taken possession of their hearts and choked the good seed of the word. Luke 8.14 The money, rewards, entertainment, and honors of the world now have first place in their affections. If you talk to them, you will find that they have no interest in spiritual things. Observe their daily conduct, and you will see that they have no zeal about the kingdom of God. They still have a form of religion, but it is no longer a living Christianity. The spring of their former Christianity is dried up and gone. The fire of their spiritual life is quenched and cold. The world has put out the flame that once burned so brightly. They have walked in the steps of Lot's wife. They have looked back. How many clergymen work hard in their profession for a few years, but then become lazy and indolent from the love of this present world? At the beginning of their ministry, they seem willing to spend and be spent for Christ. They're instant in season and out of season. Their preaching is lively and their churches are filled. Their congregations are well looked after. Bible studies, prayer meetings, and house-to-house -house visitations are their weekly delight. But sadly, how often, after beginning in the Spirit, they end in the flesh, Galatians 3.3, 3. and, like Samson, are shorn of their strength in the lap of that Delilah, the world. They advance in their careers and enjoy the things of this world. Their wives become worldly. They are puffed up with pride. They neglect study and prayer. A biting frost cuts off the spiritual blossoms that once looked so fair. 
their preaching loses its unction and power. Their weekday work becomes less and less. The society they mix in becomes less select. The tone of their conversation becomes more earthly. They cease to disregard the opinion of man. They acquire a deathly fear of extreme views and are filled with a cautious dread of giving offense. The man who at one time seemed likely to be a real successor of the apostles and a good soldier of Christ settles down as a clerical gardener, running a business rather than proclaiming and living Christ. He offends no one, and no one is saved. His church becomes half empty. His influence dwindles away as the world has bound him hand and foot. He has walked in the steps of Lot's wife. He has looked back. It is sad to write of these things, but it is far sadder to see them. It is sad to observe how professing Christians can blind their consciences by believing misleading arguments on this subject, and how they can try to defend their worldliness by talking of the responsibilities of their jobs, the pleasant things of life, and the necessity of having a pleasant and unoffensive religion. It is sad to see how many gallant ships launch forth on the voyage of life with every prospect of success, but spring a leak of worldliness and go down with all her freight in full view of the harbor of safety. It is saddest of all to observe how many people flatter themselves that it is all right with their souls when it is all wrong because of their love of the world. Ray hairs are here and there upon them, and they do not know it. They start out with Jacob and David and Peter, but they are likely to end with Esau and Saul and Judas Iscariot. They began with Ruth, Hannah, Mary, and Persis, and are likely to end with Lot's wife. Beware of a half-hearted religion. Beware of following Christ from any secondary motive, whether it is to please relatives and friends, to fit in with others, or to appear respectable and have the reputation of being religious. Follow Christ for his own sake if you follow him at all. Be thorough, be real, be honest, be sound, and be wholehearted. If you have any Christianity at all, let it be real. See that you do not sin the sin of Lot's wife. Beware of ever supposing that you may go too far in holiness. Beware of secretly trying to remain in the world. I do not want you to become a hermit, a monk, or a nun, but I want you to do your real duty in that state of life to which you are called. I urge every professing Christian who wants to be happy to make no compromise between God and the world. Do not try to drive a hard bargain, as if you wanted to give Christ as little of your heart as possible and to keep as much as possible of the things of this life. Beware that you do not try to reach for too much and end up losing it all. Love Christ with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. Seek first the kingdom of God, and believe that then all other things will be added to you. Matthew 6.33 Take heed that you do not copy the character John Bunyan draws, Mr. Facing Both Ways, for your happiness' sake, for your usefulness' sake, for your safety's sake, and for your soul's sake. Beware of the sin of Lot's wife. It is a solemn saying of our Lord Jesus that no one, having put his hand to the plow and looking back, is fit for the kingdom of God. Luke 9.62 I will now speak, in the last place, of the punishment that God inflicted on Lot's wife. The scripture describes her end in few and simple words. It is written that she looked back and became a pillar of salt. Genesis 19.26 A miracle was wrought to execute God's judgment on this guilty woman. The same almighty hand that first gave her life took that life away in the twinkling of an eye. From living flesh and blood, she was turned into a pillar of salt. That was a fearful end for a soul to come to. To die at any time is a solemn thing, even to die amid kind friends and relatives, calmly and quietly in one's bed, with the prayers of godly people still sounding in your ears, and with a good hope through grace and the full assurance of salvation while leaning on the Lord Jesus 
and supported by gospel promises is serious business. But to die suddenly and in a moment in the very act of sin, to die in full health and strength, to die by the direct interposition of an angry God, this is fearful indeed. Yet this was the end of Lot's wife. I cannot blame the prayer book litany, as some do, for retaining the petition, From sudden death, good Lord, deliver us. That was a hopeless end for a soul to come to. There are cases where one hopes, as it were, against hope about the souls of those we see go down to the grave. We try to persuade ourselves that our poor departed brother or sister may have repented unto salvation at the last moment and laid hold on the hem of Christ's garment at the eleventh hour. We call to mind God's mercies. We remember the Spirit's power. We think about the case of the penitent thief. We try to convince ourselves that saving work may have gone on even on that dying bed, that the dying person had not strength to tell. But there is none of this hope when a person is suddenly cut down in the very act of sin. Love itself can say nothing when the soul has been summoned away in the very midst of wickedness, without even a moment's time for thought or prayer. Such was the end of Lot's wife. It was a hopeless end. She went to hell. But it is good for us to consider these things. It is good to be reminded that God can sharply punish those who sin willfully, and that great privileges, misused, bring down great wrath on the soul. Pharaoh saw all the miracles that Moses worked. Korah, Dathan, and Abiram had heard God speaking from Mount Sinai. Hophni and Phinehas were sons of God's high priest. Saul lived in the full light of Samuel's ministry. Ahab was often warned by Elijah the prophet. Absalom enjoyed the privilege of being one of David's children. Belshazzar had Daniel the prophet close by his door. Judas Iscariot was a chosen companion of our Lord Jesus Christ himself. Ananias and Sapphira joined the church in the days when the apostles were working miracles. However, they all sinned with a high hand against light and knowledge, and they were all suddenly destroyed without remedy. They had no time or space for repentance. As they lived, so they died. As they were, they hurried away to meet God. They went with all their sins upon them, unpardoned, unrenewed, and utterly unfit for heaven. Being dead, they yet speak. They tell us, like Lot's wife, that it is a dangerous thing to sin against light, that God hates sin, and that there is a hell. I feel constrained to speak freely to my readers on the subject of hell. Allow me to use the opportunity that the end of Lot's wife provides. I believe the time has come when it is a positive duty to speak plainly about the reality and eternity of hell. A flood of false doctrine has lately broken in upon us. People are beginning to tell us that God is too merciful to punish souls forever, that there is a love of God lower even than hell, and that all mankind, however wicked and ungodly some of them may be, will sooner or later be saved. We are invited to leave the old paths of apostolic Christianity. We are told that the views of our fathers about hell, the devil, and punishment are obsolete and old-fashioned. We are to embrace what is called a kinder version of theology, treating hell as a pagan fable or a scary story to frighten children and fools. Against such false teaching, I must protest. As painful, sorrowful, and distressing as the controversy may be, we must not ignore it or refuse to look the subject in the face. I, for one, am resolved to maintain the old position and to assert the reality and eternity of hell. Believe me, this is no mere speculative question. It is not to be classed with disputes about liturgies and church government. It is not to be ranked with mysterious problems like the meaning of Ezekiel's temple or the symbols of Revelation. It is a question that lies at the very foundation of the whole gospel. The moral attributes of God, His justice, holiness, and purity are all involved in it. 
the necessity of personal faith in Christ and the sanctification of the Spirit are at stake. If the old doctrine about hell is overthrown, then the whole system of Christianity is unsettled, unscrewed, unpinned, and thrown into disorder. Believe me, the question is not one in which we must fall back on the theories and inventions of man. The Scripture has spoken plainly and fully on the subject of hell. It is impossible to deal honestly with the Bible and to avoid the conclusions to which it will lead us on this point. If words mean anything, there is such a place as hell. If texts are to be interpreted fairly, there are those who will be cast into hell. If language has any sense belonging to it, hell is forever. I believe that the person who finds arguments for evading the evidence of the Bible on this question has arrived at a state of mind in which reasoning is useless. For my own part, it seems just as easy to argue that we do not exist as to argue that the Bible does not teach the reality and eternity of hell. Settle it firmly in your mind that the same Bible that teaches that God in mercy and compassion sent Christ to die for sinners also teaches that God hates sin and must from his very nature punish all who cling to sin and refuse the salvation he has provided. The very same chapter that declares that God so loved the world also declares that the wrath of God abides on the unbeliever. John 3.16 and 36 The very same gospel that is launched into the earth with the blessed tidings, He that believes and is baptized shall be saved proclaims in the same breath that he that believes not shall be condemned. Mark 16, 16 Settle it firmly in your mind that God has given us proof upon proof in the Bible that he will punish the hardened and unbelieving and that he can take vengeance on his enemies as well as show mercy on the penitent. The drowning of the old world by the flood, the burning of Sodom and Gomorrah, the overthrow of Pharaoh and all his host in the Red Sea, the judgment on Korah, Dathan, and Abiram, and the utter destruction of the seven nations of Canaan all teach the same fearful truth. They are all given to us as beacons, signs, and warnings that we may not provoke God. They are all meant to lift up the corner of the curtain that hangs over things to come and to remind us that there is such a thing as the wrath of God. They all tell us plainly that the wicked shall be put into Sheol. Psalm 917 Settle it firmly in your mind that the Lord Jesus Christ himself has spoken most plainly about the reality and eternity of hell. The parable of the rich man and Lazarus contains things that should make us tremble, but it does not stand alone. No lips have used so many words to express the awfulness of hell as the lips of him who spoke as no one had ever before spoken, John 7, 46, and who said, The word which ye have heard is not mine, but of the Father who sent me, John 14, 24. Hell, hellfire, the damnation of hell, eternal damnation, the resurrection of damnation, everlasting fire, the place of torment, destruction, outer darkness, the worm that never dies, the fire that is not quenched, the place of weeping, wailing, and gnashing of teeth, everlasting punishment. These are the words that the Lord Jesus Christ himself used. Away with the miserable nonsense that people speak these days who tell us that the ministers of the gospel should never speak of hell. They only show their own ignorance or their own dishonesty when they talk in such a manner. No one can honestly read the four Gospels and fail to see that he who desires to follow the example of Christ must speak of hell. Lastly, settle it in your mind that the comforting ideas that the Scripture gives us of heaven are over for us if we deny the reality or eternity of hell. Is there no future separate abode for those who die while wicked and ungodly? Are all people, after death, to be mingled together in one confused multitude? If so, then heaven will be no heaven at all. It is utterly impossible for two to dwell happily together, except they be agreed. Amos 3.3 3. Is there to be a time when hell and punishment will be over? Are the wicked 
after ages of misery, to be admitted into heaven? If so, then the need of the sanctification of the Spirit is cast aside and despised. I read that people can be sanctified and made ready for heaven on earth. I read nothing of any sanctification in hell. Away with such baseless and unscriptural theories. The eternity of hell is as clearly affirmed in the Bible as the eternity of heaven. Once you say that hell is not eternal, you might as well say that God and heaven are not eternal. The same Greek word that is used in the expression everlasting punishment is the word that is used by the Lord Jesus in the expression life eternal and is the same word used by Paul in the expression everlasting God. Matthew twenty-five forty-six, Romans sixteen twenty-six. I know that all this sounds dreadful in many ears. I do not wonder. But the only question we must answer is this. Is it scriptural? Is it true? I maintain firmly that it is so, and I maintain that professing Christians ought to be often reminded that they may be lost and go to hell. I know that it is easy to deny all plain teaching about hell and to try to make it abhorrent by using unpleasant names. I have often heard of narrow-minded views, old-fashioned notions, brimstone theology, and the like. I have often been told that broad views are needed in the present day. I want to be as broad as the Bible, no more, no less. I say that he is the narrow-minded theologian who trims down those parts of the Bible that the natural heart dislikes and who rejects any portion of the counsel of God. God knows that I never speak about hell without pain and sorrow. I would gladly offer the salvation of the gospel to the very chief of sinners. I would willingly say to the vilest and most wicked of mankind on his deathbed, Repent and believe on Jesus and you will be saved. But God forbid that I should ever keep back from mortal man the truth that Scripture reveals a hell as well as a heaven and that the gospel teaches that people may be lost as well as saved. The watchman who keeps silent when he sees a fire is guilty of gross neglect. The doctor who tells us we are getting well when we are dying is a false friend. The minister who keeps back hell from his people in his sermons is neither a faithful nor a kind man. Where is the love in keeping back any part of God's truth? He is the kindest friend who tells me the whole extent of my danger. What is the use of hiding the future from the unrepentant and the ungodly? Surely it is like helping the devil if we do not plainly tell people that the soul that sins will surely die. Ezekiel 18.20 Who knows if the sad carelessness of many baptized people results from their never having been told plainly of hell? Who can tell if thousands might be converted, if pastors would urge them more faithfully to flee from the wrath to come? I fear that many of us are guilty in this matter. There is an unhealthy tenderness among us that is not the tenderness of Christ. We have spoken of mercy, but not of judgment. We have preached many sermons about heaven, but few about hell. We have been carried away by the pathetic fear of being thought improper, offensive, and intolerant. We have forgotten that he who judges us is the Lord, and that the man who teaches the same doctrine that Christ taught cannot be wrong. If you want to be a healthy, biblical Christian, I urge you to give hell a place in your theology. Establish it in your mind as a fixed principle that God is a God of judgment as well as a God of mercy, and that the same everlasting counsels that laid the foundation of the bliss of heaven have also laid the foundation of the misery of hell. Keep in full view of your mind that all who die unpardoned and unsaved are utterly unfit for the presence of God and must be lost forever. They are not capable of enjoying heaven. They could not be happy there. They must go to their own place, and that place is hell. It is a great thing in these days of unbelief to believe the whole Bible. If you want to be a healthy biblical Christian, 
I urge you to beware of any ministry that does not plainly teach the reality and eternity of hell. Such a ministry may be soothing and pleasant, but it is far more likely to lull you to sleep than to lead you to Christ or build you up in the faith. It is impossible to leave out any part of God's truth without spoiling the whole. That preaching is sadly defective that dwells exclusively on the mercies of God and the joys of heaven without ever setting forth the terrors of the Lord and the miseries of hell. It may be popular preaching, but it is not biblical. It might amuse and gratify, but it will not save. Give me the preaching that keeps back nothing that God has revealed. You might call it stern and harsh. You might tell us that to frighten people is not the way to do them good. You are forgetting, though, that the grand object of the gospel is to persuade people to flee from the wrath to come, Matthew 3, 7, and that it is foolish to expect people to flee unless they are afraid. It would be good for many professing Christians if they were more afraid about their souls than they now are. If you want to be a healthy biblical Christian, consider often what your own end will be. Will it be happiness, or will it be misery? Will it be the death of the righteous, or will it be a death without hope, like that of Lot's wife? You cannot live forever. There will be an end one day. One day you will hear your last sermon and pray your last prayer. One day you will read your last chapter in the Bible. All your intending, wishing, hoping, meaning, resolving, doubting, and hesitating will then be over. You will have to leave this world and stand before a holy God. Oh, that you would be wise. Oh, that you would consider your latter end. You cannot ignore this forever. The time will come when you must be serious. You cannot put off your soul's concerns forever. The day will come when you must have a reckoning with God. You cannot always be singing, dancing, eating, drinking, dressing, reading, laughing, joking, scheming, planning, and making money. The summer insects cannot always enjoy the sunshine. The cold, chilly evening will come at last and stop their fun forever. So it will be with you. You might put off God for now and refuse the counsel of God's people, but the cool of the day is on the way when God will come down to speak with you. Genesis 3.8 What will your end be? Will it be a hopeless one, like that of Lot's wife? I beg you, by the mercies of God, to look this question directly in the face. I plead with you not to impede your conscience by vague hopes of God's mercy while your heart clings to the world. I urge you not to drown your conviction by childish stories about God's love while your daily ways and habits plainly show that the love of the Father is not in you. 1 John 2.15 There is mercy in God, like a river, but it is for the repentant believer in Christ Jesus. There is a love in God toward sinners that is unspeakable and unsearchable, but it is for those who hear Christ's voice and follow Him. John 10.27 Seek to have a claim in that love. Break off every known sin. Come out boldly from the world. Cry mightily to God in prayer. Cast yourself wholly and unreservedly on the Lord Jesus for time and eternity. Lay aside every weight. Cling to nothing, however dear, that interferes with your soul's salvation. Give up everything, however precious, that comes between you and heaven. This old shipwrecked world is sinking fast beneath your feet. The one thing needful is to have a place in the lifeboat and get safely to shore. Give all the more diligence to make your calling and election sure. 2 Peter 1.10 Whatever happens to your house and property, see that you are sure of heaven. It is a million times better to be laughed at and thought overzealous in this world than to go down to hell from the midst of the congregation and end up like Lot's wife. Let me now offer a few questions to stamp the subject on your conscience. You have seen the history of Lot's wife, her privileges, her sin, and her end. 
You have been told of the uselessness of these privileges without the gift of the Holy Spirit. You have been told of the danger of worldliness and the reality of hell. Allow me to offer a few direct appeals to your own heart. In a day of much light, knowledge, and Christian profession, I want to set up a beacon to preserve souls from shipwreck. I would gladly moor a buoy in the channel of all spiritual travelers and paint upon it, Remember Lot's wife. Are you careless about the second coming of Christ? Sadly, many are. They live like the people of Sodom and the people of Noah's day. They eat, drink, plant, build, marry, and are given in marriage and behave as if Christ is never going to return. If you are such a person, I say to you this day, take care and remember Lot's wife. Are you lukewarm in your heart and cold in your Christianity? Sadly, many are. They try to serve two masters. They strive to be friends both with God and the world. They strive to be sort of spiritually neutral, neither one thing nor the other. Not quite a thoroughgoing Christian, but not quite people of the world. If you are such a person, I say to you this day, take care and remember Lot's wife. Are you wavering between two ways of life and inclined to go back to the world? Sadly, many are. They are afraid of the cross. They secretly dislike the trouble and reproach of wholehearted Christianity. They're weary of the wilderness and the manna, and they would gladly return to Egypt if they could. If you are such a person, I say to you this day, take care and remember Lot's wife. Are you secretly cherishing some troubling sin? Sadly, many are. They go far in their profession of Christianity. They do many things that are right, and they are very much like the people of God. But there is always some special sinful habit that they cannot tear from their heart. Hidden worldliness, covetousness, or lust sticks to them like their skin. They are willing to see all their idols broken, except this one. If you are such a person, I say to you this day, take care and remember Lot's wife. Are you messing around with little sins? Sadly, many are. They believe the great essential doctrines of the gospel. They keep clear of all obvious depravity or any obvious public disobedience of God's law. But they are painfully careless about little inconsistencies and are painfully ready to make excuses for them. It is only a little anger, or a little levity, or a little thoughtlessness, or a little carelessness, they tell us. God does not care about such little matters. None of us are perfect. God does not expect us to give up these little things. If you are such a person, I say to you this day, take care, and remember Lot's wife. Are you resting in religious privileges? Sadly, many do. They enjoy the opportunity of hearing the gospel regularly preached and of attending many ordinances and means of grace, and they are content in this. They seem to be rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing, Revelation 3.17, but they do not have faith, grace, or spiritual mindedness, and they are not prepared for heaven. If you are such a person, I say to you this day, take care and remember Lot's wife. Are you trusting in your religious and biblical knowledge? Sadly, many do. They are not ignorant about the Bible as many other people are. They know the difference between true doctrine and false. They can dispute, reason, argue, and quote some Bible verses, but they are not converted, and they remain dead in trespasses and sins. If you are such a person, I say to you this day, take care and remember Lot's wife. Are you making a profession of Christianity, yet clinging to the world? Sadly, many do. They want others to consider them to be Christians. They like the credit of being serious, steady, proper, regular church-going people. Yet all the while, their clothing, tastes, friends, and entertainment plainly show that they are of the world. 
If you are such a person, I say to you this day, take care and remember Lot's wife. Are you trusting that you will have a deathbed repentance? Sadly, many do. They know they are not what they ought to be. They are not yet born again and are not prepared to die. But they convince themselves that when their last illness comes, they will have time to repent, lay hold of Christ, and go out of the world pardoned, sanctified, and ready for heaven. They forget that people often die very suddenly, and that they generally die as they live. If you are such a person, I say to you this day, take care, and remember Lot's wife. Do you belong to an evangelical congregation? Many do, and sadly they go no further. They hear the truth Sunday after Sunday and remain as hard as a rock. Sermon after sermon sounds in their ears. Month after month they are invited to repent, to believe, to come to Christ, and to be saved. Year after year passes away and they are not changed. They keep their seat under the teaching of their favorite pastor and they also keep their favorite sins. If you are such a person, I say to you this day, take care and remember Lot's wife. May these solemn words of our Lord Jesus Christ be deeply engraved on all our hearts. May they awaken us when we feel tired, revive us when we feel dead, sharpen us when we feel dull, and warm us when we feel cold. May they prove to be a spur to speed us on when we are falling behind, and a bridle to get us back on track when we are turning aside. May they be a shield to defend us when Satan casts a subtle temptation at our heart and a sword to fight with when he says boldly, Give up Christ, come back to the world and follow me. Oh, may we say in such hours of trial, Soul, remember your Savior's warning. Soul, soul, have you forgotten his words? Soul, soul, remember Lot's wife.